Hello colleagues, my name is Yuri, I am co-founder and CEO of Supervisely and I am very glad to present the course, the video course that our team has put together to you. The name of the course Computer Vision with Supervisely Platform. And here is how the course is structured. So we see here two parts. The first part is introduction and it's just short section, 10 minutes long. And there is a main content, which is six hours video, way longer. And uh, in, this, uh, in this video course, I will show sometimes slides just to illustrate concepts, certain concepts. But the majority of the time will be devoted to live demos, where I will use, where I will do screencasting and actually use supervisory to solve uh, concrete tasks. Let us go through each section and, uh, and I will say a few words about each of the sections in this course. So the first section is introduction. This is quite important section because it explains the conceptual model of supervisor. It actually answers the question, what is supervisor? And this introduction starts with uh, the scope of tasks that supervisor addresses. And you will see straight away that the scope of tasks goes way beyond just basic labeling tasks. Essentially, Supervisely will address all the tasks in computer vision eventually. And that is like pretty ambitious statement. And you may say, okay, it's probably impossible to, to have some, some software that solves all the computer vision tasks. But in the solution part, we will explain our approach how to, how to attack this ambitious problem. So the main idea would be is not try to like create certain uh, software that solves every computer vision task by ourselves, but rather create to create an operating system that will have some core components and powerful apps on top of it. And the core components of supervised operating system is basic labeling interfaces for images, videos, and other modalities, collaboration tools. Uh, API and SDK are very essential, um, as well as some other components. But the key idea here is to answer the question what might be the apps on top. And the answer is that uh, apps are just GitHub repositories. Indeed, uh, there are thousands or maybe tens of thousands useful GitHub repositories created by community, uh, which are relatively isolated from each other. but they are quite valuable. And if we think of them, those repositories might be as simple as repos that allows us to take pre-trained models and, and, and run it and apply it to process and recognize images or videos, say. Or they might be advanced repositories from, say, OpenMM Lab that, will, that allows us to, try to train uh, complex deep learning models with the latest architectures. Um, and other types of rep repositories might be, say, some repositories that allows us to, to estimate how good our models are to, to calculate some performance metrics. There might be another types of repositories that do not even directly uh, connected, uh, are, not, are not really connected to the deep learning itself and machine learning, say, a GitHub repository that contains the code that implements Jupyter notebooks, for example. And all these repositories, uh, in most cases, are just isolated. And what if we could find a way to take these repositories and unify them, put them uh, into like single system, make out make applications out of these repositories in a very specific way, so that whenever I would like to use certain repository, I could just use operating system, uh, supervised operating system from a web browser, just make one click open or run and start to interact with this repository via graphical user interface. So that's like the essential idea and conceptual model of Supervisor. And in this first uh, introduction video, this conceptual model and uh, the solution that I'm talking about will be described in way more detailed and a kind of more illustrative and step-by-step -step fashion. Okay, let's move on to the main content. So the concepts are good, but, but the, concept, the concepts might worth absolutely nothing until they are implemented. And the main content is about that. So it's about real tasks and how we can use supervisor to solve real tasks. 
So as I mentioned, six hours of content here, and let me say a few words about the sections. So we will consider uh, five principles. The first one is variety of labeling interfaces, the second one collaboration at scale, the platform principle, neural network principle, and enterprise grade principle. I, will, I would like to say a few words about each of the principles. So principle one, variety of labeling interfaces. Uh, it contains slides, just small set of slides, two minutes, uh, and live demo, the longest live demo in this video course, two hours. And the idea here that in the live demo, I will show you our basic labeling interface that is a part of uh, a core components of Supervised Lab. And I will show you how this labeling interfaces works to label images, videos, LiDAR data, DICOM data. But the true beauty will come next. It will come in the second and third parts of this live demo. And the beauty comes when we start to extend and augment these basic labeling interfaces with supervised apps, which are just a repository with graphical user interface on top. Uh, and, and this would allow us to make a labeling process uh, really efficient. I will show you dozens of examples of that in this live demo. And another important thing here is the ability to customize, uh, to customize either default labeling interfaces with supervised apps or just create new uh, labeling uh, interfaces for the task at hand so that these labeling interfaces are good at exactly one thing. So, and that's, that, that would be quite uh, long and interesting uh, content. Uh, okay, let me move on to the second principle, which is collaboration at scale. So, when we say collaboration at scale, we mean something like that. So, we mean that, say, if we have an organization who, uh, which is involved in a computer vision project, uh, there might be several people, several people with several roles uh, involved in computer vision project from this organization. Say it might be data labelers, data reviewers, data scientists, maybe domain experts, maybe software engineers, and all of them have to collaborate. And there should be some ways to to do that. And in this second principle, there is 30 minutes demo where I show how uh, the collaboration process might be organized within uh, small annotation teams, but the concepts shown uh, will be applicable to larger teams as well. The next principle is platform principle. This is principle number three, and this is quite essential principle to the entire supervised system. So uh, in this principle, we will primarily speak about apps. And in the live demo, I will show you more examples of apps and how they can be useful. I will also do an overview and, and explain what apps are available currently in supervised Lego system, how they are grouped together, how to run them, how to use them. Uh, and I will also take slightly different perspective here. I will speak from the developer perspective. So we will take an app uh, statistical app and modify it, add action to this app, so that this app is potentially more useful for specific tasks. Slides are also quite informative here, uh, because they will outline the difference between uh, supervised and alternative solutions, which are essentially tools, and supervised is a platform, and we see the tendency that when tools and platforms compete, usually platform beats the tools. The next principle is principle number four, neural networks. And in this principle, in the live demo, I show you more examples, more apps that rely on neural networks, on deep learning models to take predictions from them and use them to make the process, the labeling process more efficient. And I also uh, show you how we can train models for the tasks that we might not have uh, pre-trained model, models available. This is quite common scenario. And the last principle called, is called enterprise grade and it describes some enterprise related features as well as uh, it explains how we interact with the customers, what kind of support uh, they can expect and also we outline the differences between supervisory and other alternative solutions. I hope you will enjoy the video course and see you soon. Hello colleagues and welcome to the introduction to Supervisely video. In this specific video we will focus on two things. 
we will focus on the task that supervisor addresses, the scope of these tasks, and we will speak about the solution, the approach that we take to solve this quite ambitious scope of tasks that you will see in a second. So let's focus on the tasks first. And from very, very high level perspective, when we do computer vision projects, what we do, we follow from, we go from raw data to production model or production models. But there are quite a number of intermediate steps or processes here, like labeling, model training, maybe quality assurance. And those processes are interconnected somehow. And it's extremely rarely when we see this uh, straight path from raw data to production model. Usually we travel through this graph quite a lot and sometimes even multiple times back and forth uh, before we actually went all the way from raw data to production model. And on top of that, we might want to automate the process. So looking at this diagram, we can formulate our ambitious goal, which is supervisor should allow to go from raw data from here to production models uh, to here uh, from a web browser for all tasks in computer vision in an efficient user friendly way. And maybe you do not just want go here with supervisor. Maybe you just want to be lab maybe you just want to label your data efficiently. But in this case, to to have the ability to train and apply deep learning models to speed up labeling it might be also important. Okay, so let's move further here. Let let me try to decompose this task, this goal even further. So I will outline this process and automation and put put those into the header of the table like this. On the rows of the table, there will be different modalities and associated tasks. And we can construct the matrix like this. So essentially, uh, the goal is to have a software that close, uh, that cover every cell here. And the problem here is that, say, uh, the software to solve classification labeling task uh, on images is very different from the labeling interfaces, say, for detection uh, for LiDAR data. So that's quite a challenging task, quite an ambitious goal, I would say. So let's, let's see how we address, how we approach to the solution, how we address uh, this goal. And uh, the main insight here is to look at the analogies with operating systems. So if we take Windows and all the applications on top of Windows, like say Microsoft Office games and so on, we will see that the particular operating system and all the apps on top is very powerful thing. So the entire ecosystem address, addresses a much wider range of tasks and our matrix here is just tiny compared to what operating systems do. So if we want to be successful uh, in addressing our scope of tasks, we also should follow architectural patterns of operating systems. So for example, so in supervised there are core components and apps on top. And the most value for the end users are actually here on the app level. If we go back to the table, uh, we can outline that core components do ensure some light coverage of certain columns here, but it's the combination of core components and apps that ensures the full coverage. Okay, let's speak about the main components of Supervised Lab. And those are Supervised Lab core components, uh, agent and apps. Uh, so core components include labeling interfaces, collaboration, quality assurance, data management, and probably most importantly, API and SDK. Uh, agent uh, or app engine, when sometimes we call it this way, is actually an open source software that makes it possible to run apps on top of Supervised Lab. And here is a very interesting question. What is Supervised Lab app? And the answer is that Supervised Lab app is just a GitHub repository. And that might be, in some cases, GitHub repository without any modifications, though more often we 
you can think of that as some popular GitHub repository safe to train modern deep learning models. And we take this repository, add graphic user interface to that and integration code and transform this black dot to this green dot so that those are one, one kind of the apps that are built on top of popular GitHub repositories. Another kind of the apps are just GitHub repositories that were specifically developed for supervised ecosystem. So those are supervised apps. Okay, let's move on and uh, and speak about conceptual model of supervised. And you can think of the following diagrams that you can think of the diagrams that will follow as a kind of dashboard available from the web from the web browser. So uh, here is uh, enterprise core components, and if it's a dashboard, we can actually click and uh, open labeling interfaces, and sometimes even more than one for a single modality, and get the data labeled, and the same for videos, the same for LiDAR data, the same for um, uh, DACOM data. Uh, there are also collaboration tools uh, and uh, data management tools. Uh, so, though this core component, this software is very, very powerful, it's still uh, just a, a tiny bit of the entire story. So, there is uh, app engine or agent on top, as a bridge that acts like a bridge and there are apps and as a reminder apps are just uh, certain kinds of github repositories and let's let's do the following let's put here this uh, blue dot that represents the apps or repositories that specifically developed for supervised ecosystem and these green dots that usually represent some uh, state-of-the-art deep learning models that we can train and apply uh, and then we can start clustering this, uh, these apps. For example, some, uh, some apps might represent specialized labeling interfaces. Some apps might represent uh, popular GitHub, um, GitHub repositories, uh, popular models, standard models, or say interactive models. Uh, performance analysis uh, is another cluster here. And we can keep doing that, keep doing this clustering. So, uh, here is the main idea that probably I would like to emphasize the most. Uh, so what Supervisely allows to do, it allows us to make state-of-the-art computer, computer vision tools few clicks away from the end user. So what it essentially means is that when user needs to label images, he just clicks and gets the images labeled. If there is a need for special kind of visualization, again, he clicks, run a specific app and get the visualization, in this case, instance-based visualization of objects. Maybe a user wants to change some state-of-the-art model, so he just run an app, click, and say, pick uh, the data which he would like to use for the training purposes, pick the model, the backbone, and get the model trained. And then maybe he wants to visualize the performance of the model and there are certain apps for that, for example, that build these sorts of confusion matrices. So the, the important part is that we, you can think again of that as a kind of dashboard and just by uh, clicking here on and running certain apps, uh, the access to the large scope of computer vision tools become instantly available. So. Supervised core is software, app engine is software, apps is software. On top of that, there is a process which we call uh, app production factory, which consists in taking popular GitHub repositories and converting them into supervised apps, or developing apps specifically for supervised ecosystem. And this process, this app production factory, this process of these transformations is performed by us, community and partners, which actually ensures quite large stream of new apps so that apps might grow quite quickly. And we put a lot of efforts to make uh, it easier to create apps and supervise them. So let's summarize everything briefly. Uh, supervise the goal is to address all tasks, tasks in computer vision. And to achieve the goal, supervise the follows architectural pattern of uh, operating systems. There are core components and apps and apps is uh, very important uh, for us in a way that the most value for the end user will be uh, and is here. And we also talk about a production uh, factory, which is a process that uh, ensures exp exponential growth of apps in supervised ecosystem. And we will talk a bit later about the nature of this exponential growth of apps. 
And finally, and I think that is the most important part here, is user experience. It takes uh, just a few clicks to access state-of-the-art computer vision tools for the user, uh, represented as graphic user-based, uh, user-friendly apps via web browser. So I think user it's all about user experience. See you in the next section. Now that I have introduced Supervisor to you, let's focus on the main content, which consists in uh, five principles, which are variety of labeling interfaces, collaboration at scale, platform, neural networks, and enterprise grade. Let's focus on the first principle, which is variety of labeling interfaces. And this principle will consist of slides and live demo. So, uh, what we mean when we say variety of labeling interfaces is the following. So, there is no single best in the world uh, labeling interface for all the tasks. Rather, labeling interfaces should depend on the task, skills of the user, and leverage AI technologies whenever possible. If we go back to the matrix, we will see that this principle corresponds to the first column of the task matrix. Um, and in supervised we support for, uh, for modalities, images, videos, LIDAR, data, and DICOM. And for each of the modality, we have very strong basic labeling interfaces. But the true power comes when we augment these basic labeling interfaces with AI components and also with customization. And these slides illustrate the same idea that there is static labeling interfaces that provide certain value, but the number of tasks will be way larger if we start augmenting labeling interfaces with AI components and customization. And that idea will be illustrated in the live demo that will that will come next. Colleagues, we are discussing principle number one, which is variety of labeling interfaces, and it's time for the live demo. And here is the plan. I will start this live demo with an overview of basic labeling interfaces that allows us to label images, videos, LIDAR data, and DICOM data. And then I will start to introduce the following idea. I will show you how we can extend the performance of labeling, the, the speed of labeling, if we rely on AI models and the ability to customize interfaces for the task at hand. And I will show you quite a number of examples for images and videos first. And then I will also show you how we can rely on AI models to speed up labeling process for LIDAR data and DICOM data. But let's start with the overview of basic labeling interfaces first. Okay, we are now at uh, principle one overview workspace and we see a number of projects here. So some projects has uh, images caption here associated with them. Those indicate that, that those project, uh, projects contain images. There is one video project two projects with point cloud episodes, and two projects with volumetrical medical data. Let me first focus on uh, image labeling interfaces. So I will open this project. And before I start showing you various labeling interfaces, let me speak about two important notions, which are classes and tags. And you will see these ideas of classes and tags uh, for videos, LIDAR data, and medical data as well. So, whenever we speak about uh, spatial annotations, we usually use classes. So, for example, in this example, there is a class cat, which is associated with a polygon shape, and we will use polygons to label uh, cats in this case. There is a dog class, which has shape type uh, equal any shape. So, it, it means that we can use any shape when we uh, label dogs, and there is also a person class that is associated with rectangular shape. I personally like to specify the shapes explicitly, but sometimes any shape is to use any shape is also quite convenient. So classes is about spatial annotations, uh, annotation, and tags are about attributes. So we might want to specify attribute for say the entire image. Maybe we want to say that the image is indoors taken indoors or outdoors and in this case uh, those two tags allows to do that and we, you see also hotkeys 
hot keys associated with these tags. We may also go further and specify certain attributes for objects. So, for example, we may, we may want to say that cat, cat or dog has a certain size or say body position, say for persons. Okay, once we spoke a bit about this class syntax idea, let's go and open some uh, labeling interfaces. And I will start with this basic uh, image labeling toolbox, the first one. Let me open uh, the images. So we have, in this case, just three images. Maybe I will close some advanced tabs here. And, and say my first task is to is to tag the, the entire image. So, uh, so this, this image is outdoors. I can press a hotkey and, uh, and the tag will appear. And then I will say that this image is, is taken indoors. And I may use just interface uh, and, not, and do not rely on hotkey. So this is outdoors image. So we have just assigned tags to the images. Let's start working with spatial annotations. So let's first label persons here. So I will pick a class called person and I will use uh, this instrument to label uh, the first person and I will go to the next frame and uh, label, uh, I will go to the next image and label two more persons here. So, and once I do that, I will specify additional attributes. Uh, I will specify additional attributes for each person. So, okay, probably this is more or less correct. Okay, let's do it this way. Okay, so we have labeled uh, three persons and maybe we would like to specify some properties on top. Uh, maybe we want to attach some properties to each of the persons that we have labeled. And one way is to select an object and say, OK, would like to specify a body position. And in this case, body position is sitting. OK. And we can, uh, and we can see that we have attached, uh, we have associated a body position to this person. And let me also specify body positions for two more, two more persons. So I will select the first person here. And just say that the person is standing and I will do and I can do the same for the second person so I will just I will just select the person here and say that body position is actually standing. Uh, okay uh, now let's move on to the next class that we have specified and I think that we can probably start with the cat class. So for the cat we said that that uh, that we will use uh, polygon tools and say when I click uh, polygon tool here it shows me the available classes so for dog I can use any class for cat I can use only polygons so let me let me uh, label uh, uh, the cat here so uh, it will take me a bit of time to label it in a more or less precise way uh, and uh, so Manual labeling is always slow and hard. And in the second section of this uh, video, I will, I, I will talk a lot about uh, AI models and their usage to speed up the process like those. So you will see how much faster it will be when we rely on AI models uh, to, label, uh, uh, to label for semantic segmentation task, for example. Uh, okay, so I'm almost done. Maybe I should just lower precision a bit just to speed up the labeling process. Okay, let me do that. Um, okay, just several more points. Almost there. Okay, let's stop here. So we have labeled a uh, cat with polygon fit this image uh, to the screen and maybe I would like also to specify attribute for for the cat in this case and maybe I would like to say that this cat has say average size so and we see that uh, the effect of putting the tag here so let's uh, let's just uh, deal with dogs and for dogs we can use any shapes and 
And the reason why I allowed allow it in this case is just to illustrate a bit more uh, labeling instruments here. So, for example, I may use uh, brush tools like this. I deliberately avoid uh, AI-assisted uh, tools uh, here at, in this section because I will focus a lot on them uh, on the next section. Okay, let me just do something like that. Again, my annotation might be not super precise, but I'll do my best. And then I may say, okay, let's kind of fill in uh, the pixels here. And we can also like make some adjustments here if we want, like this. Uh, okay, so that's an example how we can use uh, how we can use uh, uh, this brush instrument, uh, but we are not restricted to the brush instrument. So since the dog has any shape, so I, here, for example, I may label the dog with uh, just a rectangle uh, like this, and maybe and let me label the dog here with uh, just a point. So I may pick a point and label the dog in uh, this kind of fashion. As a last step, let me quickly attach attributes to the dogs that I have labeled. So I may pick a dog here and define a size for the dog. So maybe it's like, uh, let's say it's an average dog. Um, we can click here to see the attribute. And we will go to the next image and say for this dog, we'll say that, okay, maybe it's a large dog. Let's define an attribute here. And let's do the same for the last dog for this point, so we can actually assign attributes to the points as well. So maybe it's like average dog here. Uh, okay. Now let me open the same images into, uh, in, in the slightly different labeling interface. So I may use, uh, I may use this labeling interface uh, also to, uh, to perform labeling operations. Um, and we see Kind of the same the same data that we uh, labeled in the previous labeling interface uh, here this is slightly more advanced this labeling interface is slightly more advanced uh, in a way that it may allow me to for example do some operations on top of groups of objects so maybe i can just select all the objects here and maybe i can move uh, can move all the objects somewhere uh, at once sometimes it might be quite convenient let me actually try to undo these changes here to put these boxes where they were. Uh, another important characteristic of this interface is that it's kind of more scalable when we have quite a number of objects, maybe thousands of objects on images and large images in general. So what I could do here uh, is, to, uh, is to open another project so we just have one class here defined some flower seed. Those images are not that high resolutional, but I hope to illustrate the idea. So say if I open an image in this labeling interface, uh, what I can do with this labeling interface, for example, is to enable this navigation bar and just to work with some, uh, some uh, areas of interest in the images uh, and say if I have thousands of objects on the image, uh, the number of objects will be like when I work with specific child here will be restricted, uh, will be restricted, and and the labeling interface in general becomes way more uh, responsive in this case. So let me just probably show you how we can use say uh, a brush tool. Uh, probably I have to decrease uh, the size of that. So like this, and let me just use this brush tool to label, say, one object, object here. Just it's not very precise, but anyway, I hope it illustrates the point here. So and we can use other labeling instruments here to label objects in this labeling interface. Uh, okay, so there is one last thing that I want to show when it comes to uh, basic labeling interfaces for images and it's the ability to navigate over images so uh, so and and this feature exists in both interfaces uh, uh, in both labeling interfaces say if i have 
uh, a large, a relatively large number of images and I might want to find specific images. So I may want to define a filter that will allow me to find images that contain say a specific class, maybe say bicycle. And maybe even more than that, maybe I want to see images with say three bicycles or more. And, uh, and in this case, I see four images like this. So here we have, we see, uh, we should see three bicycles labeled uh, and the same here, three or more in this case. Uh, yeah, so I think that's more or less it. And let's move to the next modality. The next modality that I would like to show is video. And we have one video project here. Let's open it and take a look at classes and tags first. So we will we have a road class associated with polygon shape and a zebra class associated with rectangular shape here. And as for tags, uh, we have uh, animals visible tag and we will use it. And, and this tag is applicable to videos only. And also there are two additional tags called size and actions with some predefined values that are associated with videos and objects. This size tag is associated with objects only. So let's let's take a look what we can do with these classes and tags defined. So let's open default video labeling interface. So let's play this video first. And maybe what we are interested in is to label the frames when we see the, these animals. So I can navigate here uh, in this kind of way. Uh, maybe I would like to start tagging uh, with this frame and say that starting from this frame the animal is visible. So I will select the tag, press select button and maybe I will just play this video further and stop it somewhere here uh, or maybe I will go a bit further like this and say that on this set of frames uh, the animal is visible so I will just tag this frame range with this tag called animals visible and you see this uh, references so uh, we have this tag associated with frames with all the frames starting from uh, this uh, 47 frame and uh, ending with uh, this 205 frame. Okay, maybe we will just play a little further and see if any other anim anim animals are crossing the road. Yeah, and they do. So maybe we will also start and say from, uh, from maybe this frame, we will also want to outline the frame range when we see uh, uh, animals are crossing. Uh, the road. So, okay, I think that's a good approximation. And again, I will tag this frame range also. So, what we have achieved, we just have tagged two frame ranges that specify the event that we are interested in. So, let's let's move further here and let's probably just go to this very first to, 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 to this uh, uh, frame number 47 and let me deselect this tag and maybe what what I would like to do next is to uh, is to label uh, spatially uh, this zebra so I will not rely on AI tools I will just do it manually and let me just put a rectangle here first and one way for me to like label uh, label these objects on multiple frames is to press uh, Ctrl C, go to the next frame, press Ctrl V, and if I do it like several times, uh, I may uh, later readjust these frames. So uh, let me show you how to do that. So this, the, this uh, rectangle is quite tight here, and what I can do, I can actually use this tool to adjust uh, the the rectangle uh, a little bit on every frame here. And when we will talk about uh, uh, AI uh, and deep learning models, uh, you will see uh, the ways how I may be way more efficient on this kind of operations. And let me just for illustration purposes 
probably uh, uh, probably uh, label just quickly one other uh, one other uh, zebra here so maybe I should go to this frame and uh, and label uh, like one more zebra uh, so let me do that and I will also do it manually uh, I just would like to attach uh, various tags to this uh, to these animals uh, and show uh, a couple of more uh, concepts so let me just uh, do the same approach I will copy paste uh, and then slightly adjust so this is tight box and this requires some adjustment like this and I will also adjust this one um, okay uh, let me deselect this one so what we end up with is this two these two objects so this specific object consists of three figures so figure one figure two and figure three here and and another object it was the very first zebra um, so this one with six objects uh, and we can also kind of inspect these individual figures so you see that this video labeling interface uh, are specifically designed to deal with this temporal data uh, to keep track of objects across time so let me actually do probably one more thing here so what 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 i want to do i want to assign a tag to this to this object so maybe i want to say that okay i want to say that uh, this zebra uh, uh, act in some way so i select mark frames i select a tag mark frames and maybe i what what, what i would like to say is that during this first three frames this zebra is say uh, uh, just uh, say walking uh, yeah, like this uh, and maybe then uh, what I would also like to do maybe I would like to say that during the next three frames this zebra is running so what I can do I can again pick this tag here um, and select these three additional frames and just tag with uh, a running tag uh, like this so and what we achieved is that uh, we labeled this zebra and we associated uh, an action so you know, on this phrase on this frame range we said that the zebra is walking but on this frame range we said that the zebra is running and let me probably do one last thing here so I will navigate uh, I will pick this um, uh, this uh, zebra that uh, that we labeled last and maybe I will just what I will do I will just associate uh, a tag called size with, with, with this object and say size we do not expect size to be changed and in this case I may use this option to uh, to assign uh, size uh, to the to the object uh, whenever whenever the object occurs uh, in the previous case we assign the tag to the object and frame range now we just assign the tag to the entire object and say we say that this zebra has to say normal size and we assign the size here so let me do one last thing here so maybe we would like to label uh, uh, some uh, stationary uh, stationary objects as well uh, and let, take, let me take road as an example and maybe I would like to label road here with, uh, with a mm, polygon uh, in this kind of way uh, and then once I label it I will show you how I can propagate these annotations further so, so here is the road that we have labeled but, I, but maybe I would like uh, this road to be uh, to present on all the frames and one one of the ways I can uh, achieve that is just to select this object and uh, go to this predefined uh, tab here and say that I would like to clone this and I would, would like to clone this object 
to the end. So this is like the number of frames that I would like to uh, uh, to use to replicate this object. So and then I will just click check, and and the result is the following. So I just got this uh, road annotations uh, uh, copied up until uh, the end. So that's it. Let's move on to the next modality. The next modality that I would like to showcase is uh, LIDAR data and I have two projects here. One of the projects is labeled and the other project is unlabeled. Let's start with the labeled one. So for this project what we have is number of classes and no tags defined. And, and we have here kitty dataset and leaf dataset. So let me open a leaf dataset and show you how populated point clouds populated with a lot of objects, uh, point cloud episodes might uh, look like. So what we see here is, a, is actually point cloud with quite a number of objects uh, and also photo context. We see three uh, images here, but we can essentially pick uh, other images, other cameras if we want to. So it's actually 360 degree uh, view uh, here supported. And this episode, uh, point cloud episode consists of uh, 124 point cloud frames. And if we move across this episode, We'll see. So right now the car is on the intersection and is not moving. And maybe on the second half of the episode the car will start moving like this. And let me do the following here. Let me probably just align myself with this front camera and do, um, do something like that. So what we essentially see here is that the car on the point cloud here is matched to the car on photo context. So that's kind of the same car. And let me probably just play this. So if I stop, here is another matching. Uh, so you see, uh, you see this uh, example of uh, sensor fusion. And I may also, maybe just for illustration purposes, align myself with the back camera so that, so it will look like this. Uh, uh, so I will, in this case, I will see uh, the camera, uh, the car on the point cloud, and the same car on 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 the back camera, and here is yet another car, and I can play like this. Uh, let me probably say here that at any point you can pick an object and actually uh, select uh, and actually uh, change uh, the shape of the object, uh, either here in the projections or right here on the point cloud. Uh, and probably one last thing is just to mention that there are a number of objects here and I may pick uh, any object here and see all the figures uh, where this object uh, where this object present on a scene. So, uh, uh, so for example, let me just for illustration purposes so that if we pick an object we may see uh, occurrences of this object on different uh, point cloud. Uh, frames. The next thing that I want to do is to take a simple point cloud episode and show you how we can manually label uh, several objects on this episode. So let's do that. Okay, we have here unlabeled point cloud project. Let's open it. And we just have single class called car and the shape associated is cuboid. And we also have just a single tag called stationary. So, so this is a tag which we, which we might want to attach to, say, stationary objects. So let's just open this uh, simple point cloud example. Uh, I will use Kitty dataset for that example. It has just single camera and 107 uh, point cloud episodes. Uh, probably I will do the same operation as I did previously. I will just align myself with this camera and say we may move forward for, uh, for, uh, for some time. And probably we will just label, say, these two cars on multiple frames. 
And the way we do that is the following. So we pick a cuboid here and place this cuboid on, on a car uh, like this. And I will adjust orientation here of the car so, so that this little bar indicates the, the direction where the car might move. In this case, it's stationary car. But let me just use these projections to, uh, to adjust a cuboid. And we can also take a look at photo context while we are working with, this, uh, with these projections. Um, yeah, so it looks like it looks like it might be it. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe this side is off a bit. Uh, okay, so uh, um, I have labeled one car. I will deselect this one and probably label just another one like this. Again, I will use these projections to to place uh, to place this cuboid. Um, let me try to do it more or less precisely. I think let's zoom out here to make sure that we are doing it in the right way. Um, yeah, I think it's close, close to what, uh, to what it should be. Uh, okay, so let's stop here. Uh, and what we achieved right now, we just labeled uh, this uh, two cars, two, we put two cuboids on uh, a single point cloud frame with number of 27. And maybe what I would like to do next is to just, uh, is, is just to copy paste these cuboids on the next frames. So I just can press Ctrl C. Oh, I have one object selected, so I just copied this selected object. Let me deselect it, press Ctrl C, so I copied like two objects. And then I will move to the next frame and just paste them. And let me do that uh, for one more frame. Uh, so this is just a copy-paste approach. And in the following sections you will see way more efficient ways to label data on point clouds. But let me just stick with this basic example. So on this frame the boxes are tight. Uh, let me move to the next one, say pick this one. And I may adjust it right here in the projections, or I may select this, this axis and move and move right on the point cloud. So something like that. Um, something like that. Uh, yeah, I think it's more or less okay. Uh, and let me also select this one, pick an axis and move it across this axis so that we get a fit here. Uh, Okay, so and we have one last frame to correct this one and let's do uh, the same operation here. So again I will edit this cuboid right here on the point cloud and place it here and I will do the same. I will deselect this one and I will do the same with this next cuboid. Uh, yeah, it's more convenient to move it right here along selected axis. Yeah, so, and we see this on the photo context, the results. Uh, okay, so let's inspect what we have achieved. Uh, we have uh, we have labeled two cars and we have labeled them on three point cloud frames like this. Let me do, uh, and, and probably I can show that actually we see this two objects and these two objects as three figures. So again, uh, this interface is naturally built to, to, to work with uh, time domain so that objects on one frame uh, is consistent with, uh, so, so that objects may occur on multiple frames. Uh, okay, so probably what I would like to do as a last step, probably I would just like to select the object and uh, and attach a tag to that. And as I did in videos, I may specify the frames when this object uh, when this object has certain property. But say in this point cloud episode, these cars are stationary. So I will just say that 
for this um, for this episode, I, I just attach the stationary uh, the stationary uh, uh, the stationary tag to this uh, to this object to this car, and let me uh, do the same operation for uh, for this for the second car. So I will also say that uh, this, uh, this this car has this stationary property uh, across all the across all the uh, all the episodes. Uh, and you see that we, we, you see these two cuboids and this stationary property, stationary tag that we added to each of those cars. Um, okay, let's move on to the next modality. The last modality that I would like to demonstrate is volumetric medical data. And I have two projects, one is labeled and the other one is unlabeled. Uh, let's start with the labeled one, so that I, you could see how uh, labeled uh, DICOM images and supervisor looks like. And I will first go to classes to check what annotations to expect. And we have like annotations for, we have brain class associated with bitmap shape and lung class also associated with bitmap shape. And we have no tags here. So let's just open uh, uh, let's just open uh, this project, and here we see uh, three uh, DICOM files. So this one, so we see like three projections and 3D reconstruction, and I can navigate over projections and I will see uh, the relative position in the reconstruction. I can like uh, move this around navigate over various projections. Uh, I may actually disable these planes so that the reconstructed, uh, reconstructed object is uh, visible, is fully visible. Um, okay, let me just show you another example. So in this case we have uh, the brain labeled and uh, again the same thing, we can navigate uh, across different projections. Uh, we can actually uh, we can actually uh, label uh, label uh, and uh, uh, and modify the masks. And what I would like to do next is to take uh, empty uh, uh, DICOM and just put several figures to show you uh, how a labeling process looks like. Okay, we have uh, unlabeled uh, DICOM project here. Uh, let's. Uh, let's select it and go to classes and here we just have one class brain and and we allow it to be any shape so that I could demonstrate uh, several annotation tools and let me again open uh, this DICOM viewer um, and probably I will work with this Excel projection here and so first I will navigate say here maybe I will make it full screen so that it's better visible. Pick a class, and try my and I will try my best to label the brain here. Okay, I'm not. I don't, do not try to be very precise. Okay, so something like that. Uh, once I label it, I can, for example, press Ctrl C, uh, go to the next slice and paste it, and I can do it multiple times, like this. Uh, okay, so maybe. I can pick another in instrument here. So maybe I can pick a brush um, and increase brush size a little bit and then just use it to, to label uh, the next slice. So again, I'm not trying to be very accurate here, just to illustrate the idea. And, and then I would like to fill in the, uh, the space here, uh, the empty space, and then I can proceed. So I can copy uh, and go to the next slice and paste and paste again and maybe at some point uh, and maybe at some point I I would like to uh, to correct uh, to correct the borders so I will I will pick an eraser here and specify the size of the eraser and maybe I will just correct uh, several uh, several pixels here like this. Um, okay, and what we have achieved, we just labeled uh, several slides with uh, several shapes um, and we have just uh, one object here which consists 
uh, of uh, seven, uh, seven figures. So some of them are polygons, some of them are masks. Uh, and uh, this is an example of manual labeling. Uh, I will return to this DICOM example when we will speak about uh, AI models. And I will show you way more interesting uh, cases when we can rely on interpolation to build this reconstruction to build 3D reconstruction uh, of various uh, objects. Colleagues, I would like to conclude this overview uh, with just two remarks. The first remark is about hotkeys. So we have seen a number of labeling interfaces for images. We have seen two of those uh, for video. We have seen labeling interface to label uh, LiDAR data and DICOM data. When I showcase these interfaces to you, I relied in some cases on hotkeys, for example, for navigation purposes and maybe for some other operations. And you will find this hotkeys button here on top. You can click and walk through some useful combination of keys. And I encourage you to take a look at that because it may uh, improve your user experience. And this hotkey button is available actually in every uh, interface that I have shown. Uh, okay, uh, the, final re uh, the second remark is about uh, efficiency of labeling process in general. Uh, in this overview, I, I avoid to use any AI assisted tools or deep learning models, but it is the integration of uh, modern uh, AI models that makes the labeling process uh, really efficient. And that's exactly the topic that I will discuss in the next sections of this video. See you there. Colleagues, in the previous section we spoke about basic labeling interfaces for images, videos, slider data and DICOM data. Uh, in this section we will speak about uh, images and videos and how to label them uh, when we rely on uh, AI models and customization of labeling interfaces. But before we jump into uh, the topic, before we jump into uh, application of AI models uh, to speed up labeling process, let me first show you how to deploy uh, deep learning models that we will rely on later. Colleagues, we have four projects here that I would like to show how to after label. But before I do that, uh, let me deploy uh, the model that we will need to, to after label these projects. So probably the first thing that I have to do, I have to explain uh, how deep learning models and supervisor are interconnected. So to run efficiently, to use efficiently deep learning models, we need GPUs. And uh, if I go to, uh, to the start menu uh, and to uh, uh, team cluster page, I will see some machines that are connected to Supervisor. And for example, machine with GPU, this machine uh, and say uh, AWS machine and this machine with GPU, the, those machines are connected to Supervisor and then uh, and those machine uh, uh, has uh, uh, have GPU cards. And say, if I click on, say, uh, concrete machine, I will see the parameter of uh, uh, graphical card and uh, I will see NVIDIA SMI stuff here. So the point is that whenever I run a certain, a certain app that requires these GPU resources, I may specify which machine to use as a backend. Uh, and moreover, you can, if you click add button, uh, and pick here a uh, supervisor agent. What you will see is a command that you can copy and run on a machine that has Docker and NVIDIA Docker installed and GPU card. And after that, this machine will be available in the running status, like the machine that, uh, that I have here. Okay, now it's time to deploy the models. Uh, I will go to Start menu and to Neural Network section. Um, so we will be interested in images and videos in this section. And probably the first thing to notice here is that uh, we have here a number of tasks that we can solve. So 
uh, object detection, uh, semantic segmentation, instance segmentation, uh, and so on. And some tasks that we can solve on videos, uh, like, say, detection and tracking, uh, segmentation and, tra and tracking, and so on. Uh, another thing to notice here is that, uh, say, if I click object detection, there is a serve, an, a serve category here. So those are apps that allows me to deploy models for object detection. And if I click on semantic segmentation, I will see a uh, uh, serve category that contains apps that allows me to deploy models for semantic segmentation. And in this, uh, in this section, I will show you uh, models uh, 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 for uh, interactive segmentation, so-called smart tool. So let's actually uh, deploy uh, the model. Uh, so I will run this. Uh, I will run this uh, RITM interactive segmentation smart tool uh, app that actually deploys the model. I can pick uh, the version of the model. And also let me spe specify here that I will deploy this model on uh, this uh, AWS uh, machine. And maybe I will give a model a name like, say, uh, default uh, smart tool. Uh, okay, let me deploy this model. Um, and th this is an uh, interactive model that can interact with the user uh, and speed up segmentation process uh, uh, quite a lot, manual segmentation process quite a lot. Uh, then I will run uh, an app uh, uh, called TransT, so that's interactive tracking, and I will also use uh, I will also use the same uh, AWS machine to to deploy this uh, 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 to deploy this model. Uh, okay, uh, let's run the app. Um, I can close that for now, and I would like also to show you uh, object detection model and. Uh, instance segmentation model in action. So uh, let's run some instance segmentation model and say Detectron 2 contains this repository and app on top uh, contains quite strong uh, uh, instance segmentation model. So let me uh, run this app uh, and uh, I will pick pre-trained models here and I will probably, uh, I will probably pick uh, say this model. Uh, and I will run this on probably another machine. Let's let me run it on machine with GPU two. Um, okay, so uh, let me uh, run this app to deploy the model. And the last model that I would like to deploy is object detection model. And I have a choice uh, here. For example, uh, I will say I may run. Uh, uh, I may deploy model from YOLO v5 repository uh, uh, or from uh, MM detection repository. Uh, let me run, uh, let me take MM detection repository. And I will also use uh, the machine, uh, uh, machine with GPU2. So let, it, let me run this, uh, this app. It might take a couple of seconds. Uh, for uh, for the app to be uh, initiated, let's wait a bit. So uh, so this app, uh, uh, as 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 well as previous, is just graphical user interface on top of powerful uh, GitHub repositories. In this case, MM detection. Uh, repository and this repository contains uh, models for object detection and semantic segmentation. So I will use object detection task task here, uh, and I may have a choice quite quite number of architectures to choose from, and within each architecture I can pick uh, a checkpoint. So probably I will just pick the checkpoint with uh, the maximum accuracy, um, and I will click serve button. So, um, so now the model is deployed. Okay, let's take a quick look at the models deployed. So if I go to uh, app sessions here and click on running, I will see all uh, running, uh, running apps. Uh, so for example, 
we have this uh, uh, model from MM uh, detection repository. We have deployed model. Uh, we have deployed model uh, from uh, Detectron Two uh, repository, and we deployed two uh, interactive models here. We have successfully completed uh, preparation step and deployed uh, AI models. Now it's time to use those uh, deployed models to speed up labeling process. Let me show how to do that. Okay, we have four projects to work with uh, in the section. We have three image projects and one video project. Let's start first with image project. And in this project there is a data set that contains the images that looks like this. We have no text defined and we have five following classes defined. So we have object class, general purpose object class, car class, person class, dog class, cat class, and all of the classes are associated with bitmap shape. Okay, let's open the data and start uh, labeling it uh, using the models that we deployed. So let me first show you how to use smart tool. I will pick a cat class here and I will zoom in and localize the cat like that. And it seems that it does pretty good job. Maybe one more point here will will make it more precise. Again, depends on the borders. Like uh, uh, depends on on how precise I I want to be. Uh, I may put uh, more green or red dots to provide the feedback to the model. Uh, if we zoom in, it seems that it's pretty pretty close to what we should obtain. Okay, so oh, this is the cat that I struggled to label previously uh, in the previous demo. Okay, let me let me see if I can do it uh, faster here. Uh, Okay, let me put several green and red dots, and so something like something like that. And then I may like be very uh, sensitive to details. If it's the case, I can put additional uh, red dot here to obtain uh, to obtain this kind of results. Maybe I can even move it a bit. Uh, okay, so. It seems that it seems that um, I I have done pretty good job here. Uh, okay, let's move on the next to the next images. I have labeled cats already, so probably I should label say a person. Uh, okay, let's pick a person class and uh, put a rectangle around a person like this. And then again, details might matter or not, but if they matter, I may put some additional dots here, and maybe I would like to exclude this empty space here, so I may like press Shift and click, and it will produce this red dot. Okay, it seems like like a good job, but yeah, one more thing. So a smart tool might be quite general purpose, so uh, I may uh, pick say uh, I may say okay, I would like to to label some general purpose object, say a part of the car. And again, the combination of this green and red dots will allow me to, uh, to quite uh, quickly label. And when I put a red dot, I, I just press shift on the keyboard and click and, uh, and, uh, and then I obtain this kind of results. Um, okay, so probably I will label, okay, I have a car object, let me label quickly a car here. Um, I should stop at some point, I suppose. So, yeah, the car is also labeled in a pretty good way. Uh, I don't know about this. Yeah, so probably this wheel should, should be included like that. Uh, yeah, I think it's more or less good. Uh, and let me label last uh, low resolution uh, object. So maybe I would like to label the cup here. So I may again follow this procedure by putting a combination of red and uh, green dots. So maybe I would like to exclude this space. Yeah, I think it's more or less good. Uh, yeah, that's how smart tool works. But let, let's move on here and try to 
try to label uh, the images with bounding boxes. Uh, and, uh, so, and, and here is the way how we can uh, uh, address that task. So, earlier we deployed uh, uh, two models, uh, one for object detection task and the other for uh, instant segmentation task. And I can run an image labeling uh, app from here, from this tab, from this app tab. Uh, and it's just an interface on top of deployed model. And once we deploy the model, we might have multiple interfaces to interact with this model. So, in a couple of seconds, uh, the app will be started and, uh, and I will be able to connect to the deployed models and obtain predictions right inside this labeling interface. So, for example, I can connect to uh, MM detection model uh, uh, as a first step, and then I may pick the classes that I would like to recognize, uh, or I just recognize all the classes. So, if I apply the model to this image, uh, I will get uh, quite a number of uh, objects uh, detected uh, automatically. So. Uh, so we see that uh, we detected uh, quite uh, quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of objects here, including uh, including persons. I may undo this uh, undo these predictions, and maybe I can deselect all the classes and just pick persons here and apply the model again. Um, and to see, uh, we obtain predictions uh, for, for for persons in a quite uh, in a quite precise way, uh, and we can actually move on to the next image and try to apply the, sa the same model uh, to, uh, to, this, to this image. And we just found single person here and maybe we will select again all the classes. Uh, and probably I will drop this person and uh, apply the model like this. And we've, we have managed to, fi to find uh, uh, two cars, umbrella and a person. Uh, okay, so, but that's not the only model that we have deployed. I can disconnect from this model and connect to the other model uh, that, uh, from Detectron2 uh, repo, repository. If I connect to this model, I can actually do quite similar things here. So, let me probably just drop all the annotations here and try to apply this model uh, for, for, for this image. So. Uh, and Detectron uh, also finds these cars that are far away, as well as uh, objects, uh, person, object, umbrella, and so on. So you see that the pre predictions of these models are, are quite good. So uh, just several more examples here. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't find the dog. It's interesting. Uh, let me try uh, try it here. Um, yeah, so the persons found, the dog found, and some other objects here found. Uh, okay, uh, probably the, the question that you would like to ask, what if we don't want to like apply this model uh, to, to each image individually, maybe we, we would like to take the entire project and apply uh, the model to process all the images inside the project at once. And that's exactly what I'm going to show you next. Okay, we have seen uh, how we can use uh, detection model and instant segmentation model uh, right uh, from a uh, labeling interface. And the next thing that I would like to show is that we can take these models and apply them on top of project to process all the images at once. So what I did, I actually dropped all the classes so that this project is empty. and. Uh, the way for me to apply a model on top of a project is just to run an app from neural network section here, apply neural network to image project. Uh, let me just run this app. So the app is started. And the first step I have to connect to one of the models. So let me connect to MM detection model uh, first. Uh, again, it just uh, it it shows me all the classes that uh, that the model is capable of processing. Maybe I will just uh, pick all the classes here. Uh, it also allows me to specify some settings 
and it shows me the preview of the results, which we see that uh, the, the results looks quite good. Let me probably just uh, define the, the name for the target project. Uh, I will just call it, uh, say, uh, uh, detection. Uh, um, detection uh, results uh, and just apply uh, this module to all the images inside the project and and model generate and, and the app generates uh, me uh, a new project with the name that I have defined here I can click right right here or alternatively I could click on projects and see that um, and see that this new project was generated and if we open that, we will see uh, how a model uh, performed. Uh, so, uh, so far so good as for me. Uh, yeah, so, uh, uh, yeah, it, 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 it even managed to find the person inside the car. Uh, so, a lot of objects here. Um, here, I, the person is missed actually here, okay. But but we see that uh, this uh, by relying on um, on uh, pre-trained models, it might be a powerful way to speed up labeling process. Uh, let me actually do one more step here and just do the same with instant segmentation models that we also deployed. So again, I will use this um, uh, this unlabeled project with no classes defined, and and I will apply. Uh, and I will run actually the same app, apply neural network to image project app. Uh, and I will wait until it is initialized. Uh, so let me open it. And this time I will connect to, uh, to uh, Detectron 2 uh, model. So that's instance segmentation model. Again, we see all the information about the model here. And probably I will also pick all the classes here. And I will leave all the settings as uh, they, uh, they were by default here. And we also see the example of predictions, actually quite quite good predictions, uh, at least for cats. Um, okay, uh, let me just probably uh, define the name uh, here and say that this is uh, segmentation uh, results. Uh, so that's the name of the project that will be generated uh, uh, once the app completes the processing of the images. And again, I can click uh, right here to see the results or I could go to projects and open uh, this, uh, this generated project. Uh, okay, let's quickly examine how well the model performed the task. So those are the results that model has. Uh, generated. Uh, yeah, so uh, so it struggles to find the dog. Uh, uh, yeah, so for me the results are actually quite good. It's a precise mask actually, more or less precise mask here. And the mask here is also more or less precise. Uh, okay, next topic. So far, we have seen uh, two labeling interfaces on top of object detection and instance segmentation model. So the first uh, inference interface that we have seen was right inside labeling interface when we process images one by one. And second inference interface that we have seen was on top of the project when we have generated these two projects for instance segmentation model and object detect detection model respectively. What I would like to do next is to show you yet another inference interface on top of smart tool. So suppose that we have the following task. Suppose, suppose that we have uh, a project with uh, six images that looks like this. So we have lemons and kiwi fruit, kiwi fruits labeled with bounding boxes. And what we might want to do is to find a quick way to convert these bounding boxes into masks. And uh, the app that I, I'm going to show you next does exactly that. So uh, let me go back and uh, just run uh, an app called uh, Batch Smart Tool on top of this project. Uh, I like this example a lot because it illustrates how 
custom labeling uh, interfaces and AI models might be combined. So I will keep the data in original order and connect to the smart tool and also I will specify the padding here. So maybe I will just make it about uh, um, the put, put here uh, 20%. And what it allows to do, what this app allows to do is to apply smart tool simultaneously to all the all the objects here. So for example, if I put a dot, the dot is replicated on all the uh, objects that, that we see. And we can click update the mask to see how uh, smart tool applied simultaneously to all the objects. So we see that results are quite good. Let's click, click next batch. So we have no more lemons and let's pick kiwi fruits here and do approximately the same. So we'll, I will put a dot here, which will be replicated. Um, and I will just click update masks. Um, and some of the objects are labeled in a correct way. Uh, some of them are not, so I can click unlink so that the dots are no more replicated. And what I can do, I can just put here uh, red dots like this to indicate the mistakes of the model and, and uh, you see that as I put as, as I, I put these dots, these green dots, the models are the predictions of the model are recalculated and now everything looks good. Let's move on, click next, next click next batch and let's do we can we can put uh, we can put uh, several dots uh, at once and try to update the mask uh, simultaneously. And now I see that I think that that every mask except this one is correct. So uh, I can again unlink and just put here missing red dot and now everything looks good. And that's actually it. Uh, we have no more objects. And what it means is that uh, is that we obtained here a new project and this new project now contains uh, uh, the original rectangles as well as this new masks. So I may just drop all the unnecessary uh, uh, rectangle shapes just to, uh, to have uh, the masks. Uh, and let's take a look at what we have obtained. So, uh, so we performed this conversion actually quite fast. And that might be that batch smart tool again is very nice illustration of the idea when we combine AI models and customization of interfaces into one scene. Let's move on to the next example. My next example will be about the case when a smart tool fails to perform. And I will show you uh, what we can do about that. Uh, more specifically, let's open this uh, project with cracks and we just have one class here called cracks uh, associated with bitmap uh, shape. So, and we have the images like this. And if we try to open, if we just open uh, this image, say, uh, and pick uh, a smart tool, the uh, uh, our we pick our default smart tool and if we try to label these cracks uh, we will see something like that so uh, i will try to put uh, green and red dots to uh, to to label uh, cracks as precisely as i can uh, but you will see that no matter how many dots i will put here uh, uh, my results uh, will be uh, quite bad. So I will not be able to make this smart tool kind of work in a good way here. So it, 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 it cannot uh, quite understand what I want from, from it. And maybe I, I, I can hope that I can put more and more dots and, and it will uh, start to produce meaningful mask, but it's not the case here. So, uh, so um, I tried hard, but I failed. And here's what I can do. 
I can actually train Smart Tool to address specific tasks, and I show this exactly this use case in the next uh, live demos. But now let me just take a checkpoint, a module uh, that uh, that I trained specifically for the task to uh, label cracks. So I will go to Team Files. Uh, team Files. Uh, is a very interesting uh, notion uh, that that actually contains directories and files. Some apps can produce files. For example, when, when train models, uh, training apps will produce checkpoints. Or say some apps might produce reports. And here I have just uh, a checkpoint that I obtained, and I show and I will showcase in the next live demos how to uh, how to train models. But for now, I, what I will just do, I will just copy the path to this model and then I will go and uh, deploy the model, uh, uh, deploy one more smart tool model. So I will go to interactive segmentation and I will just run this app, but this time I will not, uh, I will not deploy pre-trained model, I will rather put uh, the path here, I will rather put the, the path to the model here and I will also say specify that this is a smart tool for, uh, for cracks. Uh, okay, and let me just run that. Uh, so once this smart tool is deployed, I will have access to uh, two versions of smart tool, and we will be able to compare uh, how they work. Okay, uh, now the smart tool is deployed, uh, and if I go back here and refresh the page. This is our my previous attempt to to label the cracks. Um, let me probably drop that. And uh, here now in this list, what I will see is just two smart tools. So let me pick the one that we deployed and called cracks. And now if I try to label uh, the same uh, the same uh, data, what I will uh, obtain is something like that. So you see that. The, uh, the annotations are way more precise here. So I can even extend this, uh, this grid even further, maybe, uh, maybe even like that. And I get uh, all the cracks uh, labeled uh, in this kind of fashion. Um, let me probably show you several more examples. So say I can label this one. So this is, this is extremely illustrative. See that it 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 work quite uh, quite precise here. So uh, so the point here is that uh, whenever we have uh, complex objects like cracks, it's very beneficial to train models and to to customize them uh, to deal with the task uh, at hand. Next, I will start showing you how we can uh, use. Uh, the same models actually to efficiently label videos. Let's move our attention to videos. We just have one video project. So if I click on that, I will see no classes, no tags, and the videos uh, look like this. Uh, let me quickly play them and probably I will turn off the sound here. So on one video we see cars, on the other video we see cows, and on the last video we see uh, teenagers. And uh, first thing I, 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 I would like to show is uh, how we can could use here uh, interactive models. And the first model we have already seen. So let me navigate to the very first frame here. We have already seen smart tool, we have seen two inference interfaces, and that would be just yet another inference interface on top of smart tool. So let me define a class person, uh, and probably I will pick some bright color here, maybe this one. Um, and what I can do, I can, I can use smart tool uh, in approximately the same way as I used it uh, when I showed you uh, the smart tool in uh, image labeling interface. But, but I will enable like 
uh, clone figure on option here that will allow me to do the following. Probably I may want to be a bit more precise here. So let's see. I will just put two more dots. Um, and uh, here, if I press right arrow, what happens is that uh, I go to the next frame and the predictions uh, for the smart tool recalculated uh, each time I move to the next frame. And I may move uh, the box uh, from time to time if I want to, if, if, uh, if object is moving. So, and you see that uh, just by pressing uh, right arrow, I can, um, uh, I can uh, and 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 moving uh, the box uh, a bit, uh, I may get uh, masks for subsequent frames here. Um, let me actually show uh, the result. So uh, what we have created is uh, just one object, and this object now contains of uh, six uh, figures. So that might be that way might be quite uh, uh, fast. Uh, to label uh, uh, objects with masks uh, if the object objects are not moving too fast. Um, okay, the next thing that I would like to show is tracking. Let me deselect this object and maybe move to the next video, say this one. Um, and tracking works like that, so uh, interactive tracking in this case. So let me define a class called, called cow here. Uh, and what I will do, I will probably just label uh, uh, say several cows. So let it be the first one. Um, let me probably label say this one because I can cle clearly see it. Um, and probably this might be the uh, the third one. Um, so I have these three objects, and what I could do, I could select them all and rely on this app trans t that we previously run to to propagate these boxes further. So it will work like this. Uh, so the model will try to take this, uh, the, uh, the, the annotations on this frame and propagate them into uh, subsequent frames so that I don't have to, uh, to label uh, these boxes uh, every time. And probably I have to disable yeah, this figure clone option. Uh, and you see what's going on here. Uh, we just uh, we just propagated these uh, boxes on into next uh, 10 frames and let me probably show you uh, approximately the same procedure here so uh, I may try to uh, label uh, uh, several cars uh, yeah, so probably I have to create a new object here a new class uh, let's call it car class let's it also be rectangle maybe uh, uh, I will pick slightly different shape here, uh, color, sorry, here, maybe the green will do. And let me try to label uh, just several cars to see uh, how uh, how it will, how the procedure will work here. So I will label uh, the first car like this, uh, say the second one like this, and maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe this third one uh, like this. And probably let's try to label uh, the bus also. Okay, so we have labeled these objects. Uh, I can select them all and try to propagate either forward or backward. I can pick the direction. Um, so uh, let's see how, how this model will perform. So this is like class agnostic checking algorithm. algorithm. So it should be, shouldn't be that sensitive to uh, to various classes, uh, but let's see how it will perform. Uh, okay, so it generated uh, uh, to us annotations, and we see that it's actually working uh, quite quite good. And and we can can proceed this this thing. So we can select those objects again and check again, and propagate these annotations further and further uh, with uh, this kind of interactive approach. So let's wait until it uh, process all the boxes here and just quickly check the results. So yeah, that's what we have obtained. Uh, looks good. Uh, okay, the next thing that I would like to do is to rely on the models that we used for images on uh, 
detection and one detection model and one instant segmentation model and to process these videos uh, all at once. What I would like to do next is to take a detection model that we used for images and apply it to process all, all these videos in this project. So I have removed all the annotations that we previously uh, put. So let me go back on the project level and uh, run an app uh, called Apply Neural Network to Video Project. And let me probably run this app uh, on the same machine where I deployed uh, those, uh, 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 those detection and instant segmentation uh, model. Let me run this app. Okay, the app is ready. Let me open it. Um, okay, I select this uh, project and let me connect to uh, the detection model first. So we will see. Uh, I, I will select all the classes here uh, and, and then I may play with the parameters and maybe I will just give it uh, a name. Uh, so uh, let, 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 let me just uh, point out that it's a detection, a detection model. And I can also preview, which, which is usually a good thing to do. So it will take a couple of seconds to generate this preview. It will take uh, 30 frames uh, and process them and visualize uh, the results. So here is the video that was generated. At least we see that the, the cars that are closed uh, to the camera are labeled in a quite a good uh, way. Uh, and, it ha and the model has problem with these cars that are further away. Uh, okay, and let's just apply the settings and just apply this model to all the videos that, uh, that we have in the project. It might take uh, a couple of uh, minutes to uh, uh, this, this processing might take a couple of minutes, so I will be back when it's over. Okay, I'm back and we have project uh, after labeled. Uh, let's open it and examine uh, the result that uh, the model uh, produced. Uh, okay, let's start say with this uh, with this uh, car uh, recognition here um, and we see that we see that uh, actually the cars that are relatively nearby uh, are recognized quite good and we, you also probably see that uh, can, can notice that these uh, identifiers uh, do not change so it actually means that we solve detection and tracking task uh, at the same time so this recognition results relatively good. Uh, okay, probably uh, let's move on to the next video. Um, and here uh, you can also see that everything is uh, more or less good and also uh, the, in most cases the identifiers of the objects are preserved. Um, so yeah, so let's move on to the uh, next to the last video here and we see that uh, teenagers are actually also uh, recognized quite precisely. Colleagues, let me take one step further and show you how we can convert those tracklets that we have generated for persons, cars and cows uh, into masks. So. Uh, so this is a project that was after labeled that we have generated uh, and let me run a batch smart tool uh, for videos app and I will just run it on the main node. So this app uh, will allow me to take tracklets and uh, convert uh, selected tracklets uh, into masks. Uh, let's let me show how to do that. Let's open this app. 
it might take a bit of time to load um, okay let's con let's connect to the smart tool and probably we are not we will not work with cars i would like to pick uh, another class here called person and uh, and i can navigate over uh, different tracklets here so we have three teenagers and probably let's let's label the person who was in the middle um, and i will i will put, put some uh, padding here uh, and then i may use this batch smart tool in in a very similar fashion that i used it for uh, for images again we just we may put one or more uh, green points uh, the points are synchronized and then I may click update masks here to obtain uh, masks for uh, uh, for all the uh, uh, detections of this uh, of this person. Um, I can see actually that minor mistake is here. Uh, I can unlink and probably put uh, one more green dot here to to, to make adjustment. Uh, and I may click. Uh, 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 click next button here and actually do similar operation uh, put dot update mask and that's a way how we can convert uh, detections for object uh, for specific or for specific person in this case uh, into ma into masks annotation let me just do a couple of more uh, examples here and show uh, how the final result looks like Okay, let's update the mask for all the, for all the detections here. Yeah, again, uh, if we see some uh, uh, that something is not that precise, we can probably unlink and put uh, a dot uh, to uh, to adjust. Just last one. Uh, okay, just let's do this last one. Uh, so and and since uh, the position of the person is not changing much we might be quite efficient in uh, in obtaining masks mask in this kind of fashion so let me probably just close this close this uh, app go to projects and and we should see like a new project generated uh, with the video that we uh, that we labeled uh, so we labeled uh, the object on this video and 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 we see that for some number of frames we uh, generated uh, the mask with this uh, batch uh, smart tool for video i would like to do one more thing i would like to take uh, instant segmentation model that we used for images and apply it to process all the videos that we have and I hope to obtain precise masks as a result. I would like to do one final operation with this video project. Let me first make sure that there are no classes and tags, so the project is empty. Uh, and what I want is to take this instant segmentation model that we used for images and apply it to process all the videos that we have in this project. And to achieve that, what we can do, we can just uh, run from neural network uh, se section here from neural network uh, uh, menu uh, apply neural network to video project app and let me probably uh, run this app on the same machine where I have the model uh, instant segmentation model deployed so let me run this one So the app is ready, let's open it. Again, let's select this project. And this time we will use this, this model from Detectron 2, uh, this instant segmentation model. Let's, let's connect to that. Let's actually pick all the classes again. Um, let's select, select those classes. Um, let me define uh, the name, so I will put the indication that it's uh, instance uh, uh, instance uh, segmentation. 
probably I will skip the preview step and just apply the settings here and click apply neural network to video project button. So the model is heavy and uh, it will take probably 5 or 10 minutes uh, for all these videos to be processed with the model. Um, and when the app uh, completes computations, uh, I will be back. So the processing is completed and uh, we have this new project created. Let's open it and see the results that we automatically obtained. So probably let me go to the very first frame and you see that the results looks good and I think that this model tries to get uh, the cars that are even further away. So let me just click on more or less random, random places here to show that uh, to show that th uh, the results are actually quite quite nice. Uh, okay, let's probably take a look at uh, uh, another video. Yeah, here everything is more or less good, and I can I could probably hide this uh, hide this object identifier so that we could better see the results. Yeah. Um, okay, um, and what about cows? Um, so it seems that cows are also fine. Yeah, so if I click through this video, I see that quite a number of cows are found correctly, though so not all the cows uh, are identified ideally. And what about teenagers? So let's see. Let, pro let me probably uh, enable this uh, uh, object ID. So we see that teenagers are actually identified quite precisely. So let me stop here. Um, let me stop here and make some final comments uh, on these examples. Colleagues, let me quickly summarize what we have seen in this section so far. So, what we did, we at, at the very beginning, we deployed uh, several models. We deployed a smart tool model uh, and later we deployed a very specific smart tool model for crack segmentation. Uh, we also deployed object detection model and uh, instant segmentation model as well as the model that allowed us to perform interactive object tracking on videos. And then we start working uh, with these models to process, to pre-label uh, images and videos. More specifically, we use various uh, inf inference interfaces on top of the deployed model models. For example, uh, when it comes to smart tool, we used uh, basic labeling interface to communicate with this model. We use batch smart tool. We use basic video labeling interface also to communicate with the smart tool model as well as batch smart tool for video labeling. When it comes to object detection and instant segmentation models, we also use several interfaces. One example of the interface was when we run this model, apply this model, to every image right from image labeling interface. We also have seen how we can take the, those models and apply them to process either entire image project or entire video project. And then we saw interactive, uh, uh, interactive tracking model uh, in action uh, when we uh, label videos uh, in a semi-automatic way, when we track objects in a semi-automatic way. I think that the idea that we can deploy the models and then have a variety of inference interfaces on top, uh, this idea is quite powerful and that's one 
of the main points that uh, I wanted to illustrate uh, in this section. But that's not yet it for this section. I have a couple of more examples to show. Colleagues, I have two more examples to show in this section. The first example will be related to images and customization of labeling interface for a specific task on images. And my second example will be about customization of labeling interface for video for very specific task. Let's start with the first example on images. And in this task, what we have uh, is uh, the images like this. Uh, those are just products on supermarket shelves. And you see that those products are labeled with uh, bounding boxes. And what we might want to do is to assign to each uh, rectangle here, to each uh, product uh, labeled with rectangle, uh, a certain attribute, say uh, a product identifier. But the challenge here is that there might be too many product identifiers to keep in mind, and we need some way to automate this labeling process. So, more specifically, we have the following. We have a catalog. We have the following catalog here, uh, which includes uh, a number of tags here. Uh, overall, uh, we have uh, 50 uh, tags. Uh, and the images uh, that we have in the catalog looks like this. So, we have just 50 images. And for each image, we have uh, associated tag. And we want this uh, tags to be uh, assigned to each of these boxes. And here is how we can address this task. We will rely on app, uh, on a specific app to, uh, to, uh, to achieve this customization, uh, uh, to perform this labeling. So uh, let me probably put this, this app tab uh, on the left first. Uh, and I will run a metric learning labeling tool uh, app. So let me run that app. So the app is started and it asks me to connect to a metric learning model. I deployed the, those models uh, previously. Uh, so I connect to this model and so we connected to metric learning model and we also have to connect to the app that stores all the embeddings, all the feature vectors of our catalog. And I will connect to this app as well. So probably I can do the following, I can fit this image. So what this app allows us to do, for example, it gives us the access to the catalog so that we can do uh, visual inspection. Uh, and for example, we may uh, pick uh, an item here and uh, and then uh, assign the tag if we see the match, but in this case it's not, uh, the products uh, do not match here. Um, but let me speak about more interesting use case here. So uh, probably I will disable this, this regime and the interesting uh, scenario is when we select the object and and our AI model, uh, metric learning model outputs uh, top, say seven most similar, similar top, uh, most visual similar items. So it works like that. For example, I may pick this uh, this uh, uh, this rectangle and go to uh, text section, and what I will see is uh, is uh, the uh, top top te uh, top uh, uh, seven predictions. Uh, and I see that, say, this product match uh, the selected item here. And I may press uh, assign tag button. Uh, if I uh, click on this button, I will see that, uh, that we have associated uh, this tag uh, with uh, this product. I could, uh, okay, let me probably just keep doing that. So if I press this button, uh, uh, okay, let me probably press uh, this button so that the next uh, item is selected and we see that once we select the item, uh, the app produce uh, top recommendations. So I also will assign a tag 
to the selected product here. And if I pick, say, um, this product, this rectangle, um, I will also see the recommendation and it happens that uh, the first recommendation is correct, so I will assign the tag as well. And actually I may keep doing that, so let me, uh, let me proceed and say probably pick this, this product here. Um, uh, and again, I see uh, top seven recommendations and I can just assign uh, uh, the proper tag uh, here. Let me do a couple of more just to showcase uh, the dynamics. So again, you see that the very first recommendation is correct and I can assign the tag. Um, maybe let's just label say this, 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 this seems like a hard case, so if I click on on, on this item, uh, probably it's probably correct recommendation actually. So let me also assign a tag to this selected to this selected product. Uh, okay, just last one. Say let's pick this one, um, and again we see a, a correct a recommendation on the very first position here. So I can click assign button. And what I have achieved, I have assigned tags to uh, several products. And alternative approach uh, is manual labeling, which is not that easy. So we see how customization of labeling interface in combination with metric learning model allows us to uh, significantly speed up labeling process. Let me probably let me probably finalize this example with some comments. So first comment is that I relied on, uh, on uh, this uh, app, this servant metric learning app uh, and AI recommendation app to uh, make this AI assistance possible. And uh, also if you go to ecosystem and click on collections and you will see here retail collection. So you will find here and a number of apps necessary to uh, reproduce the use case that I have just shown to you. So let's move on to the next example. Colleagues, I have one last example to demonstrate in this section. And this example will be about video labeling. And I would like to take a slight, slightly different perspective here. So I would like to demonstrate you a scenario when we have very specific task on videos and we would like our labeling interface to be as simple as possible in a way that it solves exactly this task and no other task. So let me show you what I mean. Uh, suppose that we have videos from uh, various cameras, from camera 1 and camera 2, and we would like to label certain events. And the event start, uh, the event start on camera 1 and end on uh, camera 2. So we kind of have a simple uh, multi-camera labeling scenario here. And to address this use case, I will rely not only, not on uh, our standard uh, basic uh, video labeling interface, but rather on a very specific app. So let me run this app. Uh, it's called uh, Mark Segments on Multi Camera Videos. Okay, let's run it. Let's open it. So here is how the app looks like. And as a first step, what I will do, I will create a tag. And I will call it, say, uh, entrance. Because the event that I will, uh, I will label is related to entrance. Uh, okay. And then uh, I have four videos here. Uh, actually two pairs. The first pair of the videos and the second pair. Uh, let me first work with this first pair. So let me take the video from ca camera one and put it on the left. And the video from camera two, I will put on the right, like this. Uh, let me see if there is any events here, no. And I will just start, uh, start labeling the events of interest. Let me play this video 
and explain what kind of event I will label. So I will label uh, the, the time when a person uh, comes in uh, the courtyard here uh, on this camera, on this first camera. And I, I would like to, uh, to match this with the event when the same person appears on this uh, second camera. So here is the event. Maybe I will go back a bit here. Something like that. So maybe I'm interested in understanding how much time does it take for the person to cover the distance. So I will create a segment here and we see this segment uh, on this uh, table. So we'll see this, uh, uh, this uh, frame index that match with the first camera and this uh, frame index is the same as uh, the index on the second camera. Let me just create uh, another as a fake segment just to illustrate that there might be a multiple segments, multiple events here. So I will just probably wait for the person to leave uh, like this and just create another segment. So I just label two segments uh, on these uh, two cameras. And I can click mark videos as done button. And if I navigate up, I will see that uh, the, uh, the first two videos are processed. And let me quickly uh, do the same operation uh, with, the second with the second pair. So let me make the camera one, uh, put the camera one on, on the left side uh, and uh, camera two uh, on the right side. Uh, and I will, I will also say, see that if there is any, anything labeled, not. So I will start labeling and very similar procedure. So I will run this video until uh, I will see the event of interest. In this case, the event is the same person comes in and maybe I'm interested again in understanding how much time does it take for the person to get to the parking lot. So I will run the second video. I can navigate over this video if I want. Uh, so I will wait for, for the event and then I will stop and create a segment. Uh, again, we see the segment created and maybe I will mark this video as done uh, as well. So I have labeled these four videos and let me show you how, uh, uh, how uh, the result of this uh, work of this labeling looks like in the default video labeling interface. So let, let me close this tab uh, and go to projects and this video project and I will just open uh, the same videos in a standard labeling interface and what we see is, uh, so okay, let's navigate to this very first video. I have labeled two, two events here. So, uh, so here is the first event, this is a real event and, and internally we the app put here entrance tag with the value uh, begin one. And if we go to the second video, we will see uh, the entrance tag with the value of end one. So that's essentially corresponds to the end of the first uh, event. And the same, uh, the same for the uh, second event. In, in our case, it was like a fake event that we labeled just to demonstrate that there might be multiple segments uh, for the pair of the videos. Uh, yeah, so I think that's it for this demo. And uh, one last comment uh, about uh, this uh, use case is that it's important to have a large variety of simple uh, labeling interfaces for very specific tasks. And you can expect uh, a lot of these uh, simple labeling interfaces, simple task specific labeling interfaces available in supervisor ecosystem over time. Colleagues, in this section, we have seen quite a number of examples how we can take AI models and use them to make labeling process of images and videos more efficiently. We also saw the idea that customization of graphical user interface may be very useful and uh, speed up labeling process uh, for very specific tasks. Let's move on to the next modalities to point cloud data and to DICOM data and see how AI models might be used uh, to process those modalities faster. 
Colleagues, let's switch our attention to LIDAR data and DICOMs. And in this last section, what I will show is how we can leverage uh, AI models to speed up labeling process for LIDAR data and for DICOM data. And this section will be presented in a similar way as the previous one, in a sense that first I will show you how to deploy the models that will be needed for us to do labeling tasks. And then I will rely on these deployed models to solve several tasks on LiDAR data and on DICOM data. So let's start with AI model deployment step first. In this demonstration, uh, I will need two projects. Uh, first project contains uh, point cloud data and the second project contains DICOM data. And for me to demonstrate how we can leverage AI models and machine learning, I need to run first uh, several apps. Uh, let me do that. So I will go to neural network section here and uh, let's start with DICOM first. Uh, what I would like to show uh, uh, is uh, how we can use uh, interpolation, interpolation app. Uh, so there is volume interpolation app available here, which I will just run. Uh, this app doesn't require GPU, so I will run it on main node, the machine that does not have uh, GPU installed. So let me run this one. Uh, then uh, what I would like to do is to, uh, is to run a smart tool, we have seen it already, uh, but it is also applicable to when we label DICOM. So uh, in this case I will uh, run the smart tool on, say, uh, this machine with GPU. Ok, let me run it. Uh, when I run, I run the server app, it will actually deploy this smart tool model so that I can use it in labeling interface. Uh, so let's switch our attention to point clouds. And for point clouds, I also would like to show how interpolation works. So I will run a simple interpolation app. And again, I will just run it on a machine without GPU, uh, like this. Uh, and uh, last thing that I need to do is to run uh, another model, uh, another app, which which called uh, uh, SurfMM Detection 3D. So that's quite a powerful app. It's just a graphic user interface, graphical user interface on top of MM Detection 3D repository. It contains a number of good uh, pre-trained models uh, that can uh, process uh, LiDAR data. So let me run this one. And this one I will run on, uh, on, on the same machine as I run uh, smart tool. Uh, maybe I will give session name here, like uh, 3D detection uh, model. 3D detection, sorry, detection model. Uh, okay. Ok, uh, the app is started and I can pick here various pre-trained models and deploy them or I can uh, deploy a, a custom model by defining the path to the weight file, file with weights, model weights. Ok, let me probably pick a certain architecture here, say uh, SSN architecture and let me deploy say this model that was pre-trained on a lift dataset. Uh, let me click serve button and in a couple of seconds uh, uh, the model will be, uh, will be deployed. So the model is deployed and let's probably go back to see uh, what we have accomplished so far. So if I go to app sessions here and click on running. What I will see is the following. So I will see. Uh, so we will use this 3D B-box interpolation uh, when we will work with point clouds, as well as this uh, uh, deploy, deployed model that we called 3D detection model. Uh, uh, and for DICOM data, we will use a smart tool, uh, and we will use uh, uh, this interpolation algorithm that we also deployed. We have run several apps and deployed AI models. Now let me show you how we can use them 
how we can use these apps and these models to solve several labeling tasks on LIDAR and DICOM data. Let me start with linear interpolation on a point cloud uh, data. So let me open a Kitty dataset first. Um, and I will align myself with this camera and probably I will move forward. And somewhere here, here you will see, you see this uh, two cars labeled. Uh, maybe I can uh, pick a brighter colors here. Okay, so we have these two cars labeled with cuboids. And also, uh, uh, also if, we, if we go further here to the frame number uh, 23, we will see actually the same cars also labeled with the cubo with cuboids, but what we might want to do is to label these frames, this 22, 21, 20, 19 and uh, 18 uh, frames. So we need to interpolate between, uh, between these cuboids. So let me start with this, uh, with this object first. So uh, this object has uh, two figures. Uh, this object has two figures. Uh, on uh, one figure is uh, located in frame number 17 uh, and uh, the other uh, object is located in, on the frame number uh, 23. So, and interpolation is quite easy. So what I can do, I can just click select button and go all the way to the end frame here and click interpolate. So that's actually it. And let, let me show what we, have, uh, what we have achieved so far. So I will deselect, I will deselect uh, this uh, object and again align myself with the camera. So, uh, so this was like our original state. But if I scroll further, you see that, uh, that we have uh, put uh, this uh, frame automatically on the frame that, that were not labeled. Uh, so uh, let me try to repeat this process with this second car. So again, I will select this car and this car has two figures as previous one. And again, I will select, uh, click select button, go all the way to the, uh, to the top, to another annotated uh, figure for this car and click interpolate. And now what we should see if I deselect the tool and again, just align myself here. Um, so, say if I go here, no cars labeled. Uh, this was uh, these two cars was originally uh, originally labeled, but um, but but these annotations on the frames that I am showing right now to you uh, were generated uh, automatically. So this was the last uh, frame that uh, this, is, this was actually also labeled frames. And if I open, uh, click on a object here, I will see that that this figures this figure was placed like manually, and there is little indication here uh, that uh, these figures were placed automatically. So the next thing that I would like to do is to process. Uh, this the entire point cloud episode with the model that we have previously deployed. So let's do that. Okay, let me pre-label the entire point cloud project at once. So in this project we have uh, lift uh, lift data set and kitty data set, and let me make sure that there are no classes. So I will drop this car class so that we are working with empty project. Um, okay, let me go back. Uh, and what I can do, I can run an app from a neural networks uh, category here called Apply 3D Detection to Point Cloud Project. Um, let me run this app. So, and in this app, what we will do, we will rely on the previously deployed model. Um, let me show you how to do that. So, here I will pick the model that we have previously deployed and called 3D detection model. Uh, I'll connect to this model. Then this model uh, was, was trained to, to recognize a certain number of classes. Probably I will just pick all of them. Um, then I may specify the target project. So, let me call it LIDAR demo uh, auto uh, labeled. Um, uh, I may specify confidence levels, uh, 
some uh, other parameters. So, uh, and then I may specify whether I want to solve just detection task or detection and tracking task. So detection and tracking is better because I want to keep track of uh, detections across uh, point, point cloud frames. Uh, okay, and and then, and then I just click apply module to input data button, and the processing uh, uh, will be initiated. Uh, so it will take a couple of minutes for these uh, two data sets to be processed, and I will see you when uh, uh, the process uh, this process is finished. So I am back, and the processing is finished. And the app has generated a new project for us under the name that we uh, provided earlier. So let's click on this project and see the results. So let's first open a uh, lived, uh, uh, lived data set. And here we should see very good results because, uh, recall, we deployed the model that was pre-trained on, 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 on this lived data set. So the results should be nearly perfect here. Um, and let me probably do one thing. Maybe I will just disable this option here. Uh, so it's not that informative to inspect those results. Probably just a sanity check, just to make sure that uh, that everything is uh, processed kind of uh, in a good way. So we trained on this. So the model was trained on this data, and uh, and uh, we see that. Uh, uh, that uh, the results are quite good. Uh, way more interesting case is Kitty, uh, because the model wasn't trained on Kitty. And let's open a Kitty dataset to see uh, how well the model performed. Because say if the model works good here, it actually means that we could use this model to pre-label our data. And since the labeling on point clouds is very hard this pre-labeling uh, is very very efficient very very essential so let me probably show object ids here just to illustrate that that the model not only detect but also tracks here and i can like proceed in this manual way uh, and you see that the quality the quality is actually quite good and it is very beneficial to run this kind of models uh, before manual labeling because we don't have to start labeling from scratch from scratch we may rely on these initial uh, predictions to um, uh, and start from there not from uh, like raw uh, raw data uh, okay so probably i should stop here and uh, and move to the dico Next thing that I would like to do is to show you how we can automate labeling of DICOM volumetric data with the app that we have previously deployed. So let's, uh, let me show you the classes that I have defined for this project. So I have defined brainstorm class and I, allowed, I, I allow it to be any shape, the same as lung class. Um, let me open the data. And I have tried my best to label uh, nine, uh, nine uh, masks uh, that looks like this. So uh, this is uh, so uh, so I select here I select here the object called brainstorm and it contains nine figures and and nine figures looks like this. Uh, that's my best attempt to label brainstorm. Um, and what I can try to do next is to run an interpolation algorithm so that I can fill in these gaps, uh, these gaps uh, automatically and also obtain a 3D reconstruction of the brainstorm. And the only thing that I actually need to do is to select this object and I have it selected and click interpolate button. And, uh, and now we see, uh, see this uh, interpolation results in other projections as well. And we can, uh, we can uh, inspect, uh, inspect the quality, uh, so it looks like this. Uh, and maybe we could use this uh, as uh, an automation of labeling. Uh, so 
we may want to generate uh, annotations for certain slices automatically or maybe we just want want to like take this interpolation and download it download it and use it elsewhere uh, we also obtain uh, this uh, 3d reconstruction that looks like this and as for me it looks good okay let me move to the next example in this example, I will try to label this LAN and I will use uh, Smart Tool and Interpolation app to achieve this purpose. Uh, and I will do really rough uh, labeling. So, uh, so let's let's start. Uh, uh, the way I will approach that task is uh, I will move uh, upwards here and I will use Smart Tool to label uh, uh, to label uh, certain slices here. Uh, okay, let's uh, probably uh, zoom in first, uh, like this, and try to label uh, a couple of slices with smart tool. So, let me do it in this kind of way. So maybe one point is missing. Yes, that looks good. Um, okay, let me slowly move like upwards or on this along this axial projection so uh, okay maybe maybe it, maybe i will do uh, do it like this put a couple of green and red points um, yeah it looks good uh, okay let's label this slice Actually, this is a default smart tool, and I am uh, very surprised that it's uh, work, working reasonably well for medical data. Uh, I want to label here about eight or nine uh, slices or something like that, just to uh, just to have something to uh, to build interpolation from. Uh, okay, and. I hope I I get the LAN, the LAN more or less right because I'm not sure actually uh, uh, the about the exact borders here. Uh, okay, so I, I think I'm pretty close to the uh, I'm pretty close to the very top here. Uh, I probably have to label a couple of more. Uh, and you see, it's kind of if we rely on smart tool that is not uh, actually that was not trained to deal with medical data, we, we still is quite efficient at labeling individual slices. So, a couple of more. I don't know whether I have to exclude this part. Okay, let's ex exclude that, uh, and maybe on this one as well. Uh, okay, uh, let me do the last one uh, like this, and let's inspect uh, now what we have achieved. Uh, let's take a look at the individual figures next. So the figures for the object that we have labeled. So we, we created eleven figures, and they they look like this. Let me zoom in. Uh, tried my best to make it more or less precise, but uh, not completely sure that I got everything right. Uh, okay, so uh, this is our labeling. We have labeled 11 figures here. Let me click interpolate button to run this interpolation app uh, so that we have this uh, uh, these slices that we have not uh, labeled uh, yet after labeled and also we I hope to to see some 3d reconstruction so okay let's probably uh, hide this object but uh, but make visible interpolation only uh, and if we navigate over this uh, Excel over this Excel projection. So probably let's start with uh, let's move upward uh, and just uh, and just uh, start with uh, with this. So this is the first slice that we have 
one of the first slices that we have labeled. And we see that this is not right, but, uh, uh, but for most, for the most slices, the interpolation uh, performed quite, quite good here. Uh, and we also may navigate a bit for uh, in other projections. But to make our 3D model more precise, we need to label a bit more masks on uh, and probably use uh, use these uh, coronal projections as well. And say we may take a look at the 3D uh, model of the LAN that we have built. Here is how it looks like. So we can make it full screen. Um, okay, so probably I stop here and uh, make some final remarks. Colleagues, we have seen a number of labeling interfaces in this live demo and I would like to make a quick summary. Uh, this presentation, uh, this live demo included three parts. The first part was about basic labeling interfaces and I have shown you those labeling interfaces for various modalities. The second part was about the idea that we can rely on AI models and customization of user interfaces to speed up labeling for images and videos. And the last part, the third part, was around the idea that we can take AI models and significantly speed up labeling on LiDAR and DICOM data. But I would like to use slightly different set of slides in this summary. I have shown you these slides before when we spoke about supervised lab concepts. So in this live demo, I have shown you basic labeling interfaces for images, videos, uh, LiDAR data and DICOM data. And the ovals, the area of the ovals here represents the scope of tasks that labeling interfaces can uh, solve efficiently. So we seen that basic labeling interfaces and supervised lab are quite powerful and allows to address a certain set of tasks uh, quite efficiently. But I think that the main idea of this video was the following. It was the introduction of AI models into the labeling process that increase uh, scope of labeling tasks that might be solved efficiently uh, quite significantly. And we have seen examples of that uh, in the second part when we spoke about how we can leverage AI to speed up labeling for images and videos. And in the third part when we spoke about LiDAR data and DICOM data and how we can leverage these AI models to make the process faster. And very important point here is that supervisor naturally built to support this kind of extensions with AI. And I try to show you dozens of examples how we can take AI models and speed up labeling process significantly. And last idea here is that we can further increase the efficiency of labeling process. We can further increase the scope of tasks that we can, the scope of labeling tasks that we can solve efficiently if we introduce customization of labeling interfaces for the tasks at hand. And I showed, showed you a number of examples for images and videos. Uh, I showed you a couple of ways how we can customize interfaces for specific tasks. Okay. I will stop here and see you in the next videos. Let's talk about second principle, which is uh, collaboration at scale. Uh, and collaboration at scale is about the way uh, the large amount of persons with various expertises and uh, responsibilities, uh, such as annotators, reviewers, domain experts, data scientists, can work together in a convenient and transparent and systematic way. So these three columns of the task matrix has to do with uh, collaboration at scale. And mainly collaboration at scale is about data and people. That is kind of high level perspective of the problem. And when it comes to data, we have to be able to organize it, to manage it, to do quality monitoring and to automate. And for each of these tasks, we have uh, certain tools and supervisor. So, when it comes to people, the tasks will be quite similar. So we have to be able to organize people into team, specify roles, 
manage the annotation process, for example, by creating annotation tasks, performing reviews, and so on. Uh, we have to be able to understand the quality of the work uh, each person is doing, and we have to be able to automate. And again, for each of the tasks here, for people, we have certain tools that addresses these tasks. And in the live demo, we will show uh, concrete small examples related to collaboration at scale, as well as do short overview regarding uh, data and team management. Colleagues, we are at principle two, uh, collaboration at scale, and welcome to the live demo. This live demo will include a really brief overview about data organization and teams, users and roles and interconnection between those entities. And also we will consider a use case where a team of labelers will annotate images with rectangles. And I will use this, this use case to illustrate various scenarios which you can implement to implement a collaboration uh, in Supervisor. So let's start with an overview. So I logged in in Supervisor under my name, uh, Boris YY, and I am a member of uh, several teams here. So, so uh, sometimes we want to, to separate data and uh, people who are working with the data. So for example, there might be a certain number of people who work with, say, retail use cases and uh, some other team members might work on some other projects. So, and and it's uh, normal in Supervisor to be a member of several teams, like in my case, I am a member of, of, of these uh, five teams, and in each team I have an admin role. So let, let, let me select first this in-house team, which will consist a number of just three, actually just three workspaces, and uh, these workspaces may contain different data or data from different sources. So, for example, there might be a workspace that contains, say, data from supermarket shelves. And, say, uh, uh, this workspace consider uh, fruits and vegetables. So, I have uh, two batches of data for fruits and veg vegetables. Uh, those are two projects. If I open the first project, I will see uh, four images like this, uh, contained in data set that is called DS1. And another project contain uh, another batch of data also for just four images here. So that's about data. What about persons uh, or uh, team members? If I click start and go to team members, I will see that I will see three team members here. So that is myself, uh, where is Y Y, and I and I have an admin role here. I also have. James and Oliver in my team who has an uh, annotator role. I may invite more team members by clicking this invite button, putting the name of the login here and, uh, and picking the appropriate role. And it's important to say that the role itself defines the access level to the data and the activity, the actions that a specific person with a specific role can actually do. More specifically, if we go to uh, documentation and to members section here, we will see the description of, of roles available and we will also see the, the table here that, uh, uh, that illustrates for each role which actions uh, might be taken, uh, which, which actions are allowed. So let's go back, let's go back here. We don't need to invite more users for now. And in the next, in the next uh, example, what I will show uh, is, uh, is the process uh, of uh, how I can organize annotations of these two, uh, two projects uh, with slightly uh, uh, different settings. Uh, and, uh, and in the meanwhile, I will ask the, the team members that I have uh, to help me uh, perform uh, this uh, labeling task. So essentially, uh, we have finished with uh, an overview. It was a really brief one. Uh, and let's focus on the use case. So we have two labelers and uh, two projects. Uh, and we want to uh, organize the collaboration process and demonstrate various collaboration scenarios. Let's take a look at the data first. 
those are two projects that I would like to label. Uh, let's open the first one. Um, it just contains uh, four images like th that looks like this. And let me first create classes. Uh, uh, so I will label uh, lemons here, and I will mm, and I will use uh, rectangular shapes uh, to label them. And let me also pick a color here, say like this. Uh, also, I will create uh, a class for kiwi fruit. I will just put kiwi for short here, and I will also uh, define a rectangular shape for this class. And I will also specify the color, say a red one in this case. Now, of course, I could go uh, and uh, label uh, the data, uh, the data myself. So essentially, what I could do is just to open this labeling interface, go to the very first image, maybe close some tabs here, and just pick uh, a rectangle, uh, a class, specify a class and just do everything myself in this kind of fashion. But, but it's not uh, the point uh, in this video I would like to, I would like to illustrate a, a collaboration of uh, several uh, persons to achieve uh, the, the same result. So let me actually drop my annotations and, and instead I will, I will follow uh, a bit different approach, so I will ask uh, my team members uh, to, do the, to perform these uh, labeling tasks. And these labeling tasks are called uh, uh, labeling jobs. And, and, and you see that James has an annotator role and Oliver has an annotator role, and those are the persons uh, to, to whom I will assign the tasks. So um, let me go to uh, labeling at scale section here and just create a new labeling task. So let me call it, um, let me call it uh, 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 lemons uh, labeling, uh, uh, labeling job. Uh, uh, I could provide either short description or detailed description here. Uh, then uh, I, I will be the reviewer in this case. And I would like to assign uh, this task to label uh, to label lemons to James. So I will ask James to label lemons, and I will ask Oliver to label uh, kiwi fruits. So the next thing is to define uh, the project, and I will deal with uh, this project, this part one, uh, fruits and vegetables part one, and I will pick a data set that contains four images. Uh, I may also specify whether to use basic labeling interface or advanced one, so I will stick to basic right now. And I will restrict uh, the labeling to only one class here. Uh, I may also define whether uh, a person can see annotations uh, on only his own or, uh, annotations or annotations of other, of, of other people. In this case, let me pick, uh, let me define the option to see only own, own annotations. So, and after that, I can just create this labeling task. So, what we see here is that uh, the task is created by me, and the task is assigned to James, and uh, also I'm the reviewer of the task. Uh, now, what I can do is to actually uh, clone this task, uh, and uh, I will say that, okay, I want to label the same image, the same images. This time, though, I would like to label uh, uh, kiwi, uh, kiwi fruits, so maybe I will define the task something like this, some in, in this kind of way. Uh, but this time I will assign the task uh, not to James, but to Oliver. Uh, and I will still be the reviewer. And you see that the data sets here is, the data is the same, seems we just cloned. Uh, 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 clone this labeling job based on the same data, but I will ask to label different class in this case. So I will ask to label kiwi fruit. Uh, and after that, everything is the same. I will just create this uh, labeling job. So again, we see that uh, that I created another task, assigned it to Oliver, and I am myself also the reviewer in this case. So let me actually log in as uh, logout and log in as James. So. It's important to illustrate here the following concept. So if I go uh, uh, to the Teams 
uh, of uh, James, uh, I will see that uh, James, uh, uh, James is a member of two teams. Uh, the one under his name and the other, is, the other team is uh, in-house team. And, and it's important to mention that, say, in, in one team uh, a person may be admin or have some other role. But in, 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 in my team James has very limited role called uh, annotator. And if James, uh, if I as James go to the in-house team, uh, what I will see here is that actually nothing is available uh, for me here to do except to complete the tasks that were assigned to me. So let me do exactly that. Uh, I will open this uh, this task, uh, and what what you will see is that I cannot create more classes. I just can pick one single class and one single instrument here and label on the lemons. And let me quickly uh, quickly do that. So here is like one lemon, uh, and let me submit this one. Click confirm button. So let me define another one. Um, and say this one, confirm, and the last one, but let me make de deliberately here a mistake, so I will not, I will do very imprecise annotations here and submit this as well. So I have completed the task that was assigned to me and uh, assigned to James, uh, and after that I can just say, okay, I want to submit this, this results. Okay, so James, in, in this team, uh, James has no more tasks to complete. Uh, okay, let me, uh, let me uh, uh, log out and log in as Oliver. So Oliver has also uh, one task to complete. Uh, and and the, and since Oliver has an annotator role in this team, uh, again, uh, actions are not available to Oliver here except uh, the actions that is related to completing uh, the task that is assigned to, to Oliver. So Oliver may open this task. Again. Uh, the classes, the only class that is available is Kiwi Fruit. So let me also complete uh, complete the task to to illustrate the the idea. So I will quickly label all the Kiwi Fruits here. Uh, so yeah. So and probably I should confirm um, and label uh, more Kiwi Fruits. I have just uh, four images here, so it will be relatively fast for me to complete this task. So let me label these three little key fruits. And I will I will label more or less precise in this case. Uh, so the last one, the last image. Yeah, now that's it. Uh, so I confirm also. If I go back, I see the progress and I also submit. Oliver in this case has no more, uh, no more tasks to complete. Let me log in under my account uh, again to see the outcome, uh, to see, to see uh, what came out of the work of uh, James and Oliver. So, in very straightforward way is just to open this original project and data set, say in this labeling interface, and what I will see is the aggregation of the work for uh, uh, James and Oliver. Uh, and uh, I may stop here or I may uh, keep working on the level of labeling jobs. So let me actually illustrate one thing here. So if I go to settings, I may disable show who created uh, an object as a text. So that's a useful option. It was on actually. Uh, so I can click this button and see that uh, that lemons was labeled uh, by James and Oliver label uh, uh, kiwi fruits. That might be useful for analysis. Let me go back to the labeling jobs actually. So, uh, if I go to labeling at scale section, what I will see is that the labeling jobs, the tasks that I create for the users has 
different status now. So they have on review status. And say, uh, let me first deal with uh, Kiwi fruits, uh, with the task that uh, performed that that was performed by Oliver. So let me actually open uh, these images. Uh, probably I will just start with the very very first one, and 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 I may say, okay, I like the way it's done. Uh, I click uh, uh, accept uh, button here, uh, and that's okay also, and that's okay as well as. Uh, as well as this, um, and uh, yeah, the, uh, the, 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 that is the first one. Um, so I'm pretty, pretty much uh, satisfied with uh, what uh, Oliver has accomplished. I may just go and correct annotations here myself if I want. So for example, this is not that precise. I may correct it a bit uh, if I want. So, uh, so, so nothing prevents me from, uh, from, uh, from editing uh, the objects uh, that, was, uh, uh, that was completed by an annotator. Yeah, so let me go back. Uh, so let me uh, see the statistics of the labeling task that uh, that Oliver has completed, and I see that there, there was like four images, and and four images was accepted. Uh, if I go back uh, and uh, let me go back and deal with uh, the task of uh, uh, James the task that was assigned to James. It has also on review status. And by the way, uh, this task for, for Oliver, I can click finish so that this task becomes uh, completed. Uh, so let's open uh, the, the labeling task, the labeling job that was completed by James. Um, let me actually also start with the very first one. So uh, say I, uh, I accept this image uh, accept this image, uh, accept this image, uh, but I definitely don't like uh, the way it is labeled. Uh, one way I just can correct myself. Uh, uh, one way to deal with is just uh, correct myself. Uh, the other way is uh, maybe more systematic, so I may, uh, I may do the following. So I may uh, create an issue here uh, so that I can, uh, I can say that box is uh, too wide, for example, uh, and create a new issue. This issue will be sorted as a feedback uh, uh, for, uh, for, for, for James to know uh, what was wrong with the annotation and, and uh, the way for him to correct, to correct this mistake. So what I will do, I will just ask to, uh, uh, to annotate again uh, this image. I will ask James to annotate this image again and correct the mistake. And here is a way how to do that uh, in Supervisor. So probably I have to refresh this one. Um, and um, um, yeah, so uh, yeah, I have just forgot to actually reject the reject the image. So I have created an issue here, but I also have to say that okay, I I don't like I don't like this image. So this this this, this image is uh, is rejected actually. So again, if I go back, so and now I see that uh, if I go to statistics here, um, I will see that uh, uh, that uh, three images are accepted and one is rejected. Uh, so. Uh, let me go back, and and here is interesting button here. Uh, restart rejected. So if I click on that, uh, I can say that okay, let mark existing uh, labeling job as completed, but create a new one uh, where the task will be assigned again to James, and I will be the reviewer. Uh, and if I do this action, there will be a new labeling job job created. Uh, for James to complete, uh, and this labeling job will include this uh, this one rejected image. So let me quickly log out again and log in as uh, James. So now I see that uh, James has. Uh, so uh, I'm I'm James right now, and uh, I have this labeling job, and this labeling job just contains one image like this, which I can actually go and correct. Um, so it works like this, uh, and then I will just confirm that now it's okay, and I will 
submit these images, this, this, this labeling job uh, with just one image. And again, if I uh, log in as myself, um, and uh, if I go back uh, to the uh, labeling at scale section and to this uh, uh, to this uh, job that is on uh, review right now. So I see, okay, now everything is good. I can just accept that. And and now my, uh, and, and now uh, the annotation process for the first project is completed. So I can just double check that by going to projects, open this project again uh, in any labeling interface and just quickly verify that essentially all the annotations are performed in a correct way. Now, uh, let's, uh, let's deal with the second project a bit differently. So, I have a uh, second part of, of this project, which contains just uh, another four images, which looks uh, similar, uh, but, and, and I also have created the classes already. Uh, and let me show you how I could, uh, uh, I could distribute uh, labeling jobs in a bit different way here. So what I could do, uh, I could go to labeling at scale section one more time. Yeah, and uh, uh, let me actually click finish, uh, uh, finish uh, to complete the previous labeling job. So if I go to labeling job, uh, to labeling at scale uh, section here. What I can do, I can create new labeling job and let me call it say labeling job uh, for lemons and kiwi. Uh, I will skip the descriptions here, but what I would like to illustrate is that I may assign not only to one person, but essentially to, to many persons. And if I do so, the images will be will be split evenly between uh, between those persons. So in this case, I will say, okay, I would like to label fruits and vegetables part two, and uh, uh, the date set name will be uh, this will be DS one. Uh, I will also pick. Uh, basic uh, uh, labeling toolbox here. And this time I will not restrict persons to label certain classes. I will just ask, uh, ask them to label all the classes that are available. And I will keep all the settings the same. Uh, here is what, what happened. So we, ha we had this second project, part two. Uh, and, and this project contained four images. Uh, and the images was were split evenly between James and Oliver. So James uh, has to label uh, uh, two images uh, from this project and Oliver has to label uh, two images uh, from this project. Let me actually complete uh, the labeling. Uh, so again, I will follow very similar procedure. I will uh, log in as James first. Now James has this new labeling task. Again, I'll just open that and uh, uh, so, and pick the appropriate class and just label uh, image number one here. Um, and then I will label the second one so I don't have uh, lemons here, I just have ki kiwi fruits. So, let me quickly label that like this. And confirm. So now, uh, uh, now James uh, completed the work and uh, he can submit it. Um, and let's do the same for Oliver. Again, log out, uh, log in as Oliver. And uh, Oliver has also two images to label in this case. And 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 you see that. Uh, in, in, the previous, in the previous example, we had just uh, one class available for each annotator. Now we do not implement this restriction, so we, we have all the classes uh, available uh, for each person, for each annotator. So let, let me first label lemon here and uh, quickly label kiwi fruits also like this. Um, yeah. 
like this and confirm. Oh, quite a number of key fruits, but let me quickly do that. This is the last image. And I have uh, a lemon uh, to label left, so let's, let me do that also. Yeah, I confirm. Uh, and now I can refresh this page. And I see that two out of two images are labeled, and I will submit. And the last step is just verification step. So if I log out and uh, log in as uh, myself here, um, I will see, um, I can open this project. Uh, and I will see the aggregations of the labels here. So in this case, I would like to enable uh, author also. So, uh, uh, so that I could see uh, who actually labeled uh, labeled the object. Uh, so I think this option will allow me to do that. Yeah, so this lemon was labeled by James um, as well as so the first image the first two images actually was labeled by James and the second was the second uh, uh, the third and, uh, and fourth image was labeled by Oliver. So that's it uh, for this live demo. Collaboration scale has many uh, scenarios and options which I didn't show you. Uh, it was brief enough, but hopefully useful. See you in the next section. Colleagues, I would like to speak a bit about quality assurance. And I would like to show you the app, which is called uh, Explore Data with Embeddings. Uh, this app uses a metric learning module from uh, neural network uh, category. And what I will demonstrate is how we can use this app to identify some mislabeled examples. So let's start. I have two projects here. So original Pascal work and Pascal work, the version of Pascal work uh, that I would like to mislabel a bit. So let's open this project. We have some classes some Pascal work classes, no tags. And let's open, um, say, well, dataset that contains over 1000 uh, images. And probably I will close some tabs here. And what I would like to do, I would like to pick some, uh, some objects that I will del deliberately mislabel. So I will pick probably a class, say, a bus. And let's apply the filter. And I will see here a uh, number of uh, images that contains buses. Maybe I will scroll down here to the very last images and maybe I will mislabel this one and say this one. Um, so let's, let's, let's corrupt our objects a bit. So let me select the object and say that and let me make this object. Uh, let me say that the, the object now has cat class. And then I will go to the next bus and maybe I will make this, this bus uh, to assign dog class to this, uh, to, this, to this bus, like that. So now I have two mislabeled, two mislabeled uh, example. So I called one bus cat and I assigned the class to the other ba bus, I assigned dog class to the other bus. Okay, let's now take a look what we can do to identify, to identify the, the mistakes that we have introduced. And what I will show you is that, so the first thing that I may do is to run a specific app, uh, this one. So let's run this explore data with embeddings app. Let's, let me run it on GPU, on this machine with GPU. Um, so, and let's wait for a second so that app is ready to use. Now let's open an app. 
So here is how app looks like. Let's specify some settings here. So let's say that we will we will try to find mislabeled objects in well data set. Suppose that we know that mistakes happened here. Uh, I will pick the smallest model for now. Uh, probably I will increase uh, the batch size. Um, and also I may specify whether I want to calculate the embeddings for objects, for images or for both. So let's let me calculate the embeddings for objects. Maybe I would like to increase uh, borders uh, uh, for objects, uh, but I will just uh, keep it as it is. And then I have to specify the projection, uh, the projection uh, algorithm, and I might have certain uh, options here. So the point here is that uh, is that let me actually run that and and explain uh, explain how it works. So the point is that. Uh, we might have, we have more than 1000 images here and for each image we might have say on average say 5 or 10 objects and for each of the objects the embedding vectors, uh, uh, for each of the ob object embedding vector will be calculated and then, uh, and those embedding vectors might have dimensions say 1000 uh, uh, numbers may characterize each object uh, or probably less 100 depends on the on the uh, layer of the model that we use to take this embeddings from and then we have the num some number of vectors uh, which are high dimensional and we have to project them on the plane and and the method the method here allows us to project this high dimensional vector that characterize objects back to two-dimensional plane. Uh, okay, let me wait a second until these calculations and uh, are completed and uh, I will I will be back. Okay, I am back. Let's take a look at the results. Uh, embeddings are calculated and projected into the plane and uh, here are the clusters that we have. So, uh, for example, this is the, this dot represents both objects, uh, those trains and we see that we see kind of distant distinct cl cl clusters here of objects motorbikes uh, those are airplanes let me uh, try to understand where I can find buses so see this is the cluster for buses and let me do the following let me try to like zoom in here like this and see if I will see something uh, something mislabeled so the majority of points here has green color. We can click on any point, by the way, and see the, the annotated objects here. Uh, some of the points are, uh, are gray, but this is neutral class, so this neutral class will be all over the place. Uh, some of the points are uh, yellow, so those are persons. Let's click and see. So, you see, uh, the reason why this, uh, this point is here is because it's like a person on the foreground here uh, and, uh, and the metric learning model. Uh, uh, so there is a person on the background, but the bus on the background and metric learning model thinks that it's probably a bus because spatial coordinates are computed by the metric learning model and the color is defined by the class that we have uh, associated with the object. And probably here we will have very similar cases. So let's see. Yeah. So again, person and and uh, and the bus. Uh, okay. So, but the interesting scenario is that we also interesting interesting scene is that we also have these two points. Uh, these two points with the labels of cat and dog. So let's click on the this this object and we see exactly the bus that uh, that we that we mislabeled. And what we can do, we can just click assign tag marked. So that if I click on this button, there will be a tag created in the modified version of a Pascal work, and uh, and this tag called marked will be assigned to this object. And let's move on and click on another another uh, object that might be mislabeled. Yes, yeah, so that's the case. Uh, again, we just can click assign tag marked here, and after that, 
what will happen is that if I go back to the projects and open this uh, Pascal Walk mislabel project, we will see here the tag called marked and let's go and open this val dataset and maybe close some advanced tabs here and just filter the images based on the presence of the tag. So we are interested in objects with tag, with specific tag called marked. Let's apply the filter and we will see exactly those images that we deliberately mislabeled. So if we, so you see that those object has tag marked. And what we can do next just to finalize this example, so we can pick an object, select an object, and say, okay, the class is uh, the class is bus now, uh, and I can do the same for the uh, for the other deliberately mislabeled object. So let's say that it's a bus now, and maybe I can just uh, get get rid of this tag here. Uh, so now now the, these objects are correctly labeled again. So that's it for this example and see you in the next videos. Now it's time to talk about principle number three, which is the platform principle. Here I will show you slides and live demo. So the principle, the platform principle is about extension and customization of supervised functionality via apps. It's also about quick constant growth of diverse and relevant apps so that the end users could solve their current and future tasks. Here is the content for this section. First, I will start with historical context. Then I will talk a bit about what, what, what are the differences between supervised and competitors in general. Uh, I will be back to the table and address some uncovered columns. And then I will talk about app development and I will conclude this principle with the live demo. Let's start with the historical context. And I will show you the slide that was created back in 2019. And uh, here are the slides. Back then we had two main challenges. The first challenge was better customization. And the second challenge was uh, technical value growth. If we talk about better customization, uh, we, we have seen the following uh, disposition. We, we have the following experience that say a company, potential customer say, keeps developing in-house annotation tools for some number of years. And then there is an intersection. This customer will either switch to enterprise solution, say to our enterprise solution, or, or they will keep going with their in-house tools. And the thing was that the only condition of switching is when company is actually sure that their current and future tasks are solvable within the platform or within the solution that they buy. And another challenge was uh, uh, technical value growth. So what and uh, on the X, so we have time access here and also uh, technical value access, which actually you can think of that as number of different tasks that particular software can address. And, and we feel that we experienced some kind of logarithmic growth because software becomes more and more complex and it's harder and harder to add more features. But we need a way to turn this around and to actually grow exponentially. And, and, and that slide that was created back then was actually about how we go from left-hand side to the right-hand side, from the left-hand chart to right-hand chart. So the two challenges are outlined. And, and there are two possible strategies that we as a company could follow. And the first strategy is extensive strategy, namely work harder. So it looks like that. Uh, we had uh, back then different categories of users with the feature requests that they generated. And dev team was on fire. Dev team tried to implement these feature requests. And it was just too many feature requests for the dev team to implement. And uh, and, and actually, it's hard to, to, uh, to grow in this kind of settings. Uh, strategy number two is, is about uh, creating an ecosystem. So it essentially means work smarter. We have the same slide here. So the same categories of users. But this time, uh, if we introduce supervisory apps, the platform might be customized for, for the requests that the, these groups of users might have. 
And in this case, dev team is happy because because dev team can focus on the core functionality and the number of feature requests that the dev team have to deal with is reduced dramatically. And there is no need to add more and more complexity to the labeling interfaces because specialized labeling interfaces might be here on the app level. So, and back then we saw, we saw that an app should be just a combination of uh, HTML fragment and Python script. And the most, the most logic, uh, the most functionality is on the Python side. And actually it's still the same today. So let's go back to the present, having in mind this is historical context. And what we see today is that if we, if we draw the timeline here, uh, we had very painful transition when we st which we started for, for a while ago. And, and our competitors had no such a transition. And that is, this slide illustrates in a very clear way the difference. So Supervise is a platform and our competitors are still products. And we can summarize that with the following slides. So what is different between competitors and supervisor? First, it's, it's technical growth. So as the code base of alternative solution grows, it's harder and harder for them to add new functionality. We, was in the, we were in this situation, we know the pain here. Uh, and since we have apps, uh, new functionality is actually not a problem anymore. And, and this further is illustrated by this chart. So they still had uh, logarithmic growth while we have close to exponential growth of the technical value. The second, the second point here is about customization. So it's nearly impossible to customize a product behavior without affecting usually in negative ways the experience of other users. And they have this dilemma, so they have to decide whether to change the product and risk the uh, and, and take the risk of negative experience of other users. But in our case, customization just reduces to app development. So another Another point here is variability. Uh, so usually products have only one right way to solve a specific tasks, task and users are forced to accept that. While in supervised it's kind of okay usual practice to have 10 more apps so that the task might, might be solved in a different way. And, and final item here is scope of tasks. So either the most popular all very specific tasks are addressed, but not both, by the products, while all tasks in computer vision will be eventually addressed by supervisor. And uh, the next slide illustrates this last point, scope of tasks. So if we take all the tasks possible in computer vision and just put them on the x-axis here, and some examples are like labeling with polygons, detection uh, models, training, and so on. So here we have all the tasks. And, and on the x-axis, we'll put number of potential customers or popularity of the task, say. Then we will have the curve like that. So some tasks are more popular, some tasks are less popular. And there is a mass market needs and niche market needs here. And product companies have basically two choices here. So the first choice for them is to stay here and provide like a solution for the mass market. But this solution is not deep enough. The second option for them is to, is to address niche markets and specialize on something. But supervised platform or platform in general do not have to choose between those two options. We can eventually address all the tasks in computer vision. So let's go back to the table, to the scope of tasks here. And we have these columns to cover. And I think that the best the best way to cover them is via live demo. So there are a number of categories in this table and, and for these categories we have specialized apps. Again, I will show them in the live demo. Last column here to cover is about automation. And there are two ways in which we can address automation. Uh, one is via Python SDK and the other is with REST API. So Python SDK is definitely easier way. Uh, REST API is more like low level way. Let's first discuss a Python SDK. To get started, you just need to execute a command pip install supervising and that, that's it. There are other options as well here. 
this is just an example of code that uh, that leverage uh, supervised SDK. So, for example, uh, you can create project, upload image, uh, and download annotations back. So we work hard to simplify uh, Python SDK. Uh, let's now talk about REST API. And uh, REST API is a collection of JSON uh, RPC style methods. Uh, there are a lot of methods that we have, and and these methods follow Open API specification. Uh, and this uh, REST API methods actually cover the full functionality of Supervisor, and the documentation is very good here. And also, this REST API is the basis for Python SDK because Python SDK is just a wrapper around uh, API. Let's say a few words about app development. As a reminder, uh, uh, purpose of apps is the following. So, apps are the main mechanism to extend and customize supervised functionality. And from the user perspective, apps should, apps should uh, have the following properties. So, they have to be functional enough. They have to have graphical user interface, complex visualization and interactivity. And even most importantly, probably, it should be easier for Python developers and data scientists to develop supervised apps. So ideally, Python developers uh, write their code the way they used to do it. Uh, app and app, the app interacts with supervised via Python SDK. Uh, layout for graphical user interface is defined by simple HTML and user interface Components like tables, charts, buttons are controlled via Python objects, which we call widgets. And ideally, all the code, code base or the majority of code base is on the Python side, while HTML is just simple or even trivial. So next I will show you an example of uh, interactive object uh, distribution app that is quite functional, but also will take a look how it looks from user perspective and from developer perspective. Colleagues, I would like to illustrate app development process a bit. And for that, I will use uh, one specific app called uh, from reports and stats category called interactive object distribution. And I will apply this app to process the labeled images from Pascal work dataset. Um, so let me uh, first show uh, what the app is doing and then I will show you the source code of this app. So, I will run a very specific version of the app uh, for the reason that I will explain shortly. Let me just uh, run this app first. So, the app is ready. Let me open it. So, first the app asks me to, uh, to, cal to click this Calculate Stats button and it will process around a little less than 3000 images, labeled images from Pascal work dataset and it will show me like basic overview. So what we see here is the names of the classes that uh, are specified uh, for this uh, project and on the, on the columns here we see the number of objects of specific classes. So what, what the app allows us to do here, say if we take a person class and navigate over this cell, it will, it will show us the references to 507 images that contains exactly one person. And we see that there are less images with two persons and maybe I will navigate to this cell that, uh, that, uh, to that, to that cell that contains five persons and we have 25 images that satisfy this condition. So if I click on this cell, what I will see, I will see the, the references to these images. I can open them in labeling interface if I want, or I can just click preview button to see the images uh, themselves. And I should expect to see here uh, five persons. So that's exactly what we see, uh, what we see here. And I can navigate to other images here and click on them as well to inspect that it's the case. And that might be quite a convenient way to, let me also check the, the last one. So yeah, we also see here that uh, that probably there are more persons in the bus that I think that only 
five these persons are labeled on this on this image. Okay, and what this app allows us to do in general is to is is to explore a bit our data sets. For example, here we see outliers uh, like in this cell. Uh, so we have only one image that contains uh, quite a number of bottles and say this image that contains uh, unusual number of objects of class ship. Again, we can click and and take a look at the image that uh, uh, that corresponds to to specific condition. Um, okay, so let let me quickly show uh, this app from the source, source code perspective. Uh, if I click on this button and click on GitHub page, I will find myself on the GitHub page of, of a specific app. And in this example, I used uh, I used very specific version of this app. It was uh, this version. Um, okay, and this version uh, consists of uh, includes Python code, and it also includes uh, uh, HTML uh, HTML file. And in the latest version of this app, uh, we completely get rid of HTML file to make the development, the development process uh, more friendly for Python developers. But in this case, the HTML file is relatively small uh, and we see that uh, there is uh, uh, references to the widgets, like this chart reference, that so if I open right now Python file, um, uh, if I open right now Python files, uh, there are just two of them. Uh, the, uh, the stats just do some preprocessing. It's also a relatively small file here. And uh, there is a main pie, which actually implements the logic. And let's see uh, if I search for this, for this reference uh, that, uh, that I outlined in HTML, I will find these references in, in, in uh, the Python file, so for example, uh, here we create a widget uh, for this uh, large table with a uh, uh, number of uh, objects. Uh, and here how we handle the clicks uh, on, on this uh, table. Uh, also, it's like a relatively small, uh, small file. And my point uh, is the following. So, with relatively small number of uh, Python code and uh, HTML code, we may ensure quite, uh, quite, quite rich functionality. Um, probably, I should also mention that that according to our experience, as apps becomes more and more complex, this HTML file uh, grows, and we, we wanted to avoid that. We wanted it. The development process is, is convenient for Python developers, and in the latest version of apps, uh, there is no HTML file at all. So, uh, that's it for this live demo. See you later. So, this app contains uh, 188 lines of code. So, that's kind of a good ROI return on investment, because with just uh, 189 lines of code, we get uh, very interesting uh, functionality. And this, apps use, and this app use uh, some widgets from supervised library, like uh, uh, supervised table and gallery, and the widgets from uh, Apex chart library. Uh, so if we decompose a bit supervised widgets, we will see that there are visualization widgets, con input and control widgets, uh, layout widgets, and uh, other specific uh, widgets available. We do have a ropers around other popular JS uh, libraries. Uh, and here is an example how easy it might be to create your own widget. Last thing to show in this section is live demo. See you there. Colleagues, we are at principle number three, which is a platform principle, and it's time for the live demo. I would like to start this live demo with a rather simple example where, we'll, where, where we will take a couple of unlabeled videos and convert them into labeled images of interest. More specifically, we will just import those videos after label them, perform some operations on top of videos after labeled, namely we will convert them into labeled images, filter these images out based on certain criteria and export the results. 
This example will help me to illustrate how apps from various categories can be chained together that result in kind of smooth process from raw data from import to the end result to export. After that, I will give, I will give more formal overview of apps in ecosystem and then I will try to demonstrate more apps with graphical user interface. Those apps will mostly belong to statistical or analytical category. And then we will talk a bit about app development. And I would like to showcase some concrete ex example when we can take, say, when we take an analytical app and add certain functionality, extend certain functionality and convert this app that can not only like visualize the data in a nice way, but can actually move the data around. So that, this example is quite uh, interesting to see. And finally, I will say a few words about supervised the Python SDK and Jupyter Notebook app will be a, a good help for me. So let's start with the example that we just spoke about. Okay, I have created an empty box space uh, for this example with videos. And the first step is just to import videos. I can click here um, or say I can click start and uh, click import to go to import page to import uh, the videos. And there are like essential import apps uh, most frequently used here. Or I may scroll down uh, to video section and just run import videos app from here. So I run this app and then I will just drag and drop two sample videos that I would like to import. So let me actually call the project, give a project name, say videos to process. Okay, let's make it full screen. Um, it will be fast actually. The videos are not that big. And if we go right now to projects, we will see the videos that we have imported. Uh, let's take a look at them first. So those are two videos. Let's open them. And maybe I will just go to the very, very first frame, which is zero, and, and yeah, turn off the sound and just play them. So my goal here would be to have to label those videos first uh, and then to extract, say, uh, certain objects that are less common than persons. So the first video looks like this. Let's take a look at uh, the second video and this video look, looks like looks like this. Okay, if we want to label those videos automatically, uh, we have to rely on some uh, deep learning models. And if I click start and click on neural networks uh, uh, item here, I will go to uh, neural network page where all the apps related to neural networks are aggregated. Let's say I would like to solve a detection task. And uh, I, may, I may use several apps uh, that would help me. So in general, I, I will have to use server apps and uh, I will have to run one of those apps. And if I say need, uh, say, semantic segmentation task, I would just go to semantic segmentation section uh, and, and, and also like use server apps here. Uh, actually, I am right now in category of images, but since this, this models may work, uh, this, the models, the app that are represented in this category may work not only with uh, images, they may work with videos also. Uh, uh, okay, so let's just uh, let, let, let's just utilize, let's just leverage this MM detection repository. Uh, let, me, let me run this app and specify the machine with GPU that I will, I will use. 
So it will take several seconds for the app to be started. And after that, I will pick uh, the model that uh, I will use uh, to perform the pre-labeling, to, to, to perform pre-labeling. So, uh, so this repository, this MM detection repository allows us to solve either object detection or instant segmentation task. Let's select object detection task here. And then we, we can pick an architecture and a number of checkpoints uh, within these architectures. So uh, let's take um, let's take probably Yola X architecture and select the second mo model. I, I just look here at the uh, at the score. So I mm, I pick the one that is like have high score, but but maybe not do not require does not require that much memory. Though this memory is on turning time. Okay, anyway, I will take this this one model and click sort to deploy it. So the model is deployed and we can verify that if we go to uh, app sessions here and click on run, we'll see that uh, that the model is uh, oops that the model is successfully deployed. Um, okay, so once we have the model deployed using the serving app, we can go back to our uh, projects and use this model to process this video. And to do that, I'll just click on context menu and pick uh, apply neural network to video project app here. I'll, ju I'll just run this app and I will probably use the same GPU, uh, the same machine with GPU. Uh, this app will perform like deep sort operation to transform detection into tracklets. That's why it uh, the GPU is required here. Let's run that. So after a while, the app will be initiated and started, and I can open it. So okay, let's select this project and connect to the model that we have just deployed. The model was printed on Cocoa data sets, the right number of classes that this model is capable to recognize. So let's select all of them. And um, I may play with confidence levels and preview the results. It's always a good thing to preview. Let's click preview so that the model takes uh, uh, 30 frames, uh, apply predictions uh, to those frames and visualize those deep predictions. Uh, it might be useful for us to see what to expect when we, when we will use this model uh, to process all the videos that we have. So after a while, uh, a short video, a short preview video will be generated and available for us to play from, from this app. So here it is. If I play this video, I will see that in general it the model does something reasonable. So let me just click apply settings and click apply neural network to video project. So it it may take uh, a minute or so uh, for this for those videos uh, to be processed. Uh, let's just wait until uh, the model uh, un until the app completes completed it uh, as a processing. Okay, the app is completed. The, the, the app has completed its calculations and it, it generated a new project uh, with uh, these two original videos and annotations on top. If we click right here, we'll see our two videos and let's uh, let's take a look uh, uh, how good uh, after labeling uh, is so I can probably play um, so we see that it's actually quite good um, it's actually quite good um, yeah I don't want to spend time watching all of 
all of these uh, videos here, just click on random places to, to show you that the person that are nearby actually uh, visible. Uh, later, what I would like to showcase is to take the frames where the model uh, managed to find the dogs. Um, maybe it's it's about the case when we have relatively rare classes, so the dog might be considered more rare class than uh, the person in this case. Uh, okay, that's how uh, that are the results of processing the first video. So this is the second video. Again, I can I can play it. Uh, sometimes annotations might be lagged a bit during visualizations here, yes, so there is a bit of lagging. But you see that like the the performance is is, is, is quite good and the identities of of objects are preserved here. So let's take this after labeled videos and convert them to images. And then use filtering app to extract objects of interest. In this case the objects will be of class dog. Okay, what I can do, I can just close that and and, and now I have like these two videos. Uh, uh, this video is uh, created automatically. Uh, and let's just run an app on top of this video uh, that will allow us to, uh, to convert this video to image project. And I will convert all the frames, uh, but also I would like to down sample. Uh, by the factor of 10. Uh, and I would like to do that just because I, I, I want images uh, to be a, a bit different. I don't want like very similar images. Uh, that, might be, that might be important if we want to use this uh, extracted uh, images later in the training process. Um, okay, let's run this, this app. So it will just take these uh, two up-labeled videos and make uh, image projects based on, based on those videos. And if I go here to projects, I will see this uh, this first two projects has like video caption here and this project has images caption here that indicate that this project with images. So maybe I will just quickly rename this, this project to say that it is like uh, say, uh, target images. Um, okay, let's rename that. And let's just quickly look how, uh, how those images uh, uh, are recognized. Uh, so again, I will just open some of those. And, and you see that it's more or less those images are, are recognized in a, in, in, a, in a more or less good way. Um, especially especially if the persons are not far away. If, in this example, even when persons are far away, the quality is good. But I saw in examples in video when the, re the recognition is not that good for the persons who are further from, uh, from the camera. Okay, so that was easy. We just convert labeled videos into labeled images. But what if I would like to like apply additional filters. So maybe I would like to take images that contains dogs so that I could use them further for say training purposes. Um, okay, uh, let's just run another app. Sorry. Let's just run another app. Let's call it, uh, this app is called uh, Filter Images. Uh, and this app will allow us to take uh, images of interest based on labels generated. So let's open this app. Um, okay, let's specify the filtering conditions here. Uh, it will be a pretty, pretty simple filtering condition. So I would like to, to, to take uh, images that contain some objects, but not any objects, but objects of certain classes, and this class should be, in my case, uh, a dog. Uh, let's try to find that one here. So here it is. And let's apply apply filters. So, so the app tells that uh, it managed to find uh, 
46 uh, images and 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 inside this app we can actually preview them uh, and you see here is a dog uh, and it managed to find the dog right here and we can like navigate and see the uh, filtering results and if necessary we could go and like change these conditions here uh, okay maybe maybe i like what i see let me let me probably check the last one here yeah so here is also the dog from other video and what i can say i can say here is that i would like to put these images into a new project and i will uh, give uh, 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 the name to this project say filter images filter filtered images i will put it into this new data set and i will just click this apply to uh, this button to create this new project uh, and I can actually proceed and apply some other filter and save the results and either in the same project or a different one let's say I will go here uh, and find this filter images project created and if I open it um, I can open it here to see what I have extracted so uh, suppose that my goal was to like enrich my training set with the images of dogs where there are a number of people around and actually uh, it seems that I have achieved this goal. Uh, I may correct certain annotations if I want uh, or, or drop certain classes. Uh, so it's not the point right now for me to, to kind of clear this up. Uh, rather, I, I, I just wanted to show you uh, how simple it might be to go uh, from raw video to images of interest. And as a final step, maybe I would like to, to export those images. And I also have quite a number of options here. So I may, uh, I may click on the context menu here and, and export this data in various formats. So for example, it might be uh, say supervised format that's more or less uh, default uh, i'll just run this app uh, to to export this uh, labeled images those labeled images into supervised format and it will generate for me an archive that i can click and download uh, another alternative for example might be to take this the same project and export it in some other format say uh, say coco format Again, I just click and say that well, maybe I would like to to uh, to export images and annotations, not just annotations. Again, I just run the app, and and it should it, it should generate for me an archive that I can click and download. Yeah, so those are uh, those are our uh, after labeled images. Uh, with dogs uh, in two different formats. So if I just right click, if I just click here, I will have this archive downloaded and the same here. So let's conclude this first example. Uh, and and I hoped I managed to showcase you that to you that we can use like apps from various categories. We used app from import uh, category. We used several apps from expert categories. We relied on uh, neural networks to after label uh, videos. And we also used several data processing apps like data apps that allows us to do data operations like filtering app and uh, the app that have convert the, the app that has converted labeled videos into labeled images. So see you in, 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 in the next section. Colleagues, at this point in time, you have seen a number of apps already in action. So maybe it's a good time for me to give more systematic overview of apps in supervised ecosystem. So let's start. A good place to start an overview of the apps available is here. So if we go to ecosystem page, we will see a number of categories uh, which app may uh, belong to. So let me, uh, let's do the first thing first. So let me say what we can do with an app. So evidently we can run each app. Um, and also uh, what we can do, we can uh, view more information regarding the app. 
So it's very good uh, thing to take a look sometimes into this documentation because here you will find a lot of a lot of uh, examples usually how to use the app and in what settings each specific app is applicable. Uh, okay, another thing that I would like to emphasize here is that uh, for each app uh, you can go to GitHub and see how the app is actually implemented. So currently all the apps in Supervised Ecosystem are open sourced and that might be quite convenient, especially for developers so that they can use these apps as a template for further development. Okay. Let me go back and try to go through these uh, categories of apps. And I will start with import category. So there might be uh, apps to import images, videos, point cloud, DICOM. So let's focus on images now. Uh, for example, this app allows to import raw images. Uh, this specific app import uh, images in supervised format. And there are, other imp there are other import options, for example, to import uh, images in uh, YOLO format, images and annotations in YOLO format, Pascal work format, and, uh, and Coco format as well. Uh, so uh, if I click on videos here, I will see actually the same but for videos. So here is an app that allows me to import raw videos, uh, say videos in supervised format, and so on. The same will be applicable for uh, point cloud data. So input point clouds uh, app, input point cloud episodes, as well as some uh, popular format like import Kitty 360. Uh, and the same works for DICOM. Uh, let me also say that this is like not the only place from which you can view and, and run apps. Uh, sometimes for various categories we can create uh, some standalone pages like for example if we go here to import page we'll see like the most recently used uh, import apps uh, we'll also see uh, some essential apps that kind of more popular uh, most popular and uh, we will also see all the apps that are related to uh, to that, that helps us to import images if you click on sample project, we will see some, some annotated images that you can import straight away. Uh, the same will work for videos and point cloud data and for DICOM data. So my point is that uh, there might be alternative pages or alternative groupings of the apps. And, uh, but like the most, general, uh, the most general catalog is here. Uh, let's move on to export apps. Uh, it's it's quite similar. So you can use uh, you, you you can export images in supervised format. You can export images as masks or in other popular formats like Coco, Pascal Work, Cityscapes. Uh, you may want to do something more specific. Maybe you just want to export uh, metadata. Uh, let's move on to neural networks, uh, and here. Uh, here in this category, we'll see all the apps that that are related to uh, uh, that, that that work with images uh, that utilizes neural network in some way, uh, and uh, those images might might be further decomposed depending on the task that uh, that the uh, specific that specific app solves. For example, th those apps uh, are applicable uh, to object detection task. Uh, Sometimes there are also like complementary apps, for example, this object detection matrix app that allows uh, to uh, visualize and analyze uh, the uh, results of a uh, detection model. Uh, uh, okay, uh, there are apps uh, to, that allows us to work with semantic segmentation task. And when I say to work with, I, I essentially mean either take predictions from some pre-trained or available models in general or train models. Uh, the same for instance segmentation, classification, uh, uh, interactive segmentation, those are the smart rules. Uh, and also there are some models that that we can there are some apps and models that we can we can work we can use when we work with videos. So those are just some examples. Uh, 
uh, so uh, we also have like uh, a separate standalone page for neural network apps. Um, and I like this decomposition here because it further decompose uh, the apps uh, in neural network category. So one thing to notice here is that say if I pick, uh, I don't know, say semantic segmentation, I will see that there are a number of server apps, two server apps for a semantic segmentation task, uh, which actually allows us to deploy models, uh, to deploy available models. Uh, there are training apps that allows allows us to train models, and there are also uh, uh, inference interfaces that works on top of uh, deployed models. So quite standard pattern, we use some, uh, some server app to deploy the model, and then we use one, one of the uh, uh, inference uh, interfaces to communicate the model with the model and take predictions from the model. And there are some complementary apps also. So, and if we keep scrolling down here and keep investigating various tasks, we will, we will see this pattern like serving apps, training apps, and uh, inference interfaces, and some complementary apps as well. Uh, so, let me just probably say that we also support classification on images, uh, directive segmentation, metric learning apps. Uh, when it comes to video, actually the point is that, uh, that if we train a model on, uh, on images, we can apply this model to process videos as well. That's why you, you will see some apps here that also, uh, that also included in category of images. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I encourage you to, to, to walk through that and to investigate more here. So for point clouds, we also have some uh, models that allows us to deploy the model to change the models and to like uh, uh, and some inference interface that can uh, you can use to take predictions from the models. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, let's go back to this ecosystem page uh, and uh, the next category here is uh, labeling. So what what we mean here by saying labeling, it's essentially uh, related to the cases when an app is built in into labeling interface. And for example, you can use some of those. Uh, so I think this one allows, it, it is like, it, it is running from this app uh, tab in labeling interface and it will allow you to apply models uh, right inside labeling interfaces. And this is an example of, and, and this is actually an example how we can customize uh, labeling, uh, labeling uh, interfaces. Uh, you can look at the videos to see those apps in action. Uh, so another another apps quite another quite interesting apps here might be say uh, apps for uh, metric learning when when we when we integrate uh, metric learning model here to effectively uh, to effectively classify uh, product ideas uh, so that might be extremely useful when we do labeling with thousands of categories. Uh, yet another example, maybe not deep learning related, but it's elastic, uh, elastic tool that we integrated. And uh, if you mm, used it before, uh, you will just uh, run it from the app, app tab, and okay, you can use this elastic functionality just inside labeling uh, interfaces. So in summary, uh, this app allows uh, to customize labeling interface uh, interfaces and add some uh, some extra functionality. Sometimes this customization is coupled with uh, deep learning capabilities of the models. And also there are some uh, there are similar uh, scenarios for uh, video labeling and for other modalities. Uh, so let let's move on and go to next uh, collaboration section. Those are just apps that may uh, uh, that uh, calculate statistics uh, regarding uh, labeling jobs uh, and the efficiency of labelers. I expect this category, the, the number of apps in this category will grow over time. Actually, uh, in every category, the number of apps will grow. So this is an example of a synthetic data apps, uh, which will which allows us to generate uh, label data artificially. This is quite promising and I show, for example, this flying objects app in the neural network uh, uh, when I do live demo about neural networks. Uh, 
Uh, okay, data operations. It's yet another important category. Very useful. Uh, maybe I will just uh, start with, uh, maybe I will go through these subcategories. Say, we might want to, to do some operations on images with annotated objects, for example, convert class shapes, or to merge classes, or to do some, uh, some form of sliding window uh, operation on top of either row or label data and also be able uh, to reconstruct uh, to reconstruct uh, the, the sliding windows later if we want to crop to crop objects and so on uh, so sometimes we might want to do like uh, cropping uh, crop, cropping operations uh, uh, resizing uh, uh, modality transformations this is quite interesting uh, set of apps because it allows a it allows to convert say image projects to video projects to image project and 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 vice versa and also do some uh, some form of transformations between modalities uh, there are some certain apps that helps with project management for example apps that merge data sets um, so this is just uh, a uh, app that, uh, that, 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 that helps us to artificially create data. We have spoken about that. And this is like uh, Imgaug uh, is just data augmentation app that actually replicates the functionality of the uh, original uh, repository, uh, original library, but uh, you can use it in a more like uh, uh, with a graphical user interface on top. So it, it might be a bit more user friendly. Uh, there are some operations on videos also. Uh, probably again, I cannot like explain all of that. Uh, so you can, for example, you can change frame rate of the video or take a fragment uh, from a video. That might be useful to take fragment from the video might be really useful when you like play with, uh, uh, play with a long video and you just want to take sample of this video and quickly process that uh, to save time. Uh, so, uh, so there might be some operations uh, on point clouds, for example, and here is an app that can work point clouds project to, to episodes that might be useful in some cases, especially if we have like huge point clouds. Uh, so uh, let me also say that uh, there is a page, there is a kind of alternative grouping of, of, of apps that works with data, so data operations page here, which actually uh, which actually uh, uh, sh shows uh, more or less the same list of apps, but uh, those might be structured in a bit, bit more illustrative way and, and some other decompositions might be available here. Uh, so uh, some other information. Let me go back and quickly talk about visualization and uh, statistics. So sometimes we want to understand better and, and learn more about our label data uh, and kind of connect together the statistics and uh, and and the data itself. I will show I will show some of the steps in the next section uh, uh, in action. Uh, but mm, say you may uh, you may like want to know which objects goes together when it comes to images. Uh, and you might want to have sa sa some general picture of your data set uh, and the ability to navigate. But it's, it's actually easy to show them to explain at this point. Uh, and there are some other apps for other modalities like, for example, uh, render video labels to MP4 just allows to take labeled video project and create video out of that project. Or say uh, we might be interested in detailed statistics uh, regarding, uh, regarding our labeled video, we can use this app. Uh, so uh, last category here is related to development and, and in this live demo I will show this Jupyter Data Science Notebook app that actually, uh, that actually allows us to run uh, Jupyter Notebook on top of Supervisor and, and, and this, this might be quite interesting if we want kind of a, a quick, a quick uh, look at say SDK and play around with SDK quickly uh, without, uh, uh, without doing anything uh, on our desktop and, uh, 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 and configuring uh, some VS code or something. Uh, and uh, lastly here, let me see if I can find some other things here. So VS code, it's not like yet released, but, uh, but soon uh, uh, VS code uh, will be also uh, available uh, uh, as an app that, that will actually allow us to create apps uh, very, very fast uh, right inside web browser. It's actually quite a fascinating topic. 
So that was quick overview. Let me say a few more words about kind of structure of the apps here. So if we go to, uh, to start menu and to projects, uh, one thing to notice here is the following. So if we have, say, a project of certain type, say image project, and I click on a, on a, on a context menu, I will see, I will see here uh, a number of apps that are applicable to image projects. And when I use Supervisor, I, I usually prefer to run apps uh, just from here because I can immediately see what apps I can use for, uh, for specific project types. So for example, if I click on video project, I will see I will see uh, a bit uh, different group and so there will be a, a bit less apps uh, that are applicable to video project. Uh, but, but at least you know, uh, you know, uh, once you click on a context menu, you know what, uh, what, what apps uh, you can use uh, straight away. And the same say for, for other projects type like Point Cloud episodes. Uh, you can click and see um, see what you can do. So, for example, you, if you run this app and you have the model deployed, you will uh, you will process uh, your point cloud data with some uh, models with, with the deployed models that will put say cuboids on this raw point cloud data. And say last example here. So maybe you want to download the uh, image project, and you will see straight away a number of uh, export apps that allows you to do so. One last thing to show in this overview is yet another is yet another grouping of the apps. So, example, if you go to start and uh, app session page, uh, in this uh, any section you will see uh, the list of apps that 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 you run at some point in time. If you if you go to running apps, you you will see a list of apps that are currently running. So, for example. At, at this moment, I, uh, I have a smart tool running and some YOLO V5 model. And you can uh, start, you can stop the apps, for example, uh, run new ones, uh, see logs, and so on. So, uh, in summary, uh, all the apps are aggregated here in ecosystem. There might be some uh, dedicated page for, for some categories of apps like import uh, or neural networks. Uh, also, it's convenient to run apps uh, from, uh, the pro from the context menu of the projects uh, because we will see immediately which apps are applicable to certain project types. And finally, app session page is also quite frequently used because it allows me to manage uh, what apps are running, stop them if necessary. So I think that's it and see you in the next section. Colleagues, what I would like to do next is to show you more apps with graphical user interface. It happens that uh, apps from a statistical or say analytical category was kind of under, underrepresented and I would like to close the gap here and show three apps from a statistical analytical category and one app that helps to do uh, performance analysis in a kind of visual, interactive and systematic fashion. Also, I will introduce the perspective of developer in the conversation. So we'll take a look at the source codes of the apps and also we will see how the development process of the apps has evolved. So we will see the source code of very first app, apps and we will see the source code for the app that was uh, recently created. And I hope to illustrate that, that actually today it's easier in and easier uh, to create new apps than ever before. So let's start. What I would like to do next is to show you uh, several uh, statistical slash analytical apps that helps us to understand better our training data. I will use Pascal Walk as an example. And in Supervised there are kind of built-in statistics for image projects. So, for example, if I click statistics, I will see that for each data set, how images we have in each, in each data set. I can see the relationships between images and classes of objects, as well as, uh, as, well as the relationships between uh, object instances and classes. So, for example, I know that, say, in this VAL data set, I have 108 uh, uh, instances, objects of, cl of class board. But the main problem here is that 
I cannot like click on the number and uh, see the images, these instances uh, of boats immediately. So like those numbers are not directly connected to the data. So in other words, the statistic might be not interactive enough. And to overcome that, what we, what we are doing uh, constantly, we keep developing new statistical and analytical apps. And I'm going to show you uh, several examples of those. So let me go to report, uh, reports and stats uh, section here and run plus stats for images app. So to make it faster, I'll just take 11% uh, sample and run this app. So, uh, and by the way, this class of stats for images app for, is actually one of the first apps that uh, was implemented for supervised ecosystem. But in spite of this, it's still quite useful. So what this app is doing, it, it actually shows several tables. The first table just populated with data on the fly, and there will be uh, other table and some other charts uh, after this app will uh, complete uh, its execution. Once the computations are completed, we will see like uh, several tables and, ch and charts here. So uh, the session is finished and uh, app computes everything, app has computed everything and uh, we see several tables, several charts and what I would like to do is just to focus on this first table. And explain to you what I mean when I said like interactive statistics. So if I pick a column here, like unlabeled, uh, and just uh, sort by the values in this column, what, what I can do here, what I can see here is that there is only one image in my sample uh, for which every pixel is labeled. So if I click on this image, what I will see is that every pixel is, is actual it's actually labeled here either with neutral class or with, cat cl or with class of cat. Um, if, I, if I sort this column in opposite order, I will see the images that are kind of mostly unlabeled. So most pixels are unlabeled. And, and it, 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 it might help me to discover images that maybe miss some labeling and so on. Maybe it's, maybe it's normal depending on the data set. So I, I can expect like uh, small uh, labeled objects on, 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 on these images. So let's take a look at several examples here. Uh, okay, another thing, another thing that I can do with this is to pick a class, say bird, and sort, uh, and, and sort the, the corresponding column. And I can see that, that on this, in this sample, uh, the image that contains a uh, maximum number of birds is this one and it's only like seven birds here so I can click and verify that it's uh, the case. Uh, last thing that I will show here is that uh, I can click on adjacent column here for bird and, and find the images uh, based on the number of pixels occupied by specific classes. So for example in, the, in this image I can see that in this image, I can see that there is only one bird that occupies almost half of the image. So there should be like a bird, zoomed in bird, like this. Uh, okay. And, and there are other tables here and charts that I could probably play with. But what I would like to do next here is to take a look at the source code of this app. Uh, so we can just click here and go to the, to the GitHub page. Uh, and if I go to source codes, what I will see is uh, these three files. So two of them are HTML files and the last one is Python file. So this first model HTML just contains the code for this uh, uh, progress bar or rather uh, uh, maybe it's not called progress bar but, uh, but other elements that actually uh, helped us to define the slider that helped us to define a uh, uh, the sample size. Uh, so we put here, I think, 11% sample. Uh, th then if I go back and open uh, another HTML file, this HTML file will define uh, defines graphical user interface. And actually this is the, the table widget that, that, that we were playing with. And, uh, and, uh, and in the Python code, Python code actually populates this widget with the data. And you see that, that overall there are uh, 74 lines of 
in, in this HTML file. Not, not a huge one, but still some HTML code present here. And the Python file, and here is the Python file. Uh, actually, it's uh, a bit more than 300 uh, uh, lines of code. And I can actually search uh, for this name. So I see that uh, some Python code just populates this, uh, this table. And the main problem with, with this approach is the following. So what we, what we want to achieve at the end is that it, it is easier for the Python developers to create supervised apps. And, and, uh, and though the HTML file is not huge, uh, it still might be a problem. And you will see that in, later, uh, in, in the latest uh, apps, uh, we, uh, we get rid of uh, HTML file completely. But okay. Uh, let me switch to another app here. So um, I just would like to show you several uh, statistical apps. So the next one would be a, a classes co-occurrence matrix. Uh, let me run this one. So what this app will do is it will show us how uh, classes of objects are interconnected. Um, I apply this to the entire uh, uh, Pascal work project. So let's open that. And we see the table like this. Uh, and it's like a square square matrix. On the rows we have classes uh, and on the columns we have also classes. And say if I pick a class here, say, uh, say a cat, uh, and sort this way. So I will see that uh, here th that I have like 250 uh, images that contain uh, cats. Uh, maybe I am interested in more like uh, unusual occurrences, for example, cats and dogs together. So I can see that there are like seven cases. And more, moreover, I can click here on this cell and see the, the list of images that satisfy these conditions. So if I open an image here, what I see is that there is cat and cat and dog together on one image as expected. Maybe I will just show you another one. So here we also see this funny picture where cat and dog are together. Uh, okay, so um, and we can proceed and take another class, say boat, boat, and and see that there is like this cow and boat uh, on the same image that might look strange. So we may identify in Pascal work these funny pictures. Uh, okay, let's quickly take a look at the source code of this app. Again, I will click here and go to the GitHub. Uh, we will see very similar picture here. So we, there was no model window, so it's like empty here. And there is HTML file uh, and with, with some widgets. And, and this Python file is responsible to, to fill these uh, widgets with the data. Uh, and again, uh, uh, now I will now I will show you uh, one of the latest app uh, that we have developed and you will see the difference uh, in the source codes. So let me go back uh, here and run uh, yet another statistical app which is called Interactive Object Distribution. Uh, let me run that. And let's open it. Uh, I will click Calculate Stats. It will take a bit of time to process all this data set. So let me explain what this app is doing. So it shows us the table like this. Uh, so on the rows of this ta table we see the classes. And on the columns we see uh, the number of objects in image. So for example, uh, what it say this first this first, this cell tells us that there are uh, 155 images that contains uh, exactly one airplane uh, and and we have like uh, 12 images that contains exactly two airplanes and we can click on this cell and and see this uh, 12 images and moreover we can put, click preview and in each of this image we should see exactly uh, two airplanes Let's check that. Uh, yeah, um, and also what this app allows us to do is to see kind of uh, the, the general picture. So first of all, we see two outliers. 
So for the class of for the class batch, all we see that there is an outlier image here, and we can click and see how this image looks like. So what we see here is quite a lot of battles on the background. Uh, we can inspect more outliers here, say for the class shape. Uh, click and uh, and see how the uh, uh, what, what what image uh, satisfies this condition. So yeah, we, we, we see quite a bunch of ships here. Um, and also, what we can say about Pascal Walk uh, looking at this table is that Pascal Walk is a relatively simple data set in a way that most of the images are accumulated here in the first columns, while there are just several images that contain a lot of objects of one class. So, in general, uh, generally, uh, Pascal Walk considered quite simple data set. But let's take a look at the source code here. So, if we, uh, if we go to the GitHub page, now and open source code, uh, you will not find HTML file here. So there are just two Python files and, uh, the one, one, and this starts by just implement some functions that are, uh, uh, that are called from this main py file. So, so here is, uh, so, so the benefit here is that uh, for the person who who develop an app, uh, this person don't have to be familiar with HTML at all. So, uh, so it, it, it should be uh, easier for Python developers to, to create supervisory apps with this uh, latest approach. And what I will do in the next section, I will actually show you how we can modify this app, how we can add certain action so that we don't only, we do not only see like cool statistics and gain some insight, but rather can play the data uh, uh, right inside this, this app. But I will show that in, in the next section. I would like to close this session, however, with yet another app. I would like you to show. I would like to show you how we can uh, uh, solve a slightly different task. Uh, suppose we have here is another version of Pascal Walk where we have annotations not with uh, not with rectangles, uh, not with masks, but rather with uh, rectangles. So let me just open one of the images here. So you see like rectangular annotations of objects here. Uh, and, and also I have, uh, I have another data set here. So this is like, uh, this is a data set with ground truth. So this is labeled by human. And this is a prediction from some version of YOLO model. And what we might be interested in uh, is to understand how well our model uh, is working. Uh, in kind of systematic way, not just to get one number of MIP or something uh, and trying to figure out what, what is it good or bad and what mistakes the model is making, but rather, uh, but, but rather understand how the model works in more visual, interactive and systematic way. And for that I will use yet another app from Ecosystem. So probably I will go to Ecosystem here uh, to Neural Networks, Images and Object Detection uh, section. And I will use this uh, object detection metrics app to illustrate how, how we can compare the model against ground truth uh, in visual fashion. So I will run this app. Then I will open it. And here I can uh, select the ground truth project and the project with the predictions. So let's select our ground truth project, which is called uh, uh, GT Pascal Walk, um, and I will pick the uh, project with the predictions, which which is called uh, Prediction uh, Pascal Walk. Um, let me select these projects. Let me click Match button uh, to make sure uh, that the images in these projects are actually matched. Um, and as a next step, I have to make sure that the classes also match. So. Uh, Okay, let me uh, say that I'm interested in all the classes and I will exclude uh, this two, uh, these three last classes here. And then as a last step, I will, say, I will say that, okay, I want to like analyze, say, half of my predictions and I can define some confidence levels and intersection over union thresholds here and click calculate metrics. Uh, it may take uh, 
about 20 seconds uh, to calculate the statistics and then we will see uh, the magic. So we'll see this confusion matrices. Um, it's, there is nothing special about confusion, confusion matrices, but the cool thing here is about is that this confusion ma matrix is interactive. So if my model is perfect, I will I will only see the diagonal elements, so there will be no of diagonal elements here. But so, so so the way we can interpret it is the following. So if the model predicts cat uh, uh, and actually the truth, if the actual value is the cat, but the model predicts the bird, and uh, we have so there is one. Uh, there is a value of one here. It means that there is one occasion when the, there was actually a cat, and the model predicted the bird. And like uh, we can see this uh, this uh, image, uh, and moreover we can inspect it. So uh, so uh, the, the ground truth is uh, uh, a cat, but the prediction is uh, that it's a bird. Uh, probably uh, what we see from this confusion matrix is. Maybe it's like more common to confuse uh, cats and dogs. So again, there are like uh, uh, 19 cases where uh, these two classes were confused when there was actually a cat and the model predicted the dog class. And those are these images. So I can click in, on any of those and see <laughs> when uh, when it uh, when it happened. Uh, let, let, let me click on some so the last one to illustrate. Um, yeah, so there is a cat and a dog in this image, and uh, and and model make some confusions here. Uh, okay, uh, last thing in the set, there are a lot of options that we can play with. But say what I would like to show uh, to show next is uh, is uh, per class uh, analysis. So I may say, okay, I'm I might be interested in certain class, say person, uh, and then. I can click preview, uh, and then I may start to answer very interesting questions. So here is a false positive column, and if I uh, sort by the values in this column, I will see the, I will see the images with where my models have found uh, the maximum number of false positives. So if I click here, I will see that I should I should see that uh, th th there should be a lot of false detections for person class. And that's uh, that's exactly what we see here. Or say alternatively, I can click on uh, on uh, alternative uh, image and and also see that it's it's the case here. So probably at this point I should I should stop. Uh, there are a lot of statistical apps, performance analysis apps that we have and that might be extremely useful. Uh, see you in the next section when we'll speak more about uh, uh, the apps from developer perspective. Now it's time to speak about app development. And we will take one of the analytical apps that I showcased earlier and add uh, action to that app so that we can not only inspect statistics in an interactive way, but we also can take some images of interest and move these images to some other project. So let's start. Before I jump to implementation details of the app, let me say that there is a developer portal available and it contains quite a lot of information uh, and more detailed explanation how to create your custom apps, how to set up environments, how to work with supervised SDK. So I highly recommend you to use it as a source of information when you work with supervised. Okay. My goal here is to illustrate how we can take an existing app and modify its functionality so the app is more useful. And I will illustrate that process uh, with this interactive object distribution app that we have already seen. So I run this on top of this uh, small uh, project with lemons and kiwi fruits. So let's run this app and let's run a very specific version of this app. So recall that apps in Supervised are just GitHub repositories. And I have uh, my special branch, uh, my special branch here called uh, YY modifications. And I will use this branch for demonstration purposes and also I will do all the modifications in, in this branch. 
So let me first run this app. Let's open it. We have already seen it. So, so we will analyze very small object, very small project with just six images. If I click calculate statistics, I will get these distributions. And for example, this cell tells me that there are two images where there is exactly three kiwi fruits. So if I click here, I will see these two images and I can preview each uh, image that satisfies this condition. So, so what I would like to do next is to add a button here that will allow me to take to take the images of interest and copy it to some other project so that I can further analyze these images. Uh, so, so let me probably close this tab for now and I will go back to projects and I will copy the identifier of this project because it will be useful uh, for me when I will show you how to debug and modify the app. Let's take a look at the source code of this app in Visual Studio Code. Uh, so here is my branch uh, and this app contains just two Python files. So this StatsPy just contains some functions that actually calculates, calculates statistics and we are not very interested in that file. Uh, we will consider a uh, main Py file first. Before I run, debug and modify this app, let me spend a minute just to explain the structure of the code here. So first we import some libraries and among these libraries we see supervisor library as well as certain widgets uh, from supervised library. Um, so then uh, we, will, uh, we will load some environmental variables uh, that will, for example, specify the following. So recall I copied the project, the ID identifier of the project. So I have to make sure that essentially I paste the same identifier here so that when I debug, I work with uh, that project, with this lemon project. So, so this two lines just load these environmental variables that also responsible for defining some connection settings and some other settings. You can read more about that in developer portal. And then I create this API object. Uh, and this API object will allow, uh, will allow this code to communicate with supervisor. Uh, then we will just uh, get the projects from the server and, and then there will be uh, some code to to create widgets. So, for example, this 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 line of code create a button with the caption of calculate stats. So, uh, and let, let let me outline the code that is responsible for this widget. So, so this code create just widgets, and then we use containers to define some layouts so that components looks in kind of visual appealing way for the end user. And then, the, and then we also have to uh, handle some events. So we want, when we click uh, on the button, something happens. So, so for example, here we have a button and, and, and here we have uh, the event uh, uh, handling procedure. Uh, and also we may, uh, we may click on some other components, like for example, this chart components with statistics, and we also have to handle that. Uh, handle that, that clicks. So let me do the following here. I will just probably put some breakpoints here uh, on the events so that you can see how, uh, how the app uh, is actually working. Uh, and I will just run that app. Okay, I just need to click here to open this app locally and I can click calculate stats and then uh, this code is responsible to process this event when I click uh, uh, when I click this button so it just it, it just calculates statistics first and then uh, and, and then uh, 
uh, and then put the statistics into this uh, in, into this widget called chart. Uh, okay, probably I should put the breakpoint here and just run. So so you see like here in the in this variable lines with, we have the statistics calculated and we put this content into this visual component. And if I run that, you see that this table, uh, this, this chart, this chart component is populated with the numbers. And then if I click, say, on this cell, or in this cell, uh, another event will be triggered. So uh, let's click, and, and here we, we should handle uh, this event and show the list of images that match the condition in the cell. So let me just probably run that. So you see now we have these two images that correspond to the condition. Uh, and then if I click preview, uh, I will also drop into this uh, uh, event handling procedure that just uh, shows, that, that just will show uh, a labeled image that I selected. So let, let me run that. Uh, and here you see the image that I selected is shown. If I click again, I will, uh, I will get here again and probably let me run it again. So here is another image. So the next thing that I would like to do is to add a button here. And I would like, uh, I would like to do it in a way that Whenever I click on the button, the selected image that I see right now is copied to some other project. So let's do that. Uh, so probably I will close this tab and go back to the Visual Studio Code and stop. Okay, let's add the button. Um, I will do it actually in step-by-step -step fashion. So probably the easiest way for me is just to take the button that is already created and just and just create based on that a new button i will call it differently so i will call it say a copy button and i will specify the text for the for this button say a copy image and maybe i don't need an icon an icon here so i will I will leave it like this. Uh, okay, and I will also put this button into the container so that here is a vertical container here and I will just append this button here as a last element in this, in this list. So let me, let me save this code and run this again to see what we have achieved. Uh, again, I can just click here and open this app locally. And you see, here is a button, uh, copy image. And the app will, okay, probably I have to just uh, just kill all these uh, breakpoints. Um, so let's go back. Uh, so this app will will function as, as usual, with the exception that uh, there is, uh, there will be always a button here. And the next thing that I would like to do here, probably I don't want to see this button all the time. So maybe I would like to see this button only when I have some image uh, selected and I can essentially see the image. So let's modify this code so that the button is shown uh, whenever, on, only in the case when we, when, we, when we can actually click on this button. Okay, let's close this tab again and go, go back to the visual code and stop. Okay, so here is this button and probably and, and probably I should just hide it uh, straight away. So, uh, and I just want this button to be shown only when uh, I click uh, on a specific, uh, on a preview on a preview for a specific image. So only in this case, I want to show this button. Uh, and when I click, uh, and when I click on the 
table uh, with statistics and no image is selected, probably I should uh, hide, hide this button. Um, okay, let's save that and run the app again to see what we have achieved. I'll just run that. Okay, let's see. We don't see this, uh, this added button. That's good. We click calculate statistics. No button. So we pick certain cell. No button. And we click preview. So we see the image uh, and the button. Uh, and if we click on the table again here, the button will be hide. And now the button is shown again. The next thing that I would like to do is to make this button useful. So I would actually like to take this image and copy that to some other project so that I can further, so that I can later inspect those images. So, okay, let's probably close it. Go to Visual Studio Code here. Stop this app. And I will just I will just paste here paste here the code. I don't need comment here. Let me actually uh, put uh, a breakpoint a, a breakpoint here and and later explain uh, what's going on. So I will just run the app again. Very similar procedure. Let me open it locally. Click Calculate Statistics. Say maybe you would like to select the image with six kiwi fruits. Click Preview button. Here is our Copy Image button. Let's click on that. And here is what's going on here. So first we 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 check whether the project exists. And in our, in, in our case, the project do not exist yet. And we create, the, create a new project and append, uh, and we use the, the, uh, the, the name of the source project and append this uh, string manually, sampled string to the end of this line. So, so uh, the name of, of the new project will be, uh, will be uh, lemons manually sampled in this case. Then uh, this new project should contain uh, the same meta information as the original one, and we also create a new data set called, say, data set one. Uh, and then we, we have to check that uh, the image that we copy is not, uh, is not there, is not in, in this data set. Uh, and if it's not in the data set, then we can uh, make a copy of this image. And, and we will we can put some message uh, in the log uh, so that image has been successfully copied or something like that. Okay, so let's run that and go back to our app. And if now I uh, go uh, here uh, and uh, refresh the page, what I will see is this, uh, is this new project created uh, is that new project created and this project contains uh, this, uh, this image that we have just added. And let's play with that a bit and probably I could click, say, uh, here. So I have here four kiwi fruits and I can click on this button again. Uh, the same code uh, uh, will be executed, probably I just run that. Uh, and if I go to, uh, uh, to this uh, workspace and open this updated project again, I will see that now we have these two images. What I would like to do next is to save the changes and uh, use this app, use this modified version of the app uh, straight, uh, from, uh, st straight from here, straight from the web browser. So, okay, let's just close that. Go back to Visual Studio Code, stop the app, and just go and uh, commit the changes. So 
let me call it like final version and just click commit sync changes and now i can run this modified version of the app right from the web browser and i'm gonna show you that process next okay let's use the modified version of our app to analyze pascal work and uh, what i just need to do is to uh, run this app but this time as uh, i will just go to branches and and just pick uh, uh, the branch uh, yy modifications and i should and expect to have uh, the button uh, that we have added uh, there so let me run that one So I will open an app. Uh, let us calculate statistics. We have around 3000 images here. So it will take several seconds to complete. Okay, and we get and we have got this large table. And and maybe we would like again to work with outliers. So I'll click here. I'll see the list of images and I hope when I click preview button to see to see this this button that we have added and maybe so we see a lot of buttons here on the background so maybe I'll save this image and maybe I'll also save some other images that has a lot of objects so for example this one again let's click preview so a lot of ships here again let's copy this image and probably i will copy some last one maybe the image that has uh, a lot of persons in this case like 15 persons again preview so there are a lot of persons on the background and let's just copy this image as well so we have copied three images and let's see uh, what uh, the, res the result of our action. So if I go back to tasks and back to projects, I see this new project that was created a minute ago. And here in this project, we will see the images that we have picked. So what we have achieved here is that we converted this purely analytical app to the app that actually allows us to uh, take certain actions namely to move the images around. Let me add one final note here. So the way I, uh, I modified the app is not the only way. And for example, I could go to ecosystem and, and play with private apps here. Um, and again, I would like, I would, I highly recommend you to visit uh, uh, developer portal and uh, obtain and learn more information about app development and and different options how you can create them. Colleagues, we have covered a number of topics in this live demo. And at this final section, I would like to show more capacities of uh, Python SDK and I will use Jupyter Notebook app for this purpose. So let's start. Supervised Python SDK is a very large topic and it, it is a foundation for all the apps that we have in ecosystem. And probably a good approach to demonstrate the capacities of Supervised SDK is just to pick some task and solve it together. And let's, let's solve the following task. Let's import images along with annotations in some custom format. And the way in general how we could solve that is to just take these annotations in custom format and transform those annotations into some other popular format and use one of the apps from Supervisor Ecosystem to do the input job. But we may follow a bit different path here. So we could, for example, uh, use uh, Supervisor SDK and Python in general to work directly with this custom annotation format and to import uh, the data directly into Supervised Lab. And that's what I will show you how to do next. 
So let me first start with opening this uh, team files page. Um, it's quite an important page and concept in, in general. So, uh, so in supervised lab, apps might generate certain artifacts, certain files. For example, neural networks. Uh, for example, apps, apps that allows us to train neural networks will generate checkpoints, the models. Some other apps might generate reports or something like that. And it's important to store to store this data somewhere. And for that, uh, for that case, we have like uh, files and directories uh, available so that you can apps can store data in supervisor, users can store data in supervisor, and and it will be helpful here as well. So, for example, uh, let me do uh, let me do the following operation here. So let me just create a folder called say uh, import demo. Uh, and uh, what I will do next, I will just put here the files and annotations that, that I would like to import. So uh, here is my files. Here what I have is a, a, a Python notebook file and actually the data that I would like to import. So let me actually select this thing and drag this to team files like this. So what we have, so let's see what, what we have achieved here. So we have this import demo folder here. We have this uh, Jupyter notebook. Uh, I can actually open that and see the code. We will work with that later. Um, and then we have this folder with the data. And probably we don't need this file, so I can hopefully remove that. Okay, so let me explain what we have here. We have here like raw images. And, and folders. Uh, each of these folder contains uh, annotations, uh, essentially masks for each image. So let me uh, just uh, walk you through that. So we have just images of dogs and cats. Sometimes we might have multiple objects on, uh, on these images. So just seven images like this. And Say, uh, okay, let's take a look at, say, this image. Here we have two dogs and one cat. And for this image, so, so the, the name is this one, uh, ends with 5.3, uh, there will be a folder that will contain uh, the masks for these objects. So here is the folder. And we see that there is two files and, and the name starts with the dog and one for one file, the name starts with a cat. And again, if we just open that files here, what we'll see, this is the mask for the dog. And this should be the mask for the one of the cats. And this should be the mask for the other cat. Uh, okay. So we have images, we have folders that contains uh, just masks. And it's important to say that for, for each file, we might have uh, a variable uh, number of masks here. Uh, okay, so uh, what I could do, I could just go here uh, and on top of that, uh, run an app called uh, Jupyter Data Science Notebook app. And here I may pick the machine that I would like to use uh, uh, to use to run this app on. So let me just use main node and run the app. So the app is started. Let's let me open this Jupyter notebook that we uh, that we copied to team files. Uh, okay, so probably one other thing will be useful for me here is to open my uh, current workspace. Uh, Okay, um, let me just probably start running this Jupyter notebook and give some comments along the way. So let's just run this first cell, it's just important uh, libraries and we just import supervisor libraries among, among with some other libraries. And then we create uh, some uh, API object and after that we obtain the ID of the current workspace and just print the name of the workspace. So the current workspace is principal three platform. And if I go here, I will see that it's 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 the case. Uh, okay. So next thing that we can do, 
so if we want to import the data we need to create a project and let's see so let's just run the cell and it says that project created and it gives us the identifier of the project that was created so let's just go here and refresh the page so here is a dog and cat project and it's like empty project no data sets here no classes uh, uh, okay so uh, let me probably just uh, just go back here and the, the project name is uh, cats and dogs uh, and let's see so when we uh, run this so we what we used we used the identifier of the workspace that we obtained here at the previous cell and we also here specified the name of the project uh, okay let's create a data set because we need a project and a data set so let me run this cell and if i go back here open this project what i will see is this uh, new data set called data set one that match uh, uh, that match this name um, and this and when we, we create data set again we use SDK functions from SDK, which takes as input the project ID, which we obtained here at the previous uh, previous stage, uh, and uh, and the dataset name. Uh, okay, and we see that, for example, there is no classes yet here. Uh, let's 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 move on and run and create classes. So we know that uh, that we have two classes. One is cat, well, one class is called cat. The other class called dog and what we do we just create a uh, object class uh, uh, with uh, the name of cat uh, we define the shape in this case it's a mask it's a bitmap and we define a color so it's like, should be a red and, th and the same we do for the dog uh, and then uh, and these two classes is is actually represent uh, meta information so we create a meta information uh, for the project and we provide these two classes, two objects that we have created, cat and dog, and then we update uh, the project meta information so that uh, so that the project is associated with this meta information. Okay, let me run that and just go here to classes. So now we see that okay, we have cat class of shape bitmap and dog class of shape bitmap. So that's good. Let's go. Let's 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 move move on. Now we have to import the data. And what I do here is specify the name of uh, the uh, directory. So if I open again these files, uh, this is so, so I have a folder data. And in this folder, I have these images that I would like to import. Uh, and, uh, and then, uh, uh, given this directory, what I do here in, in the cell is to obtain the passes to these files to the images, uh, extract the names, and then run uh, uh, running uh, functions from SDK called uh, upload passes that takes the identifier of the data set that we have just created uh, and also the passes to the images as well as the names of the images. So if I just run that, uh, what, what I should expect to see is that in the data set we will see these seven images. Let's just open them. So we see these images are imported, but we, but we have not imported uh, annotations yet. So let's do that. Essentially, that's the last cell in this notebook. So here is, here is how we're going to do that. So when we import images here, uh, this function uh, returns to us uh, the information uh, regarding each image reported. So we will iterate over each image that we have imported and then we have to extract the directory name and the directory path where annotations are stored. So recall that, say for each image here, we have a directory with where the masks are stored. So here we just extract uh, for specific image uh, the path where masks are kept. And then uh, and then we do the following. So for each, uh, uh, for uh, so we first import uh, files with masks with cats, and we obtain all the all the passes that contains uh, cats. So 
so no cache here but say if we pick say some other uh, direct directory here there will be uh, these uh, files and and here we will just uh, extract the passes to them and then we will read uh, we will uh, we will essentially read these labels and to do that we will just read uh, each uh, uh, each file and then create a geometry out of that so and that will just gives us list of uh, labels and the same we will do for dogs and then we will co co concatenate these uh, labels together uh, and based on that we will create uh, an annotation for an image which will contain uh, uh, information about image uh, height image width along as the labels that we have obtained uh, previously and then uh, finally we upload uh, we upload, we attach this annotation actually to the to the image. So if I run that, uh, what I should expect is that uh, is that uh, is that our uh, uh, images becomes uh, annotated. So you see now we have masks for dog. So here is two dogs, one cat, and here is uh, the result that we have achieved. So probably I should stop here and make some uh, general final remarks. Colleagues, it was quite a long demo and I would like to make some final remarks. So essentially I had two goals, two main goals. And the first goal was to show uh, apps from various categories and to show that they might be useful for your tasks. And also I would like to I wanted to outline the diversity of apps in supervised ecosystem. And my second goal was uh, to illustrate the app development process and to showcase that it is not as hard as it might seem. So in this live demo we took an existing app and modified functionality so this app is potentially more useful for our tasks. Finally, uh, in this final section I demonstrated a uh, Jupyter Notebook app and it's important example because it illustrates a use case where a software is integrated in supervisor without modification from uh, without any modification from a supervisor team. So you can expect more apps like that in the future in supervised like a system. So thank you for watching and I will see you in the next video. Colleagues, let's speak about principle 4, which is neural networks. Uh, neural networks in supervised is about putting together all fragmented state-of-the-art deep learning technologies or GitHub repositories so that the end users have an easy way to use them via graphical user interface in the day-to-day -day work. So neural networks is related to the following column in the task matrix. And let's illustrate it with the following example. Uh, let's consider a part of GitHub where all state-of-the-art computer vision related uh, repositories are kept. That's on the one hand. On, on the other hand, we have a user with one or more machines with GPU. And then the user might conduct the following thought experiment. Wouldn't it be cool if... and Say, if I could run every GitHub repository instantly via web browser. Essentially, it's equivalent to the situation in which each GitHub repository has a run button. And maybe it would be also cool if each GitHub repository has intuitive graphical user interface, which is shown here. And it might be also cool if repository, each repository here is automatically compatible with uh, the data format that users might have. And finally, it would be cool if the user's GPU resources might be utilized whenever necessary for training and inference purposes. But the main point is the following. So, is the following. Essentially, it's what Supervisor is doing. Uh, maybe not for all the repositories, not yet at least, but for most popular ones for sure. So, let's go back here and illustrate uh, another layer here, which is uh, supervised apps. And supervised apps, you can think of them just 
as a forks from popular GitHub repositories, and in many cases, there are forks. So there might be other supervised component. And the main thing, the main idea here is that uh, a user might become connected to this universe of GitHub repositories through this proxy layer of supervised apps if he just install uh, app engine, uh, um, app engine on or agent on his or her machine. And then once the user becomes connected, he can just click or run uh, an app and, and have a convenient way to interact to use this app via graphical user interface. So let's speak about this uh, agent uh, or app engine in more detail here. So uh, installation of supervisor agent um, uh, on uh, your machine is a critical step, uh, which actually makes it possible for you to stay inside web browser uh, and at the same time uh, your GPU resources, your GPU machine will be utilized as a backend for GPU related computations. So it might sound complicated, but actually from the labeling, from the interface perspective, you just click add button in the cluster page and you see this page where you copy the command, paste it into the terminal, and now your machine is in the running status uh, available. And then you can run apps and specify the machine you would like to use for GPU-related computations. Okay, let's move next to the images, to the neural networks in supervisor in the context of images. Uh, so when it comes to images, there are popular tasks like classification, detection, semantic segmentation, instant segmentation, and so on. And there are long tail tasks like OCR depth estimation and others and other tasks as well. And when it comes to, to the most popular tasks, there are really good repositories uh, like say uh, uh, YOLO V5, Detectron, MM segmentation, MM detection, and so on. And there are also good repositories for long tail tasks. But, but all of these repositories has two common problems. Those are fragmentation and usability bias. And let me address these problems one by one and explain where exactly the difficulties are. So if we talk about, let's talk about fragmentation first. And let's, and let's take as an example, very, very good repository MM segmentation from OpenMM Lab. The main problem is that uh, the repository as it has no connection or weak connection to ecosystem of other CV tools. Like it's hard for repository to support all the data formats or, uh, or be connected with uh, labeling interfaces and so on. Uh, those, this is the first problem. Uh, the second problem is usability bias. And we can illustrate it in the following way. So we can take users with different skills and we can consider three different tasks. Like the first task here is very simple. Just take some pre-trained model and apply it on my data. Or say another task, a bit more challenging, to take, uh, to, to train model from the repository on my data. Or the third task is probably the most challenging, challenging when uh, the task is to make, to transform the repository in a way that other people in, within your company has uh, an easier experience uh, in using this repository. And, and, it, and depending on the skill level of the user, these three tasks may be longer or sooner to accomplish. So, uh, and, and those are just estimates here. Uh, th but the main point here is that the estimates varies from months to minutes, but time estimates should be really different. So for all categories of users, ideally it, it should take seconds, seconds actually, to, to solve all of the tasks outlined here. And let's also say that for less common modalities, uh, or say uh, uh, like videos, slides, or DICOM, uh, or long tail tasks or other types of model, these times estimates will be even, even worse. Uh, so we have two problems. We have two problems, fragmentation and usability bias. And again, uh, fragmentation is when a repository is isolated from other tools and usability bias when only high skilled uh, specialists can leverage a repository. And we also have a process that we explained earlier when we take popular GitHub repositories and convert them into supervised apps. 
And essentially we do two things here. The first thing is we integrate. We integrate a repository into supervised like a system. And this integration solves a fragmentation problem. And the second thing that we do, we add graphic, graphical user interface uh, that addresses usability bias problem. So let's, let's speak briefly about other modalities, video, sliders, and dicoms. And the point here is that, uh, that video, slider, and dicom uh, are more complex data structure, structure, structures compared to images. And it's even hard in this case to train models, visualize predictions, uh, run experiments, and do other manipulations with the models. Uh, and as a consequence of that, uh, the problem of fragmentation and usability bias are even more severe. Uh, so, but the point is that solutions are the same. So if we integrate and add graphic user interface, we will, we will overcome this fragmentation and usability bias problems. The way we solve them. Uh, now let's see how working with neural networks in Supervisor looks from a user perspective. And for that, I will need to introduce uh, the following framework. And you are familiar with this framework from the introduction. So there is, uh, there is uh, supervised the core components here, uh, app engine uh, or agent, uh, and apps on top. As, and as a reminder, apps are just special types of GitHub repositories. I will cluster the apps in a bit different way right now. So there are training apps, there are serving apps, and probably by the name of the app, you may see that, uh, that for each uh, repository, popular uh, GitHub repository, say MM segmentation, we have training app and corresponding uh, serving app. Uh, also, we will have, uh, we have various inference apps. Uh, and the idea here is that, say, I may deploy uh, a model, I may serve an app to deploy a model, and then this model will be might be used in various inference apps. We will see that later. We will see the examples of, of this principle later. And finally, there are some other complementary apps that might be useful in the workflow when we do training or inference procedures. So let's move to the concrete examples. And roughly there are two categories of examples. The first category is is when we take some pre-trained model and do some operations with that. Usually we use this model for pre-labeling purposes. And the second category is when we actually perform model training. So let's start with, uh, with inference. And the first example here will be uh, to automatically generate masks for the purpose of pre-labeling. So here is our framework here. And actually we will just need two apps to accomplish our task here. So let's first take a look at the images. We have the images like those. And then we will use Servant app to deploy the model. So, so uh, MM detection uh, framework uh, allows to work with instant segmentation models and object detection model. We will use instant segmentation model in this example. We can pick architecture and the model uh, and, and the concrete model, the concrete checkpoint, and actually just click Serve button. And after that, the model, the selected model is deployed, and then we can run another app uh, from uh, uh, inference uh, apps category to actually communicate with this model and take predictions. So I will connect to the deployed model first. I will pick the classes, uh, define some inference parameters. I may see here the preview of uh, the predictions, actually, the preview of predictions. And I will specify the target project and click apply model to input uh, data button. Once I do that, I will get my images pre-labeled. The next example is very similar, but for videos. So the task here is to automatically track objects with rectangles for the purpose of pre-labeling. And again, let's start with the data. So, and, and, and for this for this case, we will need also two apps. And you will see that the pattern the pattern is very similar. So uh, uh, the idea here is to simplify the process as, as much as possible. So let's uh, run uh, video. Uh, let's let, let's see how our video looks like. And we want this, this video to be uh, labeled in an uh, automatic way. So in labeling interface, the video looks like this. 
Uh, and to initiate this prelabeling procedure again, everything is the same. We're just running servant app. Uh, this time we will pick object detection uh, task, uh, architecture, the checkpoint, the model, and click serve button. Uh, after that, the model is that our detection model is deployed, and 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 we can run a bit different inference interface. This time it will be apply neural network to video project. And again, everything is the same here. We connect to the model first. We pick the classes. Uh, we can see the preview how the model works and play with say confidence level if we want. Then we apply settings and apply neural network this this deployed model to video project. And after we do that, if we open uh, the project in video labeling interface, we will see this kind of results. And it's important to say that uh, that this previous uh, this previous app actually solves two tasks. It solves detection task and also checking task. And you see here that the identities of the cars are actually preserved. We can we can take one more step here and 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 run uh, another app that will allow us to take the ID of the video and actually render this uh, this prediction so that uh, we can clearly see uh, the mo how the model works. It's it's useful for demonstration purposes and for understanding how good the model is. So we run this app put the identifier of the video and as a result we will get this kind of video after generated. Let's play it. So what we see here is that model works uh, in a pretty good way. Uh, let's move forward with uh, to the LiDAR data. And the idea here is pretty similar and the task is pretty similar. So we want autom to automatically check uh, objects with cuboids for the purpose of prelabeling. And the pattern of usage of Supervisly will be also similar. So we'll just need two apps, one servant app and one app from uh, inference interface uh, category. Uh, and our data looks like this. So this is just Kitty, Kitty data set. Uh, and first we run servant app to deploy the model. Again, the same procedure, pick the architecture, pick the model and click serve button. And, and, and the model, after that step, the model is deployed. And now we run uh, inference app uh, called applying end to point cloud, connect to the model selected, uh, pick the classes of interest, uh, put some parameters like confidence levels and so on. And finally, just pick whether we want to solve detection task or detection tasks and taken simultaneously. And click apply model to input data button. And as a result, we get our point cloud pre-labeled in this kind of way. Let's move on to the next set of examples. And, uh, uh, and the next set of examples will, be, will correspond to the task, will, will demonstrate how we can use interactive segmentation uh, smart tool for various tasks. And, and first we will just deploy the model and then we'll start addressing the tasks one by one. And for the, this entire demo, we will just need two apps, one servant app and the other is uh, and, and one inference interface. So uh, we will use the servant app to deploy a pre-trained model. Uh, and once we do that, uh, once we run this app and pick the model, the, the model is deployed. And then we will move on to the first task, which is uh, labeling cows and other uh, objects uh, uh, with masks in an efficient and interactive way. And so we have the model deployed already in this case. And what we can do, we can run a labeling, in, uh, labeling interface here and use this smart tool to effectively uh, uh, build masks uh, for these objects. Uh, and we can see this kind of results. And this will work for a lot of objects out of the box, uh, as you can see here. And we might have another task. For example, we might have task when we have, say, boxes and we want to convert these boxes into masks on images. So, yeah, here is just the description of the task to convert boxes to masks. So our data looks like this. Uh, we have these citruses uh, labeled with uh, rectangles uh, and then we run uh, an app called uh, called batch smart tool this is just another interface on top of the deployed model this nicely illustrates the idea when we have one deployed model and multiple interfaces on top 
So we connect to the model, then we just click so that this green point appears and this green point is replicated across all the instances of objects and we click update masks and get all the masks uh, calculated for us. And then if we go back to image labeling interface, we will see that actually all the masks are constructed like this. So our last example to illustrate interactive segmentation or smart tool is related to videos. And the task here is to label living creatures and common objects with masks on videos in an efficient way. Again, I keep illustrating here the same concept. The model is already deployed and what, what is different is just interface on top. And in this case, we will use video labeling as an interface. So we run that and, and we will put several uh, green points so that the model get the, the object of interest right. And then we will just press right arrow on the keyboard and, 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 uh, and we go to the next frame once we press uh, right arrow and you see that when we do so, we may quite efficiently label the objects of interest. Now let's move on to the next section when we actually have to train models. And, and I will use also uh, interactive segmentation example and illustrate the case where the model doesn't work out of the box for some reason and what we can do about that. So the task is to train an uh, interactive segmentation model to label cracks with masks. And for this example, we will just need uh, two apps, one training app and one uh, serving app. So if we just serve uh, and uh, run serving app and deploy standard, standard model uh, and uh, take a look how it works uh, in, uh, to label cracks efficiently, we will see that uh, we can put a lot of green dots here and the cracks are still not segmented. And that indicates us that this out-of-the-box model will not work efficiently for this kind of task. And what we need, we need to train, to train these models. And we have the training data like this. Uh, and uh, what we need is just to run uh, a training app. So we have training data, we run training app, uh, we pick uh, the object that we want to use to train the model. In this case, the objects are cracks. Uh, we split uh, uh, we split our data in the training and validation subsets. There are multiple multiple ways to do that. Uh, we may pick different augmentation scenarios and visualize them, as well as the backbone for the model, and and also some parameters uh, that uh, controls the training process. And finally, we get this kind of dynamics. And when the training is over, what we can do, we can go to team files and find the artifact that this training app produced. And then we just copy the path to the, to the model and, and, and then run serving app. But this time we will not use pre-trained model, but rather we go to custom section here and, and paste the path to the model. And once we do that, we can run again a uh, labeling interface, uh, connect to the model to the, to the model that we have just trained and it will work in this kind of way. This is way more efficient and, uh, and, and the results look like this. So this example illustrates how we can take out of the box model and train it to work good with the data that we have. My last example here is about object detection with synthetic data. So we will build object detection model uh, to recognize different types of seeds and we will use synthetic data for this purpose. Let me show you how we will accomplish that. So this is the task description, but I already mentioned that. Okay, so for that we will also need uh, just several apps. We will need training app, we will need serving app and we will need some uh, inference, uh, inference app, inference interface. And we will, and we will need uh, app that helps us to generate synthetic data. So here is our problem definition. Uh, those are images that we would like to be able to efficiently process and detect with rectangles all the seeds. And seeds might be of different types. Those are sunflower seeds, but we might have uh, pumpkin unpeeled peeled seeds, unpeeled seeds, and some mixture of seeds here. Uh, and unfortunately, unfortunately, we just have 
uh, we just have very limited training set. So we just have one relevant image and this image is only partially labeled. Uh, we also have two irrelevant image images and those are partially labeled and, and, and why I am showing you these images will be clear in a second. So we have production images, we have training data which is extremely limited and we, all, we also do have some, some backgrounds. Doesn't have to, those are unlabeled images. It do, they doesn't have to be tables here, nature will just do as well. So we have some setting here and what we can do, we can run an app from a synthetic data category that will allow us to do the following. So we pick the foreground objects. This, this contains the three images, this partially, three partially labeled images, and we pick the backgrounds. Then we pick the classes, and you see here that the number of objects are actually quite limited that we have labeled. We, we pick data generation scenarios here and pick the task, the target task that we would like to solve. And in this app we can actually press preview button and it will generate what kind of synthetic data we might, we, we might get. And once we are satisfied with what, what we see, we can just specify the number of target images, the number of target synthetic labeled images that we would like to generate and click generate button. Once we do that, if we open these images in labeling interface, we will see this kind of, uh, this kind of results. And the images looks like this, so it's kind of a mess. But the point here is that we make the task uh, specifically quite hard, so that it's hard for the model in the training time, in the hope that uh, since it's, it was hard in the training, it will be easier when we actually will start using model on real data. And the next step here is just to run a training app uh, and pick, uh, pick the classes of interest, uh, split the data, uh, pick the model backbone uh, or some other parameters. We might play with advanced parameters here and just click start training button after that. And this is a dynamic training dynamics that was produced by this app. So the next, and as a result, this app generates artifacts. So if you go to team files next and, uh, and see what the, what, what the app produced, go to weights uh, folder here and just do the same operation, just copy uh, the path to the checkpoint and then run serving app uh, and go to custom section here, paste checkpoint and click run to deploy the model. So now our custom detection model is deployed. And then uh, we, we run another app from inference uh, category uh, to, uh, to take predictions from, from our custom trained model. So we connect to the model first, to the model that we have deployed. We pick the classes of interest. Uh, we specify some, uh, some settings, some inference settings here. We can see the preview and on the preview we can already see that the results are quite good here. And we specify the target project, the name for the target project and click apply model to input data button. And after that, if we open the results in labeling interface, we will see something like that. So we will see for that for each type of seeds, the, result, the results are actually very, very good. And that example uh, nicely illustrates how we can, how we can use, how we can use supervisor to go actually all the wave. Uh, to go from the case where, where, when we have almost no data uh, to, to, to the situation when we have not only labeled data, uh, but also we have quite a good model. Okay, let me close this with the summary. Let, let me close this section with the summary. So what we have seen, we have seen that there are two problems with open source computer vision tools, namely fragmentation and usability bias. We also show, I also showed you how Supervisely overcomes those problems. Uh, and we do that by integration procedure and by adding graphic user interface on top of popular repositories. And I also have demonstrate, demonstrated you a number of practical use cases where neural networks uh, have been used uh, efficiently. So see you, thank you for watching and see you in the next section. Colleagues, we are at principle 4, neural networks, and it's time for the live demo. And in this live demo, I will do first a brief overview of neural networks and supervisor, and then I will consider several use cases. 
actually two use cases. The first use case will be related to a training process of smart tool for interactive crack segmentation. And the second use case uh, will be to uh, illustrate how we can train detection models. And the example that we will consider is to is the detection of different seed, seed types of plants. And in this second use case, we will rely a lot on uh, artificially generated data. So let's start with an overview. To give an overview of how neural, network, neural networks works in Supervisor, I will need two projects. Uh, one image project and the other is video project. But let's, let's move step by step. So uh, first, uh, let's take a look at how a web browser and uh, GPU resources necessary to train models are interconnected. So we want to stay inside web browser and still be able to use uh, GPU cards, machines with GPU to train or to run inference of deep learning models. And if, you, if we go to supervisor cluster, uh, team cluster page, uh, we will see that uh, we have some machines connected uh, to, to my account here. So for example, here is one machine that is connected. So we can see NVIDIA SMI for this machine and there is probably uh, another machine that might be connected also. So uh, let me find the one. So for example, this RTX machine is also connected to Supervisor. And whenever I want to initiate some say training procedure or inference procedure that, uh, that, uh, that is required uh, for which uh, GPU resources are needed, uh, I can pick which machine to use for that purpose. And moreover, uh, uh, we can add as many machines as we need it. So uh, if I click add button here, uh, I will see a command that I can execute on any machine with GPU that has Docker and NVIDIA Docker installed. And as a result of running this command on a machine uh, with GPU, uh, Python agent, open source Python agent will be installed on that machine and, uh, and after that the machine will be available in running status, like these two machines, for example. So let's move on. Uh, essentially, when we work with neural networks in Supervisor, uh, we work with apps. So there are uh, different uh, categories of apps in Supervisor and some category of apps is related to, to neural networks, which uh, and, and, and these apps usually allows, allows us to deploy models or to train models. Uh, so uh, those apps are nicely summarized in neural network uh, page here. So for example, uh, for various modalities that we support, say images, videos, uh, uh, point clouds, DICOM, uh, we may define a set of tasks which we can address uh, with supervisor. So for example, for object detection, we have, uh, we have uh, apps that allows us to train uh, uh, models, detection models uh, based on YOLO v5 repository and MM detection repository. And also the models and also the app that allows us to deploy models from these uh, repositories. So well, probably the first thing to note here is that uh, for each, uh, we have a pair here. So for example, we have an app Surf YOLO v5, which allows us to deploy models uh, from this repository and also train YOLO v5, the, the app that allows us to train the models. The same for MM detection. And if we just uh, keep going and considering different tasks that you can solve with Supervisor, you will see, say, if we take semantic segmentation, there will be also a pair of apps uh, MM segmentation and uh, Surf MM segmentation and train MM segmentation. Uh, we support uh, instant segmentation as well, uh, classification, uh, interactive segmentation, uh, metric learning a bit. Uh, for videos, we might have another set of tasks, for example, uh, detection and tracking. And the nice thing about that is that uh, models that work for images might be also uh, utilized to, to process videos. So there is also segmentation and tracking uh, uh, apps here. Uh, so you can, uh, you can play with that and see uh, the full list of models that we support. 
But I think that the overview will be not as complete uh, if I just don't run several apps and uh, and show you how how it works in, in, in real time. And in this overview, I will just focus on inference procedure. So, so suppose that, that we already have some models and, and those apps and, and corresponding repositories uh, provide a number of pre-trained models that we can uh, leverage uh, straight away. And briefly, uh, we can further decompose the models, the neural networks that we support into like two categories. Uh, the, the first category is more like standard models, say detection models, semantic segmentation models, system segmentation model, models. And the other category is interactive models, for example, interactive segmentation, uh, when the model, the models, the model architectures are designed in a way so that the models can interact uh, with the user to speed up labeling process. So let me actually run uh, uh, run uh, first uh, 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 object detection model. Here, so I will I will use uh, MM detection uh, 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 MM detection app here, uh, server app. So, for example, if I uh, run this app, I might specify which machine I would like to to use uh, uh, to run this app. So I will I will pick this machine and just uh, uh, run this app. So once the app is started, uh, I can pick the uh, the task. So this uh, MM detection framework supports uh, two types of tasks, object detection and instant segmentation. Let me uh, pick object detection here. Uh, and then uh, I can see uh, pre-trained models available. So, uh, this, so MM detection is very powerful repository and it contains uh, quite a number of pre-trained models that we can actually run and also which we can train. So for example, uh, in we, we can pick uh, different architectures and see uh, corresponding uh, checkpoints for those architectures with some information. Uh, uh, so let me actually pick, say, the first one, uh, the first architecture here, and I will just uh, pick the model with the highest accuracy on on, on Cocoa dataset. This one, uh, maybe it's not the fastest model, but uh, it should be accurate. And then I will deploy this model. So for that, I need just to click Serve button. So now the model is uh, is deployed on the uh, machine that I uh, picked uh, beforehand before I run this app. So uh, let's actually proceed and uh, and deploy several more models. But this time I will I will deploy uh, interactive models uh, that that interact with the user. So and. Uh, just again, I, I use this just for illustration purposes. And uh, uh, one model that I will use is uh, is a ITM model for interactive segmentation. So I can also pick a model here and pick the machine which I would like to use to deploy this model. So let me pick again this machine. I'll run this app. And finally, I will deploy uh, yet another model, uh, yet another interactive model uh, that actually allows me uh, to track to track objects uh, on video. So let me actually deploy this one as well. And I will also use the same machine. So I I have deployed three models on the same machine here. So let, let, let me deploy the model. Uh, now I have uh, all the models uh, deployed. Uh, let me go to um, uh, let me go to uh, uh, probably uh, app session page and click on running uh, tab here uh, just to illustrate that uh, I have uh, one uh, model deployed for from MM detection app uh, and uh, uh, um, and uh, model for interactive segmentation as well as taken model. I will first work with the detection model. So if I go to my current workspace and to projects, 
uh, say, uh, let's first uh, apply this module to, to process this uh, project with just five images. Uh, uh, and, and the typical scenario when we want to do that is when we want to pre-label. So the, the beautiful thing about uh, neural networks in Supervised is that once we deploy the model, we might use various inference interfaces to interact with the model. So for example, uh, I, may, uh, uh, I, will, uh, I will run an app called uh, Apply Neural Network to Image Project here. Uh, this one might be might be run. Uh, this app do not require does not require GPU, so I will run it on the machine without GPU. So the application is started and I can open it. And the first step that I do, I connect to the model that I have just deployed. So I connect to the model. Uh, and, uh, and this model was pertained on Coco, so there are a number of classes that this model uh, might recognize. And I will pick all of those. I can, I can pick different classes, uh, but let me pick all of, those, all of these classes. Uh, and then I may say, okay, let this model to be applied to the entire image. I may define some parameters here, for example, confidence levels. And I will also see the preview, so how this model uh, is working. So this app also allows me to see preview. Uh, I may do preview on random, random image, images here, uh, or on uh, some uh, specified uh, image, uh, uh, image that I may pick. Uh, so, if I run this, so, uh, so this is the default name uh, of the project that will be created as a result of the execution of this app. So, let me actually, uh, let me actually click uh, apply module to input data so that this project, this new project is generated, which will contain the original images plus uh, all the uh, recognitions, all the detections. So, let me click here. And Almost instantly, we get uh, a new project, so the app is completed. Uh, app uh, solves the task, so it like processes the images. And here is uh, the the project that was automatically generated. I can click right here to to go to this project, or I can like go back and see that there is a new project now. And if I open this project, uh, I should see uh, the result of the processing. So what we see here, we see that uh, traffic lights are, uh, are recognized here. Uh, we also see that uh, uh, we also can see that uh, uh, people, persons are recognized uh, here uh, in a correct way. Uh, we might also see other classes. The, the, the colors might be not that uh, good. We can always change the colors, but we see that that even like. Uh, what plant class is correctly recognized. And we can like uh, keep going and see here that also all the persons are recognized as well as uh, very small, uh, very small objects here. So, uh, so th 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 this is how easy it is to pre-label the images. And of course, this is like toy example in my case, I have just five images. In real world scenario, you might have uh, thousands of images and to pre-label them in this kind of way uh, might uh, speed up uh, labeling process. So let me go further actually um, uh, and uh, go back to the projects. And, and this time, what I would like you to demonstrate is that once I deployed this detection model, I can all also automatically process uh, the not only images, but also videos. So, so I have a video here. Uh, so let me actually probably play this video so that, uh, so that you understand what we're trying to recognize here. Turn off the sound. 
what we try to pro what what data we try we try to process. So the video is like this, and maybe what we are interested in is to detect every car here. And moreover, maybe we, it's also important for us not only to detect but actually to track each car so that we know that that this car is uh, the same car on the next frames. Uh, and and that is actually pretty easy to achieve uh, this kind of pre-processing with supervised life. So if I uh, what I just need I just I just need uh, another uh, app another inference interface uh, which will use the same deployed module and uh, and and to do that I can like uh, run uh, the corresponding app here. Uh, since this 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 model will uh, uh, will also may also uh, do uh, uh, solve taking task, we need uh, a GPU uh, for that. So I will say that please run this app on this GPU one more time. So uh, let me run the app. So the app is started and I can open it. So I have uh, a project with one video, I will uh, select this and then the procedure is very similar. So I connect to the model that I have deployed earlier. Again, the same classes I will probably just for simplicity pick all of them. Yeah, I select the classes. Uh, then I may uh, th then I may also specify some confidence levels uh, and the name of the output project. So let let me call it say uh, uh, let me call this project video uh, pre-labeled. Okay. So uh, and and I can also click a preview button uh, to see uh, what kind of uh, results uh, I might expect when I apply this model to the entire set of videos that I have. So it might take uh, a bit of time to generate this preview. And, and that's, that's convenient because we might want to play with the confidence uh, levels uh, uh, before we apply the model to the uh, large amount of long videos. So here we see the preview. We can actually play this uh, this video, and we see that actually the results are quite good. Probably uh, I shouldn't I, I shouldn't change anything here. So I will just apply the settings, uh, and then I after I click this button, apply neural network to uh, video project. What will happen is that uh, there will be another project will be created uh, under this name uh, which will contain the source videos as well as uh, automatically generated uh, uh, boxes. So let's actually apply this model to the video. It might take some time uh, for the model to process this video, so let's wait a bit. So now every frame is processed and now we apply deep sort to merge detections together to uh, obtain uh, tracklets. And finally we get uh, this uh, 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 and, and finally we get this new project. Uh, again I can click here right here but probably uh, I, I just like to show you that, uh, that that we just have here a new project and if I open it uh, I should we should see the the, the results uh, uh, and okay let me turn off the sound here uh, so what we see is this uh, not only that the cars are detected here but but the cars are actually the identification or uh, task is solved or taking task is solved so that for example we know that uh, this car uh, exist on uh, uh, on uh, multiple uh, uh, locations here. Uh, so that's uh, that was a demonstration of like standard models. Uh, you can expect the similar behavior with uh, uh, of models of semantic segmentation models or instant segmentation models. But let me actually show you uh, interactive models. I have deployed a couple of those, and I may actually show how they work. So. 
I will just drop everything here. And sometimes uh, I might, sometimes I might not have the ability to uh, like pre-label. Maybe the classes of interest uh, are uh, rare and not that common. So uh, there are other ways to uh, to uh, uh, to leverage uh, deep learning models uh, to uh, speed up labeling process. So in this case, I will uh, I will quickly demonstrate uh, the. Uh, the tracking model that I have deployed earlier. Uh, so I just uh, I just label here several cars, and what I might want to do is to propagate these bounding boxes further. So, and the way to do that is to rely on the model that we have uh, on, on the app and on the model that we have deployed. So it's, it's called Tans T, and it will propagate either forward or backward the annotations that I uh, I created here. So the way it works is like this. So what we see here is that uh, uh, we, uh, so this icon indicates that we manually labeled uh, this frame. And if I go to the next frame, I see, to the next frames, I see that, uh, that uh, the boxes are propagated, uh, are propagated further. So uh, that uh, I may correct them and propagate again. Uh, but this is an example how we can uh, use uh, 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 interactive models uh, in order to, uh, to label, uh, label the data. Uh, and last model that I have deployed was the smart tool. And let me actually also show how it works. So I'll just go and to this uh, original uh, project with five images. So maybe I will just uh, pick some image here, say this one. Um, and what I can do, I can uh, uh, pick this smart tool and say I will define a person class uh, if I want to, uh, to label person. And, uh, and I will localize uh, uh, this person. And, 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 the, and this model will try to, to guess the, uh, the masks for the object of interest, so I can provide another feedback. And, and you see that uh, we obtained uh, quite, uh, quite a good uh, result here. So this is another, uh, another illustration of how we could use uh, pre-trained models uh, to speed up uh, labeling process. Um, and uh, these models are kind of class agnostic, so let me try to find, uh, say, some. Maybe we're just interested in, uh, in, in segmenting the head. Like this, and uh, but but uh, probably I have to uh, I don't have to say that this hat is person. So uh, the proper way to do that is like to say okay I need uh, to create another class. Probably I will call I call this class hat, and uh, and I can uh, I can use this uh, this default models uh, default pre-trained models to help me to. Uh, to, I did, to, to, help, to help me to uh, label these common objects, so like this. Uh, uh, okay, so now, uh, so far I have been showing to you uh, how to leverage different pre-trained models, either standard models or interactive models. But what I would like to do actually is to showcase the scenarios when default models are not working uh, for some reason and we we need to train models and you will see in the next section how simple is that to achieve that so this leads us to the use case number one uh, training a smart tool for uh, interactive uh, uh, correct segmentation task so here is the data that we have uh, we have some Suppose that we have a cracks test project with the images of interest, and and in this case we need to be able to efficiently label a, a very specific data like this, like like cracks. So it's hard to expect that 
that pretrained models are uh, good, uh, will be good with very uh, specialized uh, objects. So uh, let me show you that uh, pretrained uh, pretrained model, how pretrained models will work here. So uh, if I will try to explain the model with a combination of green and uh, red dots, what I actually want from the model, you will see that the model will fail to to process the cracks. So uh, as I put more and more uh, uh, green dots to say that the pixels around the area uh, uh, are actual cracks, uh, it, it kind of trying to do something reasonable. But but if I will proceed uh, doing doing this, uh, I, will, I will very soon realize that this model is not uh, uh, really helpful uh, uh, for me to uh, to solve the task. Uh, yeah, so it's just bad user experience uh, to put a uh, huge number of points and uh, achieve achieve like bad, bad results. But but uh, but the task remains. So anyway, I have to be able somehow to efficiently label uh, label these cracks, uh, and and there should be some way to to make it work, to make the labeling process efficient, uh, and and there is a, and. And we can, I can show you su such a way. So, and the, the way is to train actually these interactive segmentation models uh, to, to, to do well on the task of interest. So, uh, let me go back to the projects. And what I have here, I have uh, a training set. So, my training set looks like this. Uh, those are cracks and, and those are actually uh, uh, labeled cracks. In, in this kind of fashion. So let me just uh, show you uh, a couple of examples here. Um, so so uh, in, this, in, in this case, uh, I have, and, and some cracks are actually barely visible, actually. So it's, it, it's, it's not an easy training set uh, to fit. Uh, to fit. Uh, okay, so in my project, I have, uh, I have two data sets. Let me go back. So one is for training, uh, and it contains uh, 628 images, and the other dataset is for validation, uh, and and it, it 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 looks actually similar. So it's it it it, it uh, those are different images, but uh, but is taken from the same kind of batch of images. So uh, let me actually illustrate how easy it might be to uh, train models that will leverage this training data uh, and eventually uh, learn how to uh, how to uh, process uh, cracks in an efficient manner so to to address that what i need to do i just need to run an app actually so uh, so here is the project with my training data all i need to do uh, is to run an app um, so uh, let me see which one. Yeah, so it, this app will be from the neural network section, and it's uh, RITM, uh, train RTM, uh, and and in this example, say I will pick uh, this GTX uh, uh, machine to perform the training procedure. So let me just run this app. So the app is started. Let me open it. Um, so uh, the first step is just to click download button. So it just summarizes what we have. We have a project with uh, 698 uh, images overall. So let's download that. Uh, the next step is to is, is to pick uh, the uh, the classes of interest and in this case we just have one class of interest called cracks so let's select this class uh, the next thing to do is to split somehow uh, the data into training and validation sets and we can do it either randomly in this kind of fashion or for example I can uh, uh, click on this tab uh, based on data set and say that okay uh, this data set that I had that I have should go to training and uh, this data set this, this this other data set should go to validation 
so that's uh, uh, that's uh, more like a, a determined way, not a deterministic way uh, to split the data. So next thing for me to do is to 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 say whether I want to apply uh, some data augmentation. I can pick from. Uh, from some options here, I can define also custom uh, uh, data augmentation pipelines. Let me just take this one, for example. I can also preview. So if I click on preview, it will take random image and show me how data augmentation will be applied. So in this case, it's in, in this kind of way. Uh, okay, uh, I will use this uh, template for data augmentation. So the next thing is to, uh, is to pick the backbone. So I will pick like the largest backbone here. Uh, okay, and I will download the weights. Uh, uh, and there is a final step where we have to define some parameters of training. In this case, probably I will say, okay, I will I, I will do like uh, a sixty iteration over uh, over the data, and I may also want to reduce uh, input resolution a bit. Probably uh, my I will increase batch size so that I have a bit uh, faster uh, training process. Uh, I may also uh, save checkpoints from time to time. So let me save checkpoint uh, checkpoints every uh, tens epochs. Uh, 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 but uh, anyway, every epoch there will be a validation step, and best checkpoint according to validation will be kept anyway. So yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Let's 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 take a look at optimize the parameter. So probably I will just increase learning rate a bit here. So. Uh, uh, like this, and I will and I will uh, leave uh, uh, everything uh, def uh, default uh, uh, default values. I will leave default values here. So, so each epoch uh, uh, this parameter will be used to multiply learning rate. So we will actually see that learning rate drops as the as the, the training pro process uh, going on. So, but default values will also work actually. Okay, let me finish this step. That's actually the last step. And the next thing for me to do is just to click a train button to initiate a training process. And what will, what is going on right now is that the data is copied to the GTX machine and all the training will be conducted locally on this machine. Uh, from time to time we will see some, uh, some metrics uh, but the idea with this uh, uh, agent and cluster is that uh, we pick machine and uh, and this machine is leveraged to conduct all these computations. So and we see that the charts are, uh, are updated in, in in real time regime. So uh, so I think that th that the training process will take about thirty minutes or so. So let's just wait until it completes. And, uh, and I will see you uh, after that and we will speak about the results and test of the models that we have obtained. So training process is completed now. So we have went through uh, 60 epochs and, uh, and probably this is the chart that we are interested in. So it shows uh, uh, intersection over union uh, on validation uh, data set uh, as epochs goes by and the highest value here I think uh, corresponds to the epoch number uh, uh, 24. So probably we did a bit more epochs that was necessary. But uh, and, and we have a choice here. We can uh, stop uh, training or we can like we can continue training if I'm not satisfied with, uh, with the performance or we can just uh, finish it. So let me uh, let me finish the training process. And now what's going on is that uh, uh, is that uh, the checkpoints or in more general training artifacts are copied from the uh, uh, from the machine that we used uh, to train the model. So it's GTX machine uh, to the main server. So it will take a bit of time for those checkpoints to be uploaded. Um, and after that, we can take this one of these checkpoints and see, and, and try to see, and see what uh, how the model performs. Uh, so uh, so the app generates so the app the session is finished here, and uh, the app generates for us the path where the training artifacts are stored. So let's click on that to see. Uh, 
Um, so there is a folder and here is checkpoints. And, and uh, so those are uh, checkpoints that we saved from time to time, but I think we are interested in this one. So, uh, so if we go back, we'll see that epoch number uh, 24 produces the highest score on the validation set. And here, here is the best checkpoint that corresponds to this epoch. And what I could do next is just to copy path to this checkpoint and, uh, and just uh, deploy this model. So I'll go to neural networks and to uh, interactive segmentation and I am interested in this, uh, this app. So let me run that. Uh, I, will, I will run this app on say GTX machine also and I want to run not, not a pretend model but rather a custom one so I will just paste the path to the checkpoint uh, and then uh, run the app. So the model is successfully deployed and let me actually see how it performs. Uh, uh, probably I should do one more thing here. I have several smart tools deployed. So let me uh, take a look at the running sessions. And the one that, uh, that we trained is this one. Uh, so let me actually uh, give, it, uh, 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 give it a name so that it's easier to distinguish between two deployed models. So I'll just say that it is model uh, trained to process cracks. So let me just update the name. And then um, I will go and uh, to, to the projects and here is the images that we, uh, that we try to process with the default model and let me try to process this with this model that we have trained. So smart tool is selected here and what I can do here, I can pick from the deployed model. So example, you see this one uh, with the description of cracks is the one that we have trained. So I'll pick this one and I'll probably just uh, select here the large portion of the image and I will move a bit this uh, green point to uh, uh, that so that it corresponds to the uh, uh, ghost on the cracks here, uh, and 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 you probably see that the recognition uh, is quite is quite good here. So uh, so from the first shot, the model uh, the model uh, 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 the model takes these cracks and does a good job of segmenting them. Uh, we can play a bit more with this model. So for example, this is like hard thing to label manually. But, but you see that, uh, that our model uh, does a very good job here. So I can like extend this thing a bit like this. So uh, it's, it's, it's way more convenient to, uh, to, to work with these models rather than to do everything manually. So let's see if we can put a green dot here and if the model will take this. Yeah, you see, like I put the dot and this missing crack was automatically uh, uh, segmented. And let's try uh, another one. So this one, for example, I will also take a portion of the image here and probably I have to move a bit the point. Uh, so you see, it's like it's 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 working in a kind of uh, good way here, and it reacts to this uh, feedback. Uh, so uh, so if we pretrain the model, it it is it is way more uh, convenient to pretrain the model first rather than use brush uh, to label all these cracks uh, all these cracks manually. Let me actually take one step further. And what I want to try to do uh, is to apply the same model on uh, uh, to the videos. And that will illustrate nicely another concept that once we have a model, we might have very various interfaces that may uh, that may be used to uh, that may be used to uh, interact with the model. So probably I will create a, a class here for cracks. So let me quickly do that. Cracks and say something, I want to take something bright here, some bright color, and the shape will be bitmap. 
in, in, in this case. So, so this smart labeling tools uh, outputs bitmaps. Uh, okay, let's pick some video. I don't know. Uh, maybe say this one, the old one. Uh, yeah. So let's 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 inspect the data a bit. Maybe turn off the sound. And yeah. So that's this is, those cracks are actually barely visible. So let's see if we can uh, if we can uh, uh, if we can achieve uh, good results here. So I will again I will use this, this trained model. So uh, so the cracks the crack actually barely visible. So let me try to. Uh, to, to to work with that here. So you see, it's kind of uh, it's working good. So it uh, maybe uh, there is missing part here, but I can uh, I can correct that. And what's cool about uh, about that? Let's say uh, in this video labeling tool, I can enable this mode, uh, clone figure on, uh, press right arrow, and go to the next uh, to the next frame. So that next. The, the, the crack on the next frame is also uh, automatically recognized, and I can proceed. Uh, I can I can keep actually doing that, uh, and if our model models works in a really good way, then we might uh, be able to really quickly label uh, probably the most uh, complex uh, data structure modality like videos. So point cloud might be like more complex, but but here is what what we have achieved here. So let me show you quickly uh, the the result of our action. So uh, what we have done is that we have labeled uh, this uh, uh, crack on multiple uh, on multiple uh, frames. Probably uh, this part should be erased. Actually, we can do it easily with the brush. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, that's it with uh, this example. Let's move on to the next uh, to, the, to the second case. Colleagues, we have one last use case to address, which is use case two, uh, training detection model to recognize seed types. So let's straight jump into it. Here is three projects uh, which will be necessary for us to walk through this use case. Uh, let me explain it. Uh, so suppose that we have uh, production images and for, for these production images we would like to build a detection model that, uh, that can recognize or more precisely detect different types of seeds. For example, uh, pumpkin unpeeled seeds that looks like this, uh, pumpkin peeled seeds that looks like this. Uh, also, we have sunflower seeds, uh, and also we have some uh, mixture of seeds, either all types of seeds or uh, just two types of seeds. So suppose that would like to uh, build a detection model, but here is the challenge. So we have very limited training data. Uh, more precisely, we just have three images, two of which completely relevant and one is relevant. And the one that is relevant, it just, it just partially labeled. So, so for each type of seeds, we actually have several instances. Uh, and these irrelevant images uh, uh, with corn also part partially labeled, and uh, why we need those, uh, I will explain in several minutes. But here is the question, so if we have so little uh, label data, uh, so small amount of label data, is it possible for us to, to build a detection module that might provide us with some meaningful results? And the answer is yes, uh, and, uh, and I will show you how. The basic idea is that we will use this, uh, these uh, instances of labeled objects and, and paste them. We copy from, from this image and paste them into random backgrounds. So, and we do have some random backgrounds, uh, which are just uh, unlabeled images like this. So those images don't, don't have to be tables. Uh, it, they might be just different, say, images with nature or something. Uh, and those images are completely unlabeled. So let me show you 
how we can uh, uh, how we can act in uh, this low data uh, uh, in this uh, regime when we have very limited amount of uh, label data. So we can use uh, uh, we can generate data artificially, and uh, to do that we may just run one of the apps uh, from uh, from ecosystem. Uh, uh, let me show you which. So for example, uh, flying objects. I run it on top of, of this project, on top of foreground object, uh, foreground project. So let me run this one. Uh, so uh, there is some process here. Yeah, the app is started. Let me open that. So we provide some information already about foregrounds. So foregrounds is where we have something labeled. Let me also provide information about background. So we will say that, okay, here is a project with our backgrounds. Then uh, I have to specify the classes. And, and as we have seen, we have just seven objects for peeled pumpkin seeds, seven objects for sunflower seeds, and uh, five objects for unpeeled seeds. Uh, I will, and also corn, uh, that will be used for noise. Uh, to make the images more complex at the training time. So uh, you will see it in a second. I will just pick that one. Uh, I will just pick all the objects. Then uh, I have to specify how I want to compose my images using this artificial data generation approach. And in this case, what I would like to achieve is to actually put on an image a lot of objects uh, uh, so, that, so that each image is really complex. And I would also require that each time I put an object, half of this object is at least, at least half of this object is visible. I may specify more parameters, but probably I will not do it so far. And lastly, uh, post-processing, which, uh, which defines uh, what output, uh, uh, how I would, I would like to label the output data. So, for example, I may say that, okay, let's generate data for detection task. Since we compose, or rather this app compose the images itself, it knows how to label. So that's one example. You see it's kind of a big mess of objects here with this, with, with this corn object as a noise. Uh, let me just show you another, another example here. Yeah, so this is another example of artificial generated image. Uh, and it's important to say that we may generate data for different tasks, for example, for instance segmentation. So uh, again, we, the app construct the image itself, so it knows uh, uh, where the, 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 the positions uh, and uh, pixels of the specific objects. Uh, and that's very convenient, actually. So again, let me go back to the detection case here. Um, let me see one more image here. Okay, so the next step, what I would like to do next is to say something like that. Uh, I would like to generate, say, 200 images of this type, of this type, and, and, and put them into some project. So say, I will just call this project, say, training. Uh, a training set, say, uh, might be any name. Uh, okay, and uh, I think that I have done everything here correctly. And 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 uh, what I need to do is just to click generate button. And and this app will go and generate uh, uh, images one by one. So it has it now generated a second image. Uh, and once the images are generated, we will have a new project with this name, uh, with one data set that will contain 200 uh, generated images. So uh, let me pro probably pause here and come back when all the images are generated. I am back and the app has generated a training set, uh, this project called training set and put there 200 artificially generated uh, images. 
Uh, I should probably close this app now, but let me actually say that if we want to generate more, uh, say, with maybe different uh, parameters, more data with different parameters, we can essentially uh, uh, modify some settings here and just define the name of uh, different name for the data set and uh, keep generating, uh, generating more and more data. Uh, I will not do it uh, right now. I think that 200 images that we have artificially creative, created will be sufficient for our task. But let's see. So let's go to projects. So here is this project that was automatically created. And let's open that and quickly take a look at the data that we have. So you see we have quite a big mass of these seeds and corn. Uh, let's open one of those. So the main idea uh, behind this approach is that it might be it might be a good idea to make uh, the life of the model really complicated during uh, training time uh, and hope that uh, uh, production images are actually easier than this. Uh, so that's that's the idea. And maybe we can get away with the fact that these images are not uh, looking that realistic. Maybe uh, maybe uh, realistically looking images are not that important. For example, in this case or in general. Okay, so we have the images like this now. So we, we went from no data, almost no, no label data at all to the, to the state when we have 200 uh, images with a lot of objects. Uh, okay, uh, the next step is to just take some detection model and, uh, and use this um, data set uh, to, train, to train the model. Let's take YOLO. So I will go to uh, neural network uh, uh, menu here and I will just run this uh, uh, this uh, train YOLO v5 app and uh, and I will use uh, RTX machine uh, as a backend. Uh, so let me run this one, this, this, this app. So after a while the app will be ready. Started, I can open the app. So what we see here? We see that we have a large number of objects now and 200 images. So let me, so in the training I will, I will need all the objects. Uh, also, I may have a choice how to split the data and, and in this example I will just split the data. So I will just put uh, some number of images into validation set and, uh, and the rest of the images in training set. So let me actually do something like that. So 20 images, not that much, but I think it will do. Uh, okay, so I have defined how the data, how, how I want to split the data. Now let me take a backbone. So, so it's quite, uh, so our uh, training set is quite complex. So let, let's speak powerful uh, backbone, powerful model. Uh, also, uh, let me put 200 apples here. We will have to wait like about uh, 40 minutes, I don't know, uh, 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 before the model will be trained. Uh, uh, I will pause the video uh, uh, there. Okay, uh, there are other parameters here uh, that we might control, for example, batch size. Uh, uh, the, one that, the one parameter that is important uh, is uh, uh, optimizer, so I will pick Adam and, and I will also follow the recommendations that says here that uh, I should increase uh, learning rate. So you, you see that uh, some of the parameters are here in the interface, the other parameter is defined as a, in, in text format, and those are advanced parameters that uh, original repository allows to control. I will also, uh, I, I will also disable mosaic augmentation here since uh, we have a lot of objects on the image. I think more or less I have defined everything I wanted here. So, so the only thing for me uh, uh, left to do is to click this uh, start, uh, start start training button. So, and what is going on right now is uh, is the data uh, and annotations. So this 400 means 200 images plus uh, annotations for each images are copied to the target machine and uh, the training procedure 
will be conducted on this target machine and we will see uh, some metrics in real-time regime uh, while the training is uh, happening. Um, what I actually thinking to do probably is to stop here and uh, come back when the training process uh, is completed and we have all the charts that we could analyze. And after that we will just take some the best checkpoint according to validation and run it on uh, real images and uh, to see if the approach uh, to leverage artificially generated data uh, will work um, will work in 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 our case uh, so uh, let me come back so it just will take some time uh, um, uh, to uh, yeah, or, or maybe I can just wait a bit uh, until the training is started uh, to show you that there are actually some uh, live things going on and uh, numbers and charts are uh, updating and so on. Maybe okay, maybe I will wait a bit. Uh, yeah, so you see, uh, those are the charts uh, like uh, uh, some metrics and uh, precision uh, recall and MIP and as uh, training uh, go on uh, we will see some uh, some dynamics here. Uh, those are just visualizations that was originally uh, 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 represented in the YOLO v5 repository so it's relatively it was relatively easy for us to just put these files in the app. Uh, in our case we have a lot of objects so uh, uh, those might be not that uh, uh, representative in for, for our case but sometimes those kind of visualizations are useful uh, and as well as this, this visualizations of uh, images that, that, we, that, we train, that we use for training. Uh, and we see that, uh, that uh, the training process has begun and let me actually come back uh, when we when we will go through these uh, 200 uh, epochs. And right now we are at, like uh, we have we have done just two epochs. Okay, see you later. Okay, training process is completed, and I am back. So let's see what we have got. I will skip all the visualizations here. Probably I will say a few words about the charts. So we see that uh, uh, errors goes down as the training proceeds. And uh, here we see that uh, precision recall uh, uh, precision recall chart uh, chart and we see that actually precision is uh, close to one on the training set and recall is uh, slightly lower. And the reason is that uh, our images are actually just a big pile of all the seeds. So it's, it's hard. We, we, we specifically designed this training set in a way that it is really hard for the model to, uh, to recognize everything correctly. Uh, and, uh, and in general the metrics like goes up and then saturates uh, uh, saturate uh, over time. So uh, the uh, the result of this uh, of this app is actually uh, uh, these artifacts. This here is the link to the artifact that uh, that this training app uh, has generated. So let's just click on that and go to weights uh, folder here and uh, and the app outputs among other things uh, two checkpoints: the last checkpoint and the best checkpoint. Let me actually try to take this best checkpoint, copy pass to that and then deploy the model uh, based on this checkpoint uh, and see how it will work with the real data. So let's do that. So let's go to uh, neural networks and let's uh, pick uh, a proper servant app. So we trained YOLO v5, so we will use servant app for YOLO v5. I will run this app. I'm not interested in pre-trained models, so I will run a custom model that I have trained. So, and also I will pick the machine here and let me just click run to deploy the model. It will take a while, hopefully not too long. Yeah, so uh, 
the model weights are uh, downloaded and the model is deployed on the selected machine with GPU. And the next step to see how this model trained on artificial data will perform on real data. So let's go to projects. And uh, what we will do, we will uh, try to process uh, these images with the model that we have trained on uh, artificially generated data. So let's, let's go back. And here, what we will do, we will uh, just cl click on the project and select uh, from neural networks uh, uh, context menu uh, this app. We have used that in this demo already. So let's run this app. Yes, yeah, the app is started, so let's open the interface. Uh, I will connect to the model. And here I will see that I see that I connect to the right model because this model outputs like four classes, corn, peeled seeds, sunflower seeds and peeled seeds. Uh, I might disable actually corn because I know that there are no there is there are no corn there, but okay. Uh, I may also specify some uh, uh, some thresholds, so maybe I will just slightly uh, slightly increase the thresholds here. Uh, and and those are just the preview. And we see that actually uh, most seeds are recognized on this example. But let let me actually uh, let me actually apply the model to the entire uh, project to obtain new project with uh, with uh, the, the recognition with the detections and uh, later uh, analyze that a bit. So we just have here like. Uh, 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 52 images and and we're about to process them all. So now we have a new project and the, this app is completed. So let's, let's actually go to projects and this is a new project that was generated a few seconds uh, ago uh, with these recognitions. Let's just quickly examine, uh, examine the results. So for example those are uh, so those are, are unpeeled seeds and let me, let me do the following let me probably decrease a bit uh, the height of these boxes it will be the results will be better visible so here i may say that border size put border size to two instead of five and this will allow me to see this result. So we see that results are actually quite good, especially when uh, the number of objects are relatively uh, are relatively small here. Uh, maybe here the results might be a bit worse, but but no, no, it 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 uh, the, the results are actually quite good. Uh, uh, yeah. So uh, let's see, let's see, let's go and see another examples here. So for example, sunflower seeds. Okay, let me pick the image first where there are relatively small number of objects and we also see that, uh, that, that, that the boxes are quite tight uh, probably I may find some missing things here and some mislabels but um, but it's hard to expect from the model the correct uh, the correct uh, recognition of this small thing that was not in training sets in, in training set and let's see and even if the uh, the number of the seeds are quite high. Uh, we see that the recognition is is good. So, uh, yeah, we might see this uh, false positive here. Uh, uh, false positive example here. They happen from time to time. But the point is that we actually had no data at the very beginning, and and this approach that we that we followed allowed us to obtain a model. Uh, basically, uh, from uh, no label data, and now we could uh, we could leverage this model uh, to uh, to to pre-label images, and uh, and and you see that like uh, the results are quite good. So, for example, uh, to make it even more visible, let me probably filter the results based on the class. Say, say I'm interested in specific class unpeeled seeds. So, for example, uh, I see here that uh, it got everything except this corner corner cases probably. So, uh, so yeah, um, no, I think that the last last 
uh, last uh, uh, data set here to examine this mixture of seeds. So let me open some something. Yeah. So uh, we see that uh, the results are actually quite good. Uh, so probably I can could do could show you one more thing. So once we have the model deployed, uh, I actually have uh, a way. Uh, maybe I will just uh, mm, I have uh, uh, yeah. So probably I will not show tags here because this, there are too many objects. Okay. So uh, so another way to leverage the model deployed uh, is, for example, uh, to use it right inside uh, this labeling interface. So let me let let me show you that. So uh, what I will do. So so I can run apps right from labeling interface, and I will run this uh, and then image labeling app. Uh, and this app is actually allow actually allows me to apply models on the fly to the images. So for example, I connect to the model uh, like this, and maybe. I'm, I'm interested in just one class, say. Maybe I'm just interested in, uh, say, uh, sunflower seeds. So I will disable all, all of that. Uh, and I will just drop the predictions. So uh, uh, drop all the objects. And maybe I will also increase confidence slightly. So, uh, so something like that. Uh, and uh, the threshold for NMS. Uh, uh, and uh, and what I can do, I can actually uh, I can actually apply this model uh, to the image uh, right inside labeling interface. So if I click here, uh, I will get this sunflower seeds uh, processed in this kind of fashion. Uh, there are actually more things that uh, this app allows to do. I can actually undo if I want. Uh, so let me probably show you uh, the last thing here. So, uh, so maybe I will create just another class uh, called uh, called uh, area, for example, uh, uh, and uh, and I will uh, define uh, 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 this kind of area. And what I can do, I can try to apply the model uh, uh, the model inside the area. It might be useful if I have. A high resolution image, and I just interested in uh, some specific area of the image. Let me try to do that actually. So I will try to find some flower seeds here in this area. So let me try. Yeah. So you see that some flower seeds are identified within uh, within this area, and like the, uh, in this kind of fashion. Um, and I may also undo this. Uh, another use case for that might be if we want to understand model sensitivity to the size of the object. So, for example, here uh, the sunflower seeds are really big and I don't ex expect the model actually to find them. Or well, at least a good quality here, so quality might actually suffer. Let's see if the model... No, it's actually... it's uh, the sizes... Uh, the sizes are actually not the problem. Uh, actually, every sunflower seed was found. That's actually very good. Uh, very good for model. Okay, let me try one more experiment. Let me let me make it fail. So maybe I will just do this, and 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 maybe it fail. It will fail. Yeah. So you see, it's like uh, uh, some of the uh, sunflower seeds are skipped here, and that's because uh, in the training set we didn't have like this huge sunflower seed that occupies uh, half of the image. Uh, okay. So probably I should stop here because I could show you so many things uh, more. Uh, uh, maybe I will just summarize uh, and uh, and and what I specifically like about this example is is the following fact. So, so initially we had just these images to process, and our training data was very limited. And and even though uh, we have very limited data, we were able to obtain a model that does a good job and we could use this model to pre-label or to or for some other purposes. And this example illustrates nicely how we can go from raw data to the model in supervised learning. So, uh, so I think that's it and uh, see you in, in the next section. Bye. Colleagues, we have one last principle left to cover, which is principle 5, enterprise grade. And the principle is about providing the complete solution to our customers 
with enterprise level features, support and complementary services, while making sure that our customers keep successfully solving their tasks. Supervisor has two versions, community version and enterprise version. The focus of this video is on enterprise version, which has uh, two uh, deployment hosting types. Uh, the first and the main one is on-premise or, in other words, self-hosted installation. Uh, alternatively, uh, supervised team can provide uh, hosting services to the customer. We do support popular hosting providers as well as more customized hosting settings. Uh, Supervised uh, has a wide range of uh, enterprise features, which includes security features, remote storages, uh, different deployment settings, and more. Uh, there, are, there is evaluation period available and support. The next set of slides uh, illustrates uh, in detailed way how we interact with potential and current customers. And everything starts with a supervised website where a potential customer may get instant access to the, soft, to the software and find there a lot of uh, technical information as well as information regarding complementary services. Then there is uh, one or more demo calls where we try to understand the requirements that customers have and do one or more live demos that actually correlates with the requirements a lot. After that, there might be cases in which, say, uh, we have all the features necessary. In some cases, it might be that uh, requirements are not met, are not fully met out of the box. In this, team, in this case, supervised team will develop extra apps for free. Uh, and in most cases, we actually can do so and deliver these apps uh, during uh, evaluation period. In some cases, maybe due to complexity or time constraints, we cannot do that. And in this case, customer may develop their own private apps themselves. Uh, the step number three here is evaluation period, which usually lasts one month or more, if more testing time is needed. And this evaluation period starts with a creation of dedicated Slack workspace so that we have direct communication. And then there is an installation procedure. And after that, there might be uh, some calls for example, technical calls or training sessions. It is not necessary, but sometimes it helps. And also, at some point in time, uh, we may provide requested apps if we promise to do so. Uh, then, if everything works good, uh, there is a final stage here uh, where when we start commercial relationships uh, by signing a contract. And it's important to say here that, uh, that we keep interacting uh, with, uh, with you after that. So we will keep uh, have calls from time to time. Maybe at some point you will need, you will face new tasks and you will, and you will need new apps for that, which we usually help to develop to our customers. Uh, to make our offer complete, we do have a set of complementary services provided by our partners. Uh, one of those services is related to data labeling and the other type of services is machine learning development. Uh, let's, uh, let's focus on probably the most basic question. Uh, why choose Supervisor? And the answer is that Supervisor is just better today and will be even better in the future. I hope we have been able to prove that by the live demos and slides that we have sh sh shown earlier. And you may ask how such a, how such a functional uh, difference is even possible. And the answer is pretty simple here. Supervisor is just designed differently. From technical side, we built operating system platform to unify all fragmented open source software and make them more usable via graphic user interface. And from business side, we closely work with partners, value-added resellers, machine learning community freelancers to organize and coordinate software unification process. This diagram nicely illustrates our approach and activity. So the first is coordination, and, uh, and uh, we coordinate the efforts of ML community partners, freelancers, to unify open source computer vision related software in such a way that this software is usable via graphic user interface and uh, runnable via a single click. Uh, in 
other words, we transform uh, fragmented GitHub repositories into supervised apps. And the second activity is related to development and governance. Uh, when it comes to development, we focus a lot on improvement API, SDK, widgets, dev tools, and other components of Supervisor. When it comes to govern governance, it's about technical roadmaps, scope of work for future apps, and so on. And the last but not least is customer support. Uh, Supervisor team closely works with our customers to make sure that customer tasks, tasks are solved uh, successfully and consistently. So, it's important to say here that none of supervisory alternatives build their solutions in this or similar fashion. Let's close this with the summary, which states that supervisory is better than alternatives by design. And what I mean here is that supervisory is a platform while alternatives are products or tools. Uh, as a consequence, a number of features that supervisory offers well beyond the number of features that alternative solutions, solutions can offer. A wide range of enterprise level features are available. And before any financial commitment, a free relation period is available to make sure that Supervisor actually is a good fit for your organization. And Supervisor team keep close interaction with the customers to help them address new tasks by means of custom app development. Complementary services of annotation and ML development are provided by Supervisor partners to make uh, our solution complete from the customer standpoint. And uh, let me thank you for watching and also say that if you feel that Supervisor may be a fit for your organization, let's have, it, let's have a call and discuss it. See you there. Bye-bye.